Ah. I'm gonna click that Dude. button. It's been clucked. Click that button. Now that it's been clucked, mm. what, what do we do? What's 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 next for life? I don't know. Are we allowed to say clucked in 2023? I haven't checked the recent um, instruction rulings booklet. from the, uh, the 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 group of people who, you know, that would be like a slur for chickens, right? Least. Cluckers, a clucker, or clucka. Yeah, to be a bit softer. It shows me the old thumb thumbnail again. I don't know if that's just a YouTube thing again or. God it's shown the new damn one. it. Showing the new one for me. Oh, okay. a whole bunch of characters from all of these movies. Uh, yeah, because but... I had that happen as well. Where some for some people it didn't really didn't change for some reason. But I like it, it when things don't fuck up. Yeah. All right. It's from every possible piece of information I could draw from anything I have, everything seems to work. Allegedly. I'm sorry. Yeah, we we good. That's why yeah, I asked with the other thingy. Metal not playing Dead Space. You know very well why I can't be playing oh, Stromboles. They make fun of you because your PC is tanky. Well, oh, why are you doing, doing the Dracula voice? That's not Dracula. That was um. You, you some kind that of. Was, that was Dracula? Big Al from Big Al's Toy Barn. Mm -hmm. the toy for them flans. He does kind of sound like that. It's a Southern accent, a Southern Transylvanian accent. <laughs> In Southern Transylvania, they talk a little slower. You know. I love how just everyone culturally just knows Big Al from Big Al's Toy Bond. It's like it's yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course we know him. He's an we know Sid as well, right? Most yeah, people... Sid the yeah. Sloth. Oh, I meant Sorry. Story One uh, Sid. Yeah, also that Sid. Two Sids. Um, but then Toy Story Three. I think I think people One know. One Sid is significantly Lotso, more Lotso, naked right? than the yeah. other. People remember Lotso. What about Toy Story Four? Uh, it was the. the I remember Lotso. The, the, I the villain that him. won. Yeah, Toy Story Four. The yeah, villain that. <laughs> and then, and then Woody realized that what he learned in Toy Story Three was wrong. Um, and then he <laughs> interesting creative his friends so that he could live with Bo Peep. Hey, hey, let's get it. Let's let's be clear. Not only did Woody abandon his friends, Buzz abandoned him too. Everyone was so abandoning each other. It's a great. It's message. really a. It's a. It's a party, really. Because <laughs> I guess Woody realized that no, actually, my role is not to you know continue uh, providing joy. It's to <laughs> just live out here and then get other toys to do that. Even though what I learned yeah. in Toy Story three is that that's a really that's just a that's a good thing to do. Yeah, we. I don't we, like Toy Story four. We talked about I don't it, but like it's that like either. I hate that movie. So it feels like much. different creators <laughs> took over because they settled in the Toy Story trilogy on saying toys gain meaning from bringing joy to people. Like that's that's like a yeah. like oh that's cool. And then Toy Story four is like no, we got our own lives to sort out. Okay, fuck you guys. We got our own meaning mm -hmm. to find our own identity, and it's like why? <laughs> like, why did you? It's just I don't know, man. Like. Every single time, that's kind of what Woody is learning in different ways, is, is that what it means to be a toy is to bring joy to people. He learns that in every film in a different way. And then they just change their mind right at the end. You can tell Do this. You remember when, you some remember kind when of... we got to the end of that film and we were like screaming when you were saying, <laughs> when they were like to Infinity and Beyond, we were like, no! no! <laughs> you get those words out of your goddamn mouth. <laughs> Keep that when you need him. catchphrase out <laughs> your fucking mouth. Yeah. But uh, yeah, because Toys and it wasn't just like that part of it, right? It's all it goes all the way back to the beginning with that creepy new toy that is wondering what it means to exist or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Forky. Sporky. Forky. Yeah. Well, either way, um, you yeah. know for a fact or, that they they thought about it in the writing room. It's like. Isn't it interesting, really, that the toys... Like, what is the difference between a living toy and a dead toy? What makes you a toy? And you just want to have that guy in the room who's like, No! We're no, not no, doing, no, 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 You do Don't not want to get near that, okay? You know, do you know the age rating for this film, guys? <laughs> It's more so just like, you don't want to be trying to go like real hard and fast on these rules about the toys and the nature of their existence. The less okay? we know, the it's better. Already, <laughs> well, it's already, you know, we're already treading a little bit uh, on, perilous, on perilous ice here, thin ice. Well, you know, that's an easy segue. Animated film, beloved by many. Uh, well, 
Sorry, not that one. <laughs> well, the one. one. That one. one. Not about the Academy Award winning Toy Story 4. I was about to uh, say, it is beloved by many. Yeah. Was, did I it suppose. win Academy Awards? Yeah, of course it did. Pixar movies mostly win. Um, either those or Disney Animation Studios. Is films. Tanning Red going to beat out Puss in Boots? Ooh. If it does, I, no there's going to be no a way. fucking riot. No, they will, someone only, will throw a bottle somewhere. It's <laughs> only... It's, there's there's no way. It's only going to be between Pinocchio and Puss in Boots, I think. Um, those will be the two that are fighting each other to see who gets the top spot. Wrong thumbnail. Ugh. But it's the right one for me. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's going to change at some point. I had the same yeah, thing happened to the Forge for me as well, where people Let said, just, this is the wrong thumbnail. But I'm going to post it now in chat. What is Your Dead Space those? thing did the same way. Yeah, it, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Puss in Boots. Um, Puss in Boots. <laughs> A white guy, some fucking white guy. Some and, white guy. Uh, that is, that is a famous <laughs> white man. How dare you? And then some. Oh, you mean a privileged white man? Some puppet. What are you talking about? It's Voldemort. Yeah, it's Voldy. I don't recognize him with a nose. That's true. Yeah. Do you guys know snakes don't have noses? I think snakes are on a plane. He wasn't in that. That'd be a good AFAP movie, Snakes on a Plane. I actually never oh, watched that movie. It'll probably happen. Anyway, yeah, so we're going to talk about Puss in Boots, but we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things, and so they're not going to be like big old breakdowns. I'm also going to be strolling through some of these movies and talking about bits and bobs. The first thing I want to talk about that springs to mind when you start watching this film is they um they kind of committed a big old sin. Everyone's celebrating this film, but they did something rude in it right at the beginning. That's kind of like, excuse oh me, what are you doing? They changed the DreamWorks logo. They oh they yeah, can we talk about it? Oh, so, logo. We can this is the that. first time where I saw the new DreamWorks logo, and it's really, really bad. I hate it. <laughs> it used to be a nice, simple boy fishing off the moon. Oh, what wonderful things could this logo mean? But now oh. we need to show out intellectual properties, Rags. That's that's it's the Avengers new, that's all over again. I hate it. Bingo. it it used to be like you you associated because of because that's how like company logos and things work. You associate the logo with all the things the company does without yeah. having to explicitly show mm -hmm. all of them one by one mm -hmm. in this really awful montage. Um, yeah, you know but, what? It's funny you say that because I've changed my mind on the Marvel Studios one. I actually now I think I prefer just the one where it flipped through all the comic pages. I actually, like, yeah, I caught that one the other day, and I was mm. like, oh man, there's something kind of neat about this. Really well, it honors the history, right? It honors where this is coming from. Yeah, as if uh, now its history is, you know, itself. Every time it makes well, a movie. I mean, I think it says a lot about, to the point now where, like, the, the films are way more influential on the comics than the other way around. Like, to where I think Marvel has explicitly stated that they want to position, like, Marvel comics to basically give runway to the MCU. Like, so that they're planning ahead for stories that Marvel can use for movies in the future rather than just writing the stories that they think are cool. Did you it feels like this infection of intellectual property franchise, like... It can't, yeah, it can't just be a kid is sitting on a moon fishing. It's got to be, look, Kung Fu Panda, look, Shrek, Boss look. Baby, woo. Boss I was going to say baby. Boss Baby, like, have you seen Boss Baby? Is well, Boss Baby any good? I, Boss... I, I haven't I, seen I, it, but I'm pretty sure it's really successful, and that's why it's there. Enough to be in the, yeah, enough to be in the yeah. fucking DreamWorks logo. Because they don't have, uh, they don't have Marty or Alex, though, from Madagascar, which is kind of, they made, like, three of those that's films. That's surprising. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, yeah, there's, there's Shrek Little and Donkey. Shrek. Rick. Man, I will be very sad if, if Pixar ever replaces uh, Luxo Jr. Like in their intro. I think, I think I'd be really upset if they did that. It's like iconic. But who knows, maybe they will. Maybe their next logo will be Luxo Jr. running through a field and then there's like, you know, Was Buzz Lightyear in it. And... Yes, there is. Have you not seen yeah. the uh, Luxo short film? You must have seen no, it. No, I don't. Maybe sure. years and years and years ago, and I've forgotten. Who's Luxo Jr.? It's uh, the, lamp, right? the lamp, yeah. Damn, this you, is you not to be confused watch, uh... with the lamp that the genie comes out of, which no, is the inter international intellectual property of Disney, not Pixar, even though they're one of the same now. Matt. Like Activision and Blizzard. They're, just, a, they're a, the axis the... of evil. Can you imagine, like, the conversation in the boardroom where they were like, yeah, so we're changing the logo now. <laughs> like, 
and this is what it's gonna look like. And, and people, then, like, people why, need to know. why would we, why would we change the logo? Like, people love our logo, and it means so much. Uh, and like, yeah, yeah, but things meaning things is that that well, shit we has passed. Out intellectual properties. They need to know all the things that we've made. And like you said, there's a the people of the things we've made, sir. Is like, but do they? This we is, have this to is remind a Sony vision of this as well, right? Uh, like Sony got their is own. There a Sony yeah, you were saying uh, they go the through the little yeah. characters and you saw the Uncharted film. Uh, oh, PlayStation has one. Yeah, right, they have right. one where it's got like it's got like Aloy and and uh, and um, Ratchet what? and Clank and Aloy from Horizon. Uh, yeah, and then like Kratos and stuff. Yeah, we we've talked about that <laughs> in relation to the whole. Uh, Does it have two? Well, you talked yeah. about it because you you won't. Yeah, Fringy won't. Two. When we're off stream, Fringy won't stop talking about how hot Aloy is. <laughs> I now, which it's, is fine. It's funny because, like I I have Horizon Forbidden West, and like I played it for a few hours, and I was just like, man, this is like fine. This is so <laughs> it's so now. generic. This is okay, like fine. It's, like, it's so yeah. okay, you never finished it. But well, the problem is, it's got the problem that people try to ascribe to God of War, where, like, she has a running commentary all the time. Like, every time you achieve a, an objective, she's like, okay, gotta go there, now to find this, and it's like, man. And now playing Dead Space, it's like, you know, Isaac talks when spoken to, and whenever there's nobody oh, around, yeah. he just kind of, like, does his job. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's nice and refreshing. It's, um... It's weird, yeah, writing the dialogue for characters talking to themselves, it seems like that should be easy, because a lot of people talk to themselves. That's a very normal thing to do. But it mm. seems that when you write it, it's never done right. Like, you no, can't, you can't write people talking to themselves on purpose and have it sound good. Yeah. I suppose it's I always going to so be bad. weird, because we're listening to it, and we know that someone wrote it for us to listen to it. Yeah, so it's... yeah I suppose so. Sure, but like... When, you know, like, when John McClane, like, blasts a couple of guys and then keeps telling his joke, right? Like, nobody ever finds that really awkward. It's kind of like, eh, see, he's still telling them his joke, even though he just pumped them full of lead, you know? So, like, what Tell is Tell them the man in black sent you? Uh, I, well, there was that, that joke, but I was talking about Die Hard, not that film. Black oh, Adam and okay. Die Hard are very similar to each other. I, I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> stop <laughs> thinking oh, yeah. about Black Adam. I can't wait for Black Adam 2. Oh, you, you might have to wait a little while. What? What do you mean? <laughs> oh. Black Adam's incredible, guys. <laughs> yeah, the rock Black said Adam is the new soup. What? What? No one could defeat Black <laughs> Adam, not even the box office. Oh. Too soon, man. Yeah. What? Is it? Too soon. I'm well, saying he's too unstoppable. Too oh, the rock. Well, I mean, I'm sure he'll be okay, but, you know. That was hey, his rock one shot. Not, the rock said it's not out of the, the options. They Shut the fuck up, it is. Yeah, no, in the future. I suppose we'll find out about that soon enough. Um, anyway, uh, do we, uh, put some boots last. Dreamworks watch. logo is what we were talking about. Oh, yeah. We were talking about this is a oh, stream yeah, yeah, dedicated no. to how shit the new Dreamworks logo Can we is. Just... I, I, Oh man, imagine if like Disney replaced the castle and they just started doing a thing where they like had a quick montage of not even their animated films, but it also has- Oh, like, it's just the, fucking- it's the dead-eyed fucking Scar and, and Simba uh, from- Yeah. <laughs> like, oh like, god, they might do it. It's a montage of all of the smug protagonist faces from all of the Pixar no. posters. It's just- it's- 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 they just- they just have a, a big blotch of- on screen, you know, like, all right. <laughs> we wanted to stay true to our brand. <laughs> we're not pretending yeah, anything anymore, that, okay? We're doing the opposite of a Pizza Hut, and we're updating our logo to be just what we really are <laughs> deep on the inside. We're just shit. <laughs> That's shit. That's <sighs> a big old poopy. So, oh, where should we even begin with, with this whole movie? Maybe we should start at Puss in Boots one. 1. Maybe the context of Puss in Boots 1, because yeah, we watched that. Oh, well, I, not all I of us. <laughs> two of two of us watched it. Yeah, yeah I'm not among um, those two. To be fair, I actually I watched it after I watched uh, the Last Wish, which um, is funny. I watched them in the reverse order, and we had different results as a result of that result. Uh, that's a yeah, that's right. To get, to, 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 the short version is: I saw the first one, was like, hmm. Well, whereas I saw the first one, I was like, you'll like the second one a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, the the quickest review of the first one. For those who don't know, the storyline is I think is it Puss in Boots after Shrek three goes back home question mark. 
Well, Shrek. Wait. Uh, what was I, it Shrek I, Four? I don't actually know timeline wise. Shrek the What's Fourth that? is what the fourth one was called. Also, wow, J Mac just made like everyone a member. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> um, it's still like it updating the, the chat logo. Thing. Yeah, you'd be like, what the fuck? <laughs> Everyone has access to those brilliant emotes like metal crying and rags being... What would you summarize that emote as? Rags being confused and upset? I think in the Discord it's called, like, rags what? Yeah, that about what? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, uh, Puss in Boots 1 is a prequel to Shrek 2, I suppose you could say. Well, but isn't it's it... Like the it's a, well, it's a prequel second. and um, it, takes place, it takes place in the past and the future, I thought. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure it's a strict prequel. Really? Yeah, I okay. thought so. Well, um, in any case, you get a big old... It's a big old origin story movie for uh, the hero that is Puss in Boots. And it's surprising in that, like, you, you check it out, and, and the, the film is basically like, all right, so, Puss in Boots, he, uh, he has this huge history, and it all revolves around his friend Humpty Dumpty. And you're like, uh, oh, I know him. And Humpty Dumpty's know, voiced... Humpty Dumpty. He's oh. voiced by Zach Galifianakis. Uh, and oh, yeah, I haven't seen him and and um, I think yeah, the, the, they make the meme pretty pretty quickly that uh, he felt abandoned by Puss because he was left um, on a on a wall after he had fallen off it, and he said yeah, and they made a they made a rhyme about it, and it's just like haha, I guess this is vaguely in universe references. I enjoy these things when they happen in the Shrek verse. That's what this is, right? The Shrek. Yeah, the, the Shrek universe. I think so. That's the yeah. Um, and yeah, and so you got the, the, the story is basically just that, uh, they, when they were growing up, they were kind of outcasted a little bit in their little orphanage and, uh, they, they teamed up and Puss was gradually enjoying becoming, I guess, more skilled and talented. At, yeah. He, he, and, he, and it, there was, there was this one time that he had a taste of being a hero and then he started doing it full time while Humpty Dumpty went the way of hyper thief and wanted to invent things and, Get access to great stuff to ultimately. Uh, what was his like ultimate goal? I forget what what Humpty wanted to do with all of the money. Uh, he wanted, didn't he want to fly? Was that it? Want to fly? I think Humpty so. Dumpty. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> what, he wanted to fly to what end? So this oh. is what I'm telling you because like it wasn't a very engaging film. No. So, <laughs> so you, this is part of the problem. Is I've forgotten a lot of it. and I watched it like days ago. It's it's uh uh. In any case, um. Puss in Boots is like the town hero, and then Humpty Dumpty is like, oh, I got, I got a thing we got to do, definitely, 100%, we got to do it. And he's like, oh, what? And he's like, S stay here in this carriage. Like I will I, uh, Well, he sells it as, don't you worry, I'm sorting something out. Puss in Boots doesn't really mm -hmm. ask much questions. And then Humpty Dumpty just drops like a bunch of money cats. on the, the carriage they're in. And he's like, go, you're the getaway driver of this thing where I've just stolen a whole bunch of money, go, go, go. And I remember just thinking to myself, like... Why weren't you the getaway? Just put the money in the thing and then you drive. Like, cause now <laughs> Puss in Boots is going to be like, what the fuck's going on? Like, I don't even want to be a crime person. And uh, that goes awry. So Humpty Dumpty becomes a thief, right? He, he just is. He, he always was. Oh, he is a thief. He always was. He never really became like a hero. That's yeah. kind of like his arc he sort of goes on in the film. Yeah. Is um, he a thief because he's shellfish? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, all right. Now he can move forward. Right, to the to money. The money is lost the to the world, and Puss in Boots is seen as like a bad guy. So is Humpty, and that's that's that history. And then we fast forward, right? And Puss in Boots is, as far as we're aware, mercenary cat, basically, um, yeah, vigilante sort of thing going on. And uh, Humpty wants to hire him so that they can carry on his grand plan of going finding magic beans, in uh, which in this case are being uh, hoarded by Jack and Jill. Who have a very specific and strange adaptation in this film? They're uh, they're they're big and gross and evil. They're they're like happy to just kill everybody, basically. Not to say that I'm very familiar with the Jack and Jill story or all of its iterations, but it's just it was interesting to see them like that. And I I kind of I almost I'm putting a pin in it kind of because this is going to come up again when we talk about the Last Wish. Um, mm -hmm. they have the magic beans. We the, the, the our heroes get the beans off them. They go up the bean stalk into the land of the giants. They steal the golden goose, the golden egg laying goose, and take it back down. 
And then Puss realizes the whole time that he was just being strung along by Humpty, who betrays him along with the whole town, who apparently were in on it. And then okay. Puss goes whole to jail. But Kitty soft paws feels guilty, and so she helps him break out. And Yay. then we and find then, out uh, that Humpty Dumpty... Yeah, Humpty Dumpty was hoping that the Golden Goose's mum was going to come try and get it and just stomp through the city like a Godzilla-type thing. And uh, then oh. works with us to save the day, but dies in the process. Mm -hmm. Bulls and gets cracked, and he's, like, golden. And like, uh, see, he was good after all, but not really. Uh, <laughs> uh... <laughs> it's a... Uh... I was about I to guess say, the, I don't believe that. <laughs> the problems with the film for me were just that um, there's just not many emotional beats that are very high. No. It's all very normal, and and um, I didn't like Humpty as a as a character. I wouldn't even say there's much usually wrong with him in terms of like inconsistencies, but I just wasn't engaged by him at all. I think that anybody watching the film would be able to tell instantly. He's like, so he's going to betray Puss in Boots at some point. Like, there's, yeah. I don't see where else his story's going. As eggs do. Yeah. And uh, and and I don't know. It didn't. They didn't sell his uh, turn for me into a good guy at the end. He just was just kind of like, "You should be a good guy, you fuck." And he's like, "Hmm, I guess so." Fine. Um. Why? I just don't think they did much work with anybody in that film. It's uh, it's just really like, eh, like, yeah, you're hitting some standard beats, but not that effectively. And it's just like, I don't know. Like, it's not, it's not a very engaging film. Yeah, and no, I give it, a, I'd give it a thumbs up and just move on. And like I said, it's not been that long, and I've already forgotten a shit ton of uh, mm. of the plot line, which is not a good sign. And so then I was like, well, uh, everyone's talking about the sequel, so I guess I'll check that out. And that one's called Puss in Boots The Last Wish. And as you may know from other things that have been said here and there about different shows, uh, all four of us were quite a big fan of this one. This one was a yeah. surprise. I did not expect it to be as good as it was. Yeah, I would even say that Puss in Boots is, like, I I think all of you guys should see this. I really love this yeah. movie quite I don't, a lot. I, I would basically recommend it to everybody. I feel like everybody's going to go and watch it yeah. and enjoy it a hell of a lot. Yeah, that's Absolutely. actually a point. Uh, if you listen to this and you're waiting for some good movies to watch and you're holding out hope. And you haven't watched Puss in Boots yet. Puss in yeah, Boots The Last Puss Wish. From here, from here on out, when we just say Puss in Boots, we're talking about Puss in Boots The Last Wish. We're, we're done talking yeah. about the original. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. This, uh, this is one of DreamWorks' best films. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, go watch it and then come back to us talking about it because we're probably going to be spoilering everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, baby. Um, but yeah, uh, film opens with the idea of there's a, a place in the world you can go where you can satisfy with a wish. A falling star hit the dark forest, or well, the dark forest was born from that, and it's like, from the star, yeah. if you go there, you get to satisfy a whole ass wish. It's like, all right, fair enough. And then, why do you say that? Why you satisfy a wish? Uh, um, I don't know. I just I ran with that word. I think it's good <laughs> enough. It's all right. <clears throat> Grant a wish probably would have been better. You get you get to make a wish. To make a wish. Because to... you could grant a wish to yourself by making it. So it's it's like um they add in like, yeah, you get to grant yourself a wish by making it. In any case. When you wish upon the star. He does his little sing very, sang very at the beginning. Just basically puts in boots at his most heightest of primest. He's super happy, confident, and top notch skillman. He's uh pissing people off who are I guess the place of the person who owns this and he's just he's just having fun with a song and also takes out a giant. Yeah. Why not? That's just something Bites Puss in Boots giant, can casually do. Sings a song in a in a <clears throat> mansion. The people are loving him. Oh, Puss in Boots, you're so amazing. You're so incredible. And um, it's very, I it, it'll carry through. But it's apparent from the very first moments of the film how how vibrantly both colorful and animated this movie is. It's oh yeah, uh, it's a yeah, now delight to watch. To say that. It's, the animation uh, it's incredible. is incredible. Well, yeah, because we good. have um, we have like the normal scenes and then we have action scenes. And when action scenes happen, the frame rate lowers, which you might the think the characters lowers and animates yeah. on twos, which yeah. you think might. Which maybe, but just hearing that seems very odd and counterintuitive. Like, well, wouldn't you want more frames when people are doing action? It's like, well, I don't know if you want that, but uh, it's certainly a stylistic choice that works really, really well. Um, Animating and... on two 
emphasize keyframes uh, more than mm. animating on ones can, um, just because it gives your eyes a little bit more time to register those poses. So like that, because I think that's the one that people notice, right? When he, he dodges the bell and he just does this kind of little flip where he's like facing backwards, they hold on that for a few more frames than they probably would have if it was like in the regular way that they would do it. It just, yeah, it's a, it's a stylistic choice. It's something that is... Uh, not often seen in 3D animation, much more common in 2D animation, but now a lot more films are trying out those techniques. Um, this film is using a lot of techniques that are more like from traditional uh, 2D animation, like smears and motion lines, and all of it like contributes to this uh, really interesting look. It's kind of like a, a you know like a painting come to life in this case. Yes, like so the film's cool always a delight to just watch. Yeah, you Certainly can pause on like any this is... frame and just be like, man, that looks awesome. Yeah, it's like <laughs> you pause and it's like, I could use this as a wallpaper and this. Wallpaper. And this. actually, yeah. it doesn't matter. It just all looks very good. Reminds me of Spider Verse, which uh, uh, yes. yeah. awesome. probably no has a comic booky sort of. Uh, well, feel it's to something it. that uh, DreamWorks has been experimenting more with different animation styles because The Bad Guys, which also came out last year, is going for like a pitchable Your kind of style. Your Wolf movie. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, like it's, Fringy agrees. Fringy told me that. Um, that 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 film also is using some more traditional two D animation techniques integrated with like three D animation, and it's just like yeah, it's really cool that we're starting to see more and more and more experimentation with like the kind of styles that you can use in three uh, D animation. Um, I'm pretty sure that DreamWorks has specifically like credited Spider Verse as like a big inspiration on both of those films. As well as other stuff like Akira was referenced uh, as well. I haven't seen Akira yet, so yeah, I can't speak to that. But it's it's cool. Like this movie looks amazing the whole yeah. the whole way through. It looks it looks so great, and it's kind of something I didn't even fully realize until I went and watched Puss in Boots. Is that um the first one is like man, there's like small tweaks to the designs of the characters that just make them look like way better. As far as I'm concerned, like this style really complements these characters. There are times when Puss kind of looks a bit uncanny in the first film, whereas here it's like every his his expressions are really emotive. Yes. Everybody's expressions are really emotive. Uh, it this is, style lends um... itself so very well. To, yeah, you can see the smears when you go on, Jesus you go on Christ. slower. Mm. And the two, so like a hundred people have like tried to point out the whole the, the wolf in the crowd. I was just like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, everyone's gonna <laughs> die if I don't acknowledge that. It's like, yes, that's yeah. a thing. Anyway, carry on. Yeah. The the film is never, it's it's never garish, but it's very very colorful. The color seems to fit. They seem to fit, and um, they're very appropriate to the scene, which is something that I really really like about this movie. Is that it seems to juggle sort of three tones, um, and it balances them all very very well. It's up there with, I don't know if it's up there with. It might be. But generally, we reference Jojo Rabbit as how to have. You know, balanced uh, scenes in a movie, two distinct kind of tones or vibes well, that coexist right. in the same, to, you know, to world. Bolster that, uh, to bolster that point, to make it clear to people. So after this fight, uh, uh, the bell that he uses to knock out the giant lands on Puss and he dies. And then it's revealed by a doctor that he is on his last of his nine lives. Yes. And from that point onward, he is thrust upon a journey where he has to confront his own mortality Mm -hmm. and essentially deconstructs the myth uh, of Puss in Boots that we kind of see here, of just like almost almost like a, a reckless abandon, just like a, a complete, uh, like the, the, the confidence stems from a place that is uh, not quite sound, as is revealed um, by a pretty significant encounter with, a major, with, uh, with the wolf later on. And so over the course of the story, it sort of deconstructs the legend of puss in boots and then reconstructs it around a more solid foundation um yeah there he is there's the wolf everybody's favorite yeah. new wolf man yeah <laughs> um, and so and so what rags is talking about is the fact that um this film balances its tone incredibly well jumping between moments that are really funny to moments that are incredibly tense or dramatic uh yeah and it, does there is... and it never it never feels like it's undercutting the drama um like it's 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 a really difficult thing to do. Yeah, jokes never get in the way of like a serious moment, and a serious moment never gets in the way of a joke. There are lighthearted scenes where there's clearly you know comedy is in lightheartedness, and the spirit of adventure is clearly what they're trying to convey. And there are other scenes where you're like afraid, where you have this legitimately quite scary 
um, antagonist <clears throat> um, that our protagonist is very afraid of. Um, well, yeah, on, on the, the subject of DreamWorks Best, the wolf is one of DreamWorks Best villains. Um, I have very big compliments uh, to pay to all of the villains in this film. Uh, well, because we've yes. got a few, yeah, because yeah, we've got Jack <clears throat> Horner as well. Um, who occupies a very different slot, and I guess as an antagonistic element, you've got Goldilocks and the three bears who themselves get to go on. An... This film has a lot of arcs running, it's like every a lot, like it's a lot of things. It's got a lot of things running. There's a lot and going even... on, and it's not like a super long movie. It's no, it's one and a half an hour and a half. Right? Yeah, yeah, this is an incredibly. Minutes. If you want to look, <clears throat> if this, you want this an movie example uses of an incredibly time film. incredibly well. It's not like yeah. a, oh, yeah. it's not like a three-hour movie where people talk and talk, but nothing matters. Well, yeah, like if you want an example of madness, of, uh, it just goes on and on. It's oh, like, I, you're gonna oh, say oh, Avatar. I, 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 I wouldn't have picked Multiverse Avatar. of Madness. Uh, that's Multiverse not... of Madness is absurdity. Avatar would be the yeah, good example. Av this yeah, mo Avatar. this movie is one and a half hours long, and we've got arcs running for Puss for Kitty, who, by the way, Kitty's a way more developed character in this film, and the relationship between her and Puss is much more compelling. They've got a lot more going up, yeah. on, and it's uh, it's 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 complementing the core theme of the film a lot. And then you've got arcs running for Goldilocks as well. Um, in, in a certain sense, Perito doesn't necessarily... Perito is a new companion they have. He's a dog who's living in the cat sanctuary that Puss goes to. And <laughs> yeah. he is like a relentlessly optimistic character. And it's not necessarily that he goes on a, a big arc or anything, but more so that he like significantly complements uh, the arcs that everybody else is going on. But it's like, we got a whole bunch of different characters with their mm -hmm. own things going on that are bound by this central theme, but are exploring it in different ways. Like, what is the meaning of life and where is it derived from? Like, what is valuable to you and what makes it valuable? Um, yeah, and like, this it's struggling like, um... all of these things incredibly well, considering that it's only about like an hour and a half. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll sort of pair this up in the same way with the next animated movie we talk about after this. But a lot of the themes and messages here, it goes far beyond... Be a good person. Don't steal. Uh, don't yes. lie. Uh, you know, like <clears throat> the, the most basic bitch kind of moral lessons that you tell to like a four year old, you know? These well, are films that, yeah. Let's, let's put it this way. I would say that if you look at a lot of the, well, if you look at a lot of the films that I would consider to be like among the best animated films, recently rewatched Kung Fu Panda 1 and 2. And Kung Fu Panda is like, again, that's one of DreamWorks' best films. And that's got essentially, that's got some pretty fundamental themes as well, but it also has the willingness to challenge some of those things as well, right? There's the conversation between uh, Master Ugwe and uh, and Shifu, where it's, it's, it's about like the nature of control or like, you know, accepting things as they are and just letting things play out. And then there's like, you know, the claim of, oh, well, you know, like, I, I can't like compel this... Uh, I can't compel this peach tree to do these things for me. And then, you know, like Shifu's like, well, there are things we can control. It's like, yeah, that's true. There are things we can control. But at the same time, there's a lot that we can't control. Kind of like just more elements to it than just, you know, a, a simple answer that's just easy to, uh, that's easy to, uh, you know, that, that doesn't really, it's just not very honest. And I feel like if there's, like this film is particularly honest in terms of its exploration of our, uh, of, of, like, its central themes about the nature of, like, confronting one's own mortality. Man, them feels not you the, get not from the Kung Fu Panda 1 and 2 as well with the dad, you know. Yes. Good stuff. Rewatch those movies. I haven't seen them in ages. Good, they're good. Um, yeah. I like this idea that DreamWorks seems to accept this premise that in a movie that is uh, digestible for kids, there is still a lot of messages that go far beyond you know, typical children's stories, morals. Um, there's some heavy, heady stuff, and it's portrayed in a way that's approachable. Um, I don't, it doesn't treat kids like they're stupid, dumb idiots. Uh, there's actually stuff in there to think about that I like. Uh, mm -hmm. Just because a, a movie's a kid's movie, in a way, that doesn't mean it has to be infantile. Um, and I, and I like that. I don't want to discount like this huge swath of, um, you know, storytelling or that it can't have deeper stuff going on beneath the surface. This is one of those movies that you want to tell people about. It's like, yeah, but this is a kid's movie when it's like an actual awful movie. It's like, yeah, yeah, but you can do a kid's movie that's really good. Look at Puss in Boots 2. Because you can watch it on the surface. It's like, oh, this is fun and haha. -ha. And it's like, ooh, scary wolf. Ooh. But then if you go back to watch it when you're older, it's like, oh. There's much more going on here. 
So well, I think I think simply that uh, this film was made as though it were for everybody. It, exactly. it wasn't made with like a target audience in mind. It's like they had a story that they wanted to tell, and they told it in a way that was like broadly approachable. To um, echo something Theo said that is arguably underrated when we were doing our Ragnarok coverage. It was actually in response to uh, Synthetic Man saying that the reason Ragnarok is so bad is because they tried to make it for everyone, and when you make something designed for everyone, you make it so that like no one will love it. It's a, it's a common phrasing, right? It, when you yes. try and get everyone to like it, no one will. And Theo says like the the more accurate point of view is that you. It's not about who you're making it for. It's it's uh, what experience you're trying to generate and uh, whether or not you give a shit uh, as to... Like, if, if you're trying to go for, I want this experience to be basically something everyone is going to engage in and they will find it. This is kind of... I'm trying to go with Marvel with this, where it's like, they don't want to hang on any particular emotion for any... Uh, too long of a time. that They want you to come out having a, a jumble of different things. Like, that is a general good experience. I feel like I had... From their point of view, a good meal, but obviously we've gone to the point of saying it's just like really bad fast food at this point. Um, Puss in Boots is generating a very specific uh, idea and set of experiences, but they work for all ages. I can't see why all of the cute cats doing silly things and the cartoon characters, you know, screwing around for the super young ages. Then you get to like the middle uh, ages who are just uh, appreciating like, oh man, this is inspirational. This is uh, uh, for maybe if you're going through some stuff. But then, you know, the really older forms of the audience being like, maybe people who have thought about death a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, because kids don't think about death. Yeah. They try to avoid it or <laughs> you almost want to protect kids <laughs> from having to think about death, right? But like it's it's all embedded into these films and, you know, uh, there's, just, there's just different layers to appreciate it on. And well, I guess yeah, that's... and I imagine that if you were a kid and you watched it now, you'd be like, yeah, that was a really fun movie. And then it's kind of the same thing that happens when you rewatch like a lot of the older Pixar films. Like a lot of what The Incredibles was about, like a lot of that was lost on me. But like that's that's cool, right? Because it was there and and it was it was great and it was fun when I watched it. But then when I can go back and watch it later, it's like, oh my god, like it's all yeah. wow, you know? Like it's it's just you gain a greater appreciation for the story. Yeah, and I think um, Simpsons is one of the better examples of that as well, right? Simpsons like, there's too. so much oh, yeah, shit but, in that that's for adults. Yeah, but I guess that was a case of like, yeah, of course I'm watching The Simpsons. It's like, oh yeah, right. Like there was a ton about The Simpsons that I was just never gonna understand, like as a kid. <laughs> um, um, but it's it's just cool, right? Because they created a story where they had something to say, and regardless of whether it was going to be broadly understood, though they did a very good job of making it so. Um, they they soldiered on anyway with like something that you know is not often explored right in films that are gonna be watched um, by like families. So with the how this began as well, I was kind of like uh, it's the, uh, the with, with the opening. I was just like this. As uh, I was more so appreciating the animation and the production of it all as opposed to storytelling. Uh, it was before you get more context. This is like well yeah, these just action packed hero dominating and doing really well. And then. Even the death doesn't really phase him. He's just like, eh, whatever. It's um, the scene with the first uh, <laughs> meeting with uh, the wolf is, is where I was just like, okay, I'm listening. Like, this, yeah, this yes. has gotten very fucking interesting. Was... Yeah, in I, it's, it's, it's a, it is a wake-up call, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It, it, it well, was, this, uh... this wolf is getting around in uh, terms of memes and just appreciation. I've seen, People are even saying, like, this yes, shit has. deserves every kind of like uh, award, like, in, and it's because he's he's not just really great in terms of design, in terms of voice acting, in terms of what he represents in the story, but man, he's just he's everybody had stuff to think about with him in these scenes, uh, uh, yeah. and what he what he does, what what he is, and uh, you know, just the this this opening scene, you get the they 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 they, they went creepy with this guy. I'm just gonna say, you they know. Did. There's some like scary imagery that goes on with him. The red eyes, the the way that the entire movie shifts the tone away from you know happy and victorious and heroic and kind of lackadaisical to like boom, it's like a new movie kind of starts in, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, and that's uh, I, I think I think it was um because as I, as he was talking, I was just like hmm hmm. But then there was once the fight happened, and then there was the 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 big old shot, the big emphasized shot, and then mm -hmm. which I mean it's gonna show up eventually. It was basically 
they have their short fight and Puss is not doing very well. No. And then he gets hit. Like he gets struck by uh by the wolf sickle. And then he starts bleeding. When I when that happened, I was like, oh, oh I think showing it was blood. that I think I realized that oh that this was gonna be a really good movie. Also, I, I think I, as soon I, as for lack of better terms, it just feels a little more real, the 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 blood on his hand as well when he looks at it, than yes. um you typically yeah. often get you rarely ever get blood in movies like this anyway. No, yeah. so the fact that there was that in the first place, but it was just um he's been the hurt. Center of and that then... scene, right? The blood yeah. was like very prominent in how he reacts yeah, there to the it is. look at that very... shot look at him like yeah. it's and that's the leveraging of and the it's, new it's also style. been emphasized earlier in the movies like oh no blade has ever struck me like i'm i'm yeah. basically you can't beat me in a fight and then this happens mm -hmm. and there's little blood and you realize like oh and yeah. that's all my last life uh i'm out of here that's the point when i realized i think yeah. that this was going to be a really good movie and then it's the fact that it's like this is his heart just starts racing the hair is standing up yeah. on his back and then we get the life flashing, well, lives flashing before his eyes. And it's just like, oh, like, damn. Like, he, oh, like, he's, he is scared. He's Very quite terrified. Scared. He's yeah. terrified. really terrified. Yeah. Um, it's just, yeah, and like, this it, is, all this his is hair stands on end and, and yeah. the wolf is just like, haha, like, this yeah. is great. Yeah. Like, he's yeah. so yeah. disarming while simultaneously terrifying. Mm -hmm. Well, just, just the... The opening where he sits down and he wants his autograph yeah. and he puts the poster and he taps on the right dead part. There. I'm like, ooh, yeah. that's that's like legitimately imposing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's um th this this film, by the way, very thoughtfully uses the lives <clears throat> the life flashing before your eyes thing. It's like super relevant plot critical even, um, is, yeah. or like thematically very critical. It's probably one of the best utilizations of that meme. Of lives of lives flashing before a character's eyes because it hits a lot of uh it hits a lot of moments throughout the series. You see, even see Shrek and Donkey in there. Um, well, you know what you don't see. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> no, you don't see Humpty oh, Dumpty. Okay. Yeah, it's that's not... right. See, the, is... I wonder is like is it the same like I know it's the same like people, but is it the same like people people who made this one? They made the last one. The fact that they didn't even have Humpty Dumpty. Why? Uh the director what? was not the director of the first film. Um, okay. He's done other stuff. He's his long huh. childhood friend. They would have had plenty of good memories, but they didn't involve him, which, um... Yeah. To be honest with you, I think I may have thrown one flash of him with Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> well, they threw in, uh... They threw in Kitty Softpaws. But that's because she's way more relevant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she'll be relevant right, in the story. Yeah. But yeah, uh... Yeah, look that him. face he Sorry, has when we come back from those flashbacks, just yeah. like, Jesus. And again, it works way better... When you have that opening scene where he's hyper confidently doing his thing. Well, yes. The point of that scene, as as far as I'm concerned, is this is the legend of Puss in Boots, the legend that gets around him on his own, bravely launching into danger, super confident, and then this is tearing it down like immediately. It's gone. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, it's the he the fact that he leaves his sword behind, right? That's like the legend is uh that he's the legend is dead, essentially. Like, it's already been, it's been, like, instantly, uh, destroyed. And, and, like, for the rest of the film, it's about reclaiming that legend, but essentially Puss realizing, like, that what he's actually after is not what he thought, it's not what he, what he thinks he needs, which is, I'm gonna go get the, the, the wish to get my nine lives back. That's his goal. And he realizes that his goal is, uh, you know, that changes over the course of the story as he learns a lot of oh, things yeah. about himself and life. Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's really, it's really tight thematically. I really like that of like, this is the legend, the legend is dead, I need to reclaim it, and in the process he invents a new legend, essentially about himself, a much more sound one. Well that's the thing we, there are people in our spheres that say like, I'm so fucking tired of deconstructions, and what we'll always end up saying is like, well I'm not tired of the good ones though. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, good ones. Just, uh, always comes back to how you would do it. It's, it's done well. Done, it's done well, you do go, go nuts, I don't care, just well, you know, fuck it up. Yeah, this it's got to be more clever than, oh yeah, well, what if Luke was shit? What if Luke, <laughs> yeah, what well, if that would be a little bit better than that? What cool. makes this one really cool is that they deconstruct him and then reconstruct him. They build him back up again. Yeah. It's like, we, we, we yeah. tear into this legend, but then we build him back up at the end with a much more <laughs> uh, sound base from which to move forward in the future. What is that Jack Porter is the best character? It's like... Jack Horner. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Clearly your favorite. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he goes to a sanctuary, uh, meets Perito, and 
uh, gets terrified when he believes that um, the wolf has arrived, but it's actually one of the three yeah. bears with Goldilocks. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we're not we're not doing a full breakdown of this. It's more so just bouncing yeah. between topics and hopefully in a chronological-ish way. But it was fun seeing uh, the the Goldilocks and the three bears, and it's a different version. I immediately thought about the Jack and Jill of the previous film. <laughs> Feels like a similar sort of adaptation, but the execution, oh my. And I think with them, after hearing everyone else too, I was like, fuck, the voice acting in this is amazingly good. It's really, yes. really phenomenal throughout. Because uh, Antonio Banderas is uh, phenomenal. Like, he, uh, he, is, he is persistently and consistently, like, incredible <laughs> in this film. Yeah, and you get you get um, um, Ray Winston and Jenna Coleman as as the mama yes. and papa bear. Like, damn. Well, it was really funny when uh, because the bears don't talk before that, and then when they show up at the right. house, it's like you know, Papa Bear's just snarling. He's like, "Hello, miss. I'm looking for the <laughs> Hello, most miss. In boots. <laughs> and then, I don't uh, know why he doesn't yeah, do more mom, voice acting. Ray Winston. It's quite a it's quite yeah, a powerful voice. Yeah. Um, Maybe this will get then, him into the game. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe this will be the one that makes him realize that this is, is one of his callings. And yeah, it's been pointed out, Florence Pugh is Goldilocks. Yes, which uh, when I found that out, I'm like, wow, you have a lot of range. <laughs> like, you just, mm. I had no idea. Well, remember the, one of the two good things that ever happened in Black Widow, hers was one of them, but it like uh, comes out of nowhere. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. well, she, she can cry on cue. <laughs> so, like, where does that come from? That's the thing about it. It's, it kind of sucks with modern Marvel films. They rarely push the actors that far. A lot of yeah, it is just... they have all the money to have these incredible actors and everything, but it's like, what does that That's accomplish? Kind of just, yeah, it's like you just have really talented actors and you give them shit material, so like we don't accomplish anything. Um, but yeah, they're here because they want to get Puss in Boots, right? To hire him for a job. Yeah, to, yeah, to, job. to steal uh, from Jack Horner. Ah. Yeah, the yes, the and, star. and what's funny is, uh, I kind of liked it. Uh, there, there was there are benefits to of seeing Puss in Boots one before two. Um, Puss is trying to steal the thing that they were going to hire him to steal because it's going to lead him to the to the wish. And it's a map to the wish, and obviously, if he gets his wish, he can get his lives back. So, you know, plot plot nice and straightforward. And he actually gets to the point where he's nearly grabbing it, and uh, Kitty Soft pulls is there as well, which is how they I think like cross paths in the first one. They were both. Uh, separately hired to do a job. Yes. Um, yeah. Just kind of, kind of a fun thing because this was like the unique opportunity to get uh, Jack Horner's map. But yeah, I should probably have about time to talk about him. Well, so he's... Jack Horner, yeah. Holy <laughs> shit, Jack Horner! When I first saw his face, I couldn't stop laughing. I just, his I, hair. I lost <laughs> it. He is so funny looking, and the <laughs> things he says, it's like so, so evil and and funny evil. And oh man, he's like this big guy, but with a base in relation, tiny head and legs. And <laughs> like, tiny oh, face, I think you mean. Proportioned. <laughs> comically proportioned. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Proportions. So, look at his face. <laughs> like it's it's so small, but there's so much head left. He looks like a Twitch streamer. And he, yeah, he's just he's just so evil and so unapologetically evil. Yeah, yeah like selfish, a Twitch streamer. But like, he's, there's, there's no ulterior motive at all or like there's no or rather there's no there's no like explanation or real seemingly good cause for who he is or no, like he's... a redeemable quality he just he's well, just I, evil he just i mean i can't help but draw the connection right that history of uh pinocchio dragging off the attention from him when he was younger and as he's older he's like fucking packaged and collected fairy tale shit i wonder oh, if there's yeah. there's something there like a bitterness that he he gets to he control the uh, yeah. the elements that took his the tension away from him when he was younger, you know, it's it's nothing complicated. Uh, my God, uh, uh, is everyone just happy about that? Almost yeah. like yeah, this guy yeah. is just a fucking asshole. But like he's he he's not things. stupid. Like no, he's uh he's he just, just very selfish himself. and he's aware of that. Yeah. And it really gets emphasized when Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> Jiminy Cricket hangs Dude. out with him throughout the movie. Okay. He's his conscience, you know, and he's gonna... Jiminy he's Cricket. Gonna conscience. Of your character. Jiminy Cricket was um, such a wonderful surprise. Um, yes. It was great. It really just was. Him, well, yeah, the, the Goldilocks time. and the Three was... Bears were a wonderful surprise. Like, yeah. They were a very big part of the movie, and they just, like, show up, and they're a whole character set, <laughs> and they're all different, 
and they're just what this wonderful addition to this already jam-packed story. That's what I mean. We were done at this we're point spoiled. in terms of needing characters, and yet they throw a new one at us, and he's like, magical locust, eat all of these <laughs> things. He's like, oh, I'm not a magical locust. <laughs> oh, what, what, yeah, what are you then? then? It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a cricket. It's like, well, then cast a spell on the flowers. <laughs> just, some die. sort of demon grasshopper. <laughs> A deadly fairy. I think now while he grabs the, the noble phoenix. Oh god, as he's using it as a flamethrower. It's like, oh, this is gonna be harder than I thought. And then of course the big judge of these two characters. Of character. Oh, he was, not, is so great. He feels like a completely yeah. different era of a character. It is so yeah, fun to have him in here. And then just like the part when he's gonna shoot Perino with the uh, unicorn horn, like you're not gonna off. shoot a you're puppy not... in the face, are you? Yeah, in the face. Why? Why? <laughs> yes, in you the face. A puppy. The, oh, the part, yeah. good. The, the payoff when it's it's just like he just realizes that uh that Jack's plan is to basically hoard all of magic for himself, and that he like abandons all of his uh baker's yeah. dozen to die. It's like, oh. Your wish is horrible. <laughs> You're horrible. The frame, the fucking frame with the red the in the background, well, and yellow, and like, You're so horrible. And it just goes like, oh, 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 no, no, no. What took you so long, idiot? He's and just, just flicks him away. He's yeah. this adorable little cricket man. Yeah. Like, and he's, he's like, you're no, he's just, When right. Jack is annihilated in the forest, and he's just terrified, he just goes, <laughs> don't be near where I'm flamethrowing. <laughs> 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 Yeah. It's this. It's an excellent combo. Those two, yeah, yes, complete man. fucking oh, opposites. Know. There's this little scene before that, that all happens that I find quite funny. There's like this one guy who's like, ah, I'm gonna cut these flowers down. Just gets eaten, and only a skeleton is left over. <laughs> and there's this this other random bacon dozen guy who's like, No, Jerry. <laughs> Yeah, it's it the Last of Us 2 meme. I was already, <laughs> just, when he's like, fetch the baker's dozen or whatever, I was watching it with Rags, and I just yeah. started laughing. It was like, yeah, of the course, baker's the baker's dozen. dozen. Funny. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. It's, a, oh, it's just so creative and fun and stupid, and you're just getting rewarded constantly. Like, all these little payoffs coming from... Again, his little, his, his infinite bag of just references pretty much oh and yeah just when wonderful. he has mm. that Excalibur and it's still got the rock attached to it <laughs> oh, it's I couldn't get great. it out of the stone but it's still pretty cool right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. he um he can't get it out at first and he uh he like steps mm -hmm. on one of his men as leverage mm -hmm. it's just he's such an ass <laughs> in everything that he does well, I just like the part when he's like, you know, I didn't have much growing up except stability, like a, <laughs> a, a loving family, family. Like, you know, a mansion and a loving family, a successful and business <laughs> inherited, you know, the usual stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, worthless crap like that, I think he says. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, when he, when, he, when he was baited grabbing Excalibur, I think we were like, he has Excalibur? And then he pulls it out and it's that chunk, you're like, oh, <laughs> that's how he has Excalibur. It's uh, great it's, because... It's, it's, Oh, it's like the it. meme you, you, you talk about. It's like, just dig around it. Why are you tr trying to do the hard thing? Yeah, there you have it. <laughs> yeah, I can believe he would do that. Yeah. What's, the fun yeah, what's thing interesting about, about, like, cut, just uh, the Excalibur uh, thing is um, it's such a kind of, like, throwaway little joke. Like, oh, haha, it's funny that he ex has Excalibur. But the only point of having Excalibur is to actually use it as a sword. You have to pull it out of the sword. You have to pull like, Excalibur specifically as a reference that's being used by Jack Horner works because Excalibur is a weapon that's used to unite England, right? And it has to be used as a sword to do that. And in order for you to have, like, becoming king, you have to pull it out of the stone. So both of those important elements of Excalibur requires it to be removed from the stone. And he's so unworthy in every way but he is so greedy all at the same time that he essentially reduces the sword to essentially uselessness for the sake of his selfishness. Yeah. He just doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't care about the usage of any of these items. They're not precious no, he to him wants them. Yeah, he, he just wants them for the sake of having them. Yeah, it would be curious. Well, what, uh, what did he say he wanted the wish for? Uh, he wanted, oh, he wanted the master of all magic. magic. Him, yeah. right. have it. That was the big thing. He wanted it so nobody else could have it. Yeah, which is in Not line with the really thing. do anything with it. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, you find out that um, Goldilocks's interest in the in the wish is so that she can be with. Uh, was it was that a secret to yeah. the bears that she wanted to be with a, I think, no. a no, family? They, they family. Were just helping her get a wish, but she hadn't told them what it was. And she they was like they me. take it well though when they find out because they they, they, well. 
they're supportive. Well, yeah, they, they, they have the initial shock of it, but then they decide to help her. Because that's her real family, and that's something that she learns over the course of her adventure. She doesn't need to have Sorry. a whip. Sorry. <laughs> I have to yeah. put this. Oh, you've got that. Reese Talk and Wisecrack and Bears are the best family. It's not just the, the dialogue is fucking great. Look at Jack's face yeah. when yeah. Jiminy Cricket suggests like it would be bad to do that. He's just like, ugh. <laughs> like, look at, look this look fucking Cricket there. talking it's shit like, again. Perino just like, oh, <laughs> you know, look at that face. Yeah, he looks curious and not that concerned, uh, at least compared wow. to how concerned he should be. Because uh, if you talk, Perito is is he's the best boy, all right. He's uh he's he's a very good boy. He's uh he's a relentlessly positive character despite having endured some pretty uh some pretty bad circumstances in his life. There's a reason he's a of, doggo. Uh, yes. Um. And, and it's kind of uh because when they go to the the forest, uh, the map that they use will change basically depending on on the person who holds it. Like it kind of changes to challenge them directly. Uh, or, or maybe more so to like it, it's it's like tethered to basically beliefs that they have about themselves in the world, and so like Puss's one is filled with perils. Um, Kitty's is is relating to trust issues basically, and meanwhile Perito's is like this really pleasant, like yeah. <laughs> this really pleasant place. Well, pleasant if you understand how to actually maneuver through it, because the scene that mm -hmm. had before with Jack and the Bakers was um. There's a bunch of roses, and all you need to do is just smell them. Stop and smell the roses, because Pareto just, like, sort of absorbs life. Like, he takes it for what it is and tries to get as much out of it as he can. Meanwhile, like, Puss and, and Kitty are like, well, what's the obstacle here? What are we supposed to, like, fight through to get to get there? And it's just, like, these sorts of things are what Pareto is essentially teaching them. A lot of the time, like, unintentionally, he's just kind of living his life and, and, and being his happy old self. Um, but it's, like, it's kind of, like... He has an attitude of non-resistance, basically, of sort of accepting situations as they are and then getting as much out of them as he can. And through him, Puss in particular, but also Kitty, like, learn a hell of a lot about, you know, basically appreciating life for what it is. Perino is a, uh, he's a very good boy. You get a lot of design choices, right? And uh, you find out that the very clothing he's chosen to wear is as a result of a sock that they tried to drown him in, his uh, yeah. family. And if he's and telling the story, Puss yeah. and Kitty are just, like, horrified, and he's like, yeah, but joke's on them, because I got a free sweater. It's and this like... badass story to tell. It's a win-win. Yeah, and right. they're like, oh my god, this is the saddest, funny story I've ever heard. Yeah, like, Kitty is, like, <laughs> terrified at it. Yeah. It's like, oh my god. And yeah, and this this uh, he's he's positive to the to the to the extent of almost basically being delusional. Yeah, like a delusional na naivety. And it's, naivety. It's, it's working out. It's working out. Apparently, it's, it's working for it's, him. Um, That's yeah. the thing. Though. So I think this comes in with the what Rags is sort of talking about with the balancing of tones. But you have half an hour, and in that time, we've had loads of funny jokes. This introduction of an insane that Jack Horner is just a fucking powerhouse in this story for funnies. Um. And then in the middle of this absurd fight where Jack is shooting his own men with unicorn horns and turning them into confetti and all this like yep. fun shit, it, everything slows down and stops and then the wolf whistle comes in and yeah. just Puss is fucking terrified again. And it's it instantly shifts. Yeah, we, we cross over from this brightly colored crazy thing, we spin around and then we've got the wolf uh, sitting in this landscape that's just a skull basically and staring at him. It's just like, yeah, back over to fucking horror again. It's like, damn. Yeah, nice. yeah like, like yeah. actually, like, yeah, like horror, kind of. Yeah, this is essentially well, the DreamWorks horror, yes. When Puss is running through the forest, like, when he's, he runs away, it, he just sees, mm -hmm. uh, he sees the wolf and everything. He sees him in the rocks, he sees him in the trees. Uh, and then it's followed by the scene that everybody's talked about, but rightfully so, because it's a yes. really well-made uh, scene, which is the panic, panic attack. attack. What it's, an unfortunate yeah, time for man. Velda to have a panic attack scene at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it was the same time. What an yeah. embarrassing scene that was in Velma. Holy shit. <laughs> Dude, the, yeah, the conversation around it became cringe because of counterculture, which I'm very tired of counterculture as a fucking thing. Just like whenever something's popular, mean? we need to provide an alternative or opposition because mm -hmm. it's time to bank on like the resulting. Uh, I guess I don't even know how to put it. It's like the resulting energy that goes in the opposite direction. I, I saw this happen gradually over Twitter, right? So first happens is people tweet out this scene and say it's really good. And I saw it out of context and I was like, that is really good. That was just like a couple of seconds or whatever. And, and 
Like, I don't even know what's, what happens in this film, but damn. And then it was like, I saw it start getting tweeting alongside the Velma scene. And it was like, one is her horrendously embarrassing and, and just, just terrible, while this one is like helping people out. A lot of people associate with this. Um, mm -hmm. Or just want to appreciate it for how good it is. And then I started seeing people like being like, you know what? We shouldn't actually be normalizing that this is good to see. I don't want to see panic attacks in my fucking movies. And I was well, like, what the hell? Okay. And then well, people were like, I am tired of this scene being spread around as some great moment. There are plenty of movies that cover anxiety. It's like, Listen, what I the don't fuck? mind if people have panic attacks in the privacy of their own homes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And like, I can't oh, attribute right. it to anything other than the fact that they want to just go to they the want opposite. They say the thing that's different to what other people said. Yeah, it's they just cringy. I was just like, like why can't we just say that. it's good? It was yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good depiction of uh, what I expected. Assumed to be a panic. I never had one, so I I don't know. But this seems pretty real. I don't know, like hard well, just, uh, heartbeat uh, going on, like uh, heavy breathing, everything. I don't know. It seems like it's pretty genuine, like a pretty genuine exp uh, showing of a panic attack. Yeah, well, it was like this movie's got a lot of heart, and it's got a lot yeah. of like wanting to convey not just a story and lessons, but like real emotional moments. Well, yeah, because, cause, like, to talk about what's working well, like, look at the color scheme, it's totally muted, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's it's pretty blurry a lot of times as well, it's, like, everything is out of focus because it's just puss, like, struggling to breathe, and then the thing that pulls him out of it is this dog, this wonderful dog, who's just yeah. there, just there, he's just, he just put, rests his head on his, uh, on his, on his tummy, and, like, that's yeah. enough to, tr to ground him, and this is actually, because this is the first time that, uh, Pareto gets called anything. He says, like, thank you, Pareto, yeah, which, so. as I understand, yeah. it means small dog. Yeah, so it's like, much. yeah, because he came through. He came through here. And then they have a pretty significant conversation delving into, like, the fact that Puss is on his last life, something he hadn't told them. And then a big element of his uh, dynamic with Kitty and why she doesn't trust him anymore, that mm -hmm. he left her at the altar. And, like, it's just a thing that he finds shameful. And it's, it's like, further reinforcing sort of... jilted. Well, it's just um, because he talks about, like, I shouldn't be afraid. I wasn't supposed to be afraid, but I was, so I, I ran was, away. Yeah. Which is what happened, right? That's what happened when he was confronted by uh, by Wolf, is he ran and away. I, I... And I feel like the broad way to interpret that, right, is he's running away from life. Like, life got really scary for him. And his response to that was to reject life, in a sense, to go live in this cat sanctuary, just, like, soul-destroying, miserable... Not a very engaging life. I guess it's safe, but it's not particularly uh it's not particularly interesting. Um where and, and so like this is sort of an acknowledgement of that, and that's something he's done before. He's taken like the wrong approach. He's running away from this problem that's confronting him. Well, I can't um, help but see that you understand that's what TLJ was trying to do. It really was. That was Ryan's goal. <laughs> His whole oh, idea was when... that Luke Skywalker the man could no longer live up to the legend of Luke Skywalker, which is what Puss is going through. This is yeah. how to do it properly. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, and one of the big things is we've seen that there are other because it's it's something that uh it's something that he eventually sort of comes to understand about the reason why he may well have left. Maybe it was more than just being afraid. It was like he was so afraid of uh of like making that commitment because it's like was was uh is the legend too big, you know, for is the legend too big for like more than one person to be a part yeah. of it. The like as that, far that, as that's he's like a, would that's be a alone. That's in general like a through line, not only with uh, with Post, but also with, uh, with Kitty. It was like, oh, don't trust anyone, just go solo, you just get screwed over by everyone. Uh, you're yeah. You're more likely to be on the winning side when you just trust yourself, not everyone, anyone else. And it's just where they it's all like kind of have to change around with the experience they're having in this movie. And look what happened to get him here. He did a series of grand adventures that had, you know, plenty of heroics in them, but endings where yeah. he lost a life. Lost a life, lost a life, lost enough that, and then you have this incredibly powerful enemy, incredibly confident enemy, and one that seems just soul in purpose and is chasing him. It, it doesn't. Yes. There's no like. This doesn't feel like we're humiliating Puss in Boots. We're challenging no. him uh, significantly, yeah. and he's not used to that. He usually, like you, you, <laughs> you, you watch something like Shrek Two or the others, or Puss in Boots, the movie, the first one. It's just yeah, he's just he's a fun, larger than life cartoon character type thing where he's just able to dominate. And it's like they went serious for a moment with him, and uh, they mm -hmm. had some points to make.
And I mean, the big thing as well, right? Because this is before it's revealed. Now, I, I, I'm pretty sure a fair few people would have been able to deduce like, oh, he's like death, but for real. Yeah. Um, like that that's who he is. He is the embodiment of death. Uh, but I mean, even before this point, right? It re like, he can't escape him. Like wherever he no. goes, Wolf is there. Because Wolf is there when they go to Jack Horner's uh, factory. He does the thing where he puts the... Uh, he puts the coins on his eyes and points at him, nice and yeah, ominous. Yeah, that's good. He's, he's, yeah, he's always there, and he never goes away, because death never goes away. Like, it's inevitable. It's always coming, no matter what you do. And it's kind of like, this is something that Puss needs to sort of realize, is this isn't going mm. away. Like, he can't keep running away from <clears> this. At some point, he has to confront it, which, yeah, you've got the scene pulled up now, when they get to the, uh, the Wishing Star. Oh, that fight is so cool. That fight is amazing. <laughs> and that whole scene, the payoff that he gets. Yeah, like the, the fight scenes in this are really, like, they're really good. They're Fantastic. either really funny, or they're just, like, impressive visually, or they're tense. Um, you, yeah. it, They're really good. It, it also yeah. helps a lot that at this point, I was fully prepared for Puss just straight up to die here at some point. After, like, it was a kind of, of yeah. <laughs> this, yeah. This like, I don't know. I don't know if it's on the table. I don't know if Puss is gonna get out of this alive. I can totally see that happening. Which makes this the come... fight scene like this is so much more tense. It's like, oh man, there's like stakes here. We have like actual stakes. I, uh, I was um, gonna say, as people have mentioned as well, that the uh, death gets through the barrier where everyone else would get zapped by it. Um, right. With these, and he doesn't show up on the map as well where everyone else does. Yeah. Oh man, I love because like That's he because basically like he confronts Puss before this and says like yeah I'm death straight up <laughs> and then he's up, uh, yeah. Puss runs away like he sort of runs away and abandons uh Perito and uh and Kitty which obviously Kitty's not happy about because she she thought that they were forging over the course of the film they're like reconnecting look at that fucking uh, look at death in the background yeah. there holy shit. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, yeah. that's, that's what this scene is. Is he knows they're there, but he's just like, I gotta get those lives. I gotta, I gotta get, get those fucking there. lives. Get yeah, and then of course, yeah, Kitty's like, I thought we were reconnecting. I thought I could trust you again, but I can't. I'm not big enough. Like the legend's too big for me. Yeah, and it's it's true, right? He's very self absorbed at this point. He's focused entirely on himself. Uh, it's not like unreasonable, right? Like this is a terrifying situation, but like that's what's happening here. Yes. Um, but then, like, he's, as before he can make the wish, that's when Wolf shows up again. And it's just like, yeah, this has been fun, but, like, it's over, all right? Let's, yeah, let's fight. Now. And it's like, are you going to run or are you going to fight? And then tosses him his sword, and he's just like, pick it up. Like, come on, pick it up. He's just ready for a fight. He's, uh, he's rearing to go. But then that's when we get the reincorporation or the payoff for the, the lives. Is when his lives start flashing before his eyes, it's just the one that he's been living, going on this adventure, connecting again with Kitty, becoming friends with Pareto, doing all of these cool and exciting things. And it's that, like, the realization of how valuable this life is that, that, that makes him realize, like, that he has to fight, and that he's done running. And it's like, ooh, damn. Like, it's really cool. You gotta show it. You gotta show You gotta show the scene. I don't yeah. even want to try and, like, emulate the performance there. It's too good. The line delivery is perfect. <laughs> Darn good. Um, Darn good. And from... it's so cool, because he picks up his, from, from Antonio Banderas. Well, and also the Wolf as well. <laughs> every line, every single line that he has. Yeah, he's great, great in, throughout. But the thing is, everyone, even Jack Horner, just, like, I love the delivery of his lines, all of them as well. Yeah. Pretty much everybody's line delivery is, is great. Like, there's no bad performances here. Yeah, and there's a huge range of what you get. You know, you get Antonio Banderas, who himself does really everything. He tells jokes. He Is he... Did he sing? Is he the singer? I'm pretty did, sure he's the I singer. Think, I checked yeah. uh, uh, something. Some articles talked about it. Uh, he, he does, like, he could be afraid. <clears throat> he could be happy and jovial. You have, you know, the Jack Horner character. You have, you know, death and... There's a huge just variety of different voices to appreciate. It's like the visuals, just the uh, just the different kinds of characters and voices and the way they sound is is it's just like the visuals are. There's all sorts of stuff going on. The movie does not rest on one kind of tone for um you know for itself. It does a lot. It's fucking Wolf, yeah. man. People are gonna want him to come yeah. back in the other movies, where whatever <laughs> universe they've got, just to just to be intimidating again. Yeah, he's amazing. And in the this fight, is, yeah, I like this... that. Uh, 
like one of the things it saves when he loses his sword it's the it's the little cat blade that uh kitty gave him right yeah that he yep. wouldn't have had if, if he didn't if he wasn't connected with her and then starts dual wheeling and he still gets hurt in the fight too which is yeah. which is good like it's not an easy fight this is a pretty this is a pretty difficult fight but um then yeah. like he slowly but surely manages to prevail and then yeah. you get the 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 big old where he like grabs a sickle and then throws it to death and tells him to pick it up yeah, yeah. it's like oh, that's uh that's pretty chad and then you've got like the ultra giga chad move where wolf gets right up in his face and uh <clears throat> puss doesn't flinch at all just yeah. stares him right back in the eyes yeah because before this, about... he, he okay. says uh, it's like oh yeah i i know i have no chance of beating you because well you death but yeah uh, i will never stop fighting for this life and then the mm -hmm. scene happens when he looks at him and he's like, "Ah, oh, god damn it, now you're ruining for yeah. me. Well, yeah, yeah he, didn't, he didn't want this. He wanted to destroy the, the legend. The legend. He the can't cocky, now. Because, the the yeah. cocky puss in boots who hasn't appreciated any of the lives he lost. Because I don't think we didn't go into the deaths we see uh, in the beginning that he has. Like, some of them are, like, super dumb. Some of them are so reckless, like, just eating shellfish, which he's allergic yeah, to. Yeah, like, oh, it's like, eh, whatever. shellfish in here? It's like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> oh, okay. And they just eat I'm them. telling you. Or, Cat always lands on his feet. Watch. Yeah, just falls off a tower, tower, completely drunk. Yeah. Look uh, at him. And this is the whole reason why death is even after him. It's like, yeah, you. Most people only have one life, and you didn't, you didn't appreciate any of the ones you lost so far. So I'm gonna take this last one myself because you don't deserve it. And yeah, now that he has poses arc is completed, he just looks it in the eyes. It's like, ah, oh, damn, the legend is gone. He changed. He he really does value this one life now. And then he, he tells him, well, live your life, puss. But remember, you, you do know we will see each other again, right? That's his, that's his exit. Yeah, I believe that, uh, that puss says yes until death in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's kind of that acknowledgement of the reality, right? There's no defeating death, but, you know, you can keep him at bay. Just He's fighting. He'll fight him. Well, I mean, what again, keeps death at bay? Again. Living, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like living and embracing life, accepting life for what it is, and fighting. It's it's a really great it's a great arc that Puss gets set on in this film. <laughs> yes, it's yeah. really really strong. The this, the the scene, uh, in the beginning when you see Death and Puss's eyes, and then yeah, the, there at the end it's the, the other way around. You can see Death that's and right. And, oh, you can and, see Puss and Death's uh, eyes. Yeah, that's, that's the, the yeah that's yeah. ruined. I just got lost. <laughs> it's just yeah, it's a really great payoff. And it's, yeah, he basically, what happens with every character in this film is that this journey that they go on essentially fulfills their wish anyway, to where they don't even need it. Yeah, everyone uh, is like, oh, I don't want the wish. No, me neither. Cause, yeah, because with Goldilocks, what happens is, like, uh, the family gets there and they're fighting over it, but then Baby Bear is about to get launched into the crazy outside part of the star where, like, you get vaporized, and then uh, Goldilocks, Goldilocks basically <laughs> drops the wish to uh, to save him. Right, because that's her family, and then she, you know, that's something that she comes was, to fully appreciate. You know the yeah. the grow big and shrink uh, items that yeah. uh, Horner has. Yeah, that's yeah. from uh, Alice, Alice in Wonderland. 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 Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Because I, I love that line. I was worried for a second I'd come out <laughs> naked. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh... But my clothes grew too. Cool. Cool. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Uh, um, it was funny. Um, one of the bakers survives, and uh, when that happened, when me and Rags watched it, I was like, "Why have they kept one of the bakers alive? What's <laughs> going to be the point of that? Like storytelling value? What is the use of having one baker?" And it, it becomes obvious that the, that baker is sacrificed to show the power of the barrier and how you don't want to yeah. fall into the barrier. Yeah, boss, I need help. Dearly noted, but I'm a bit <laughs> busy right now. <laughs> Such a prick. Yeah. Or remember when the. Uh, uh, the the younger bear is like, I'm gonna wear your clothes. And he goes, that was weird. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Bless <laughs> him. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Everyone really likes Jack Horner, and it's just like, there's yeah. nothing complex about him. He's just a fucking no, just classic a prick. evil prick. Yeah. He really is. He's just an evil bastard. Yeah. The way he when he finally gets defeated, like his last line his lines are so great. Oh yeah. What did what I, I do, do to deserve this? this? Everyone looks like it's like, I mean what specifically? <laughs> <laughs> and then he does the thumbs down to seven end to Which down. felt so suitable. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just such an asshole and he's dead now. <laughs> like that's as simple as it is. Yeah. <laughs> 
What did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve this? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, what um, specific You way? should all see this movie. Yeah. This one, everyone. talk about a just a... Like, I, I wouldn't have been... If it turned out to be, like, good, you know, I'd be like, oh, I guess I'm not surprised it's a good movie. But, like, it's phenomenally good. It's really good. It's one of the, my favorite movies that I've seen in a while. Um, it just kind of, like, shocked me with how good it was. Oh, it comes as a um, huge surprise. I didn't expect it to be as good as it was. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, this... I didn't know what I was in for when I was... Because I was like, oh, I need to start The Forges this year. It's like, oh, what's coming? I mean, there's nothing really coming out in the beginning of the year. It's like, oh, wait, there's, like, these animated movies I can check out because animation is cool. And then I watched this one. It's like, holy shit, this is really great. <laughs> like, what is going on? It has, um, it has so much going on. There's so many moving parts. And they're not, like, complex. But there's so many characters who are all distinctly different, who are learning their own things and have their own personalities and they're trying to do their own stuff. Um, and it's, it's not a long movie. It's just jam-packed full of great stuff. It's funny. Mm -hmm. It's emotional. It's, you know, it's deep. It's, um, just... Uh, it's just a joy to watch and to listen to. Yeah. It's just also nice to see like a movie that's not two, two and a half hours long. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> then you just have one that's 90 minutes. It's dense, it's packed, it's good. And it's like, yes, that's, I don't know. It's like some of my favorite kind of movie content that's not super long. I mean, if it's super long, but it's great, like I'm cool. But when you see like a mediocre movie and it's like, oh yeah, okay. I don't really care about this part. It's like, oh, this was kind of good. And at the end, you go like, yeah, it was fine. But this is like 90 minutes, boom, boom, boom. Keeps you on your toes, keeps you engaged, has a lot of stuff going on. It's like, yeah, I, I want more like this. Fits, fits good. Fits good. So, yeah, it's, this is a we recommend. Peak, this is peak cinema. This That's is what a movie cinema, can accomplish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I really, really like it. Um, we it's would. Exactly there's obviously like there are way more getting. things to talk about, but it's just that we're not yes. yeah. we're not doing a full breakdown today. You can check out the, hey, the Forge with uh, Metal yeah, Meme and I. Yeah, we Meme talking about it. Meme Fringy and I. We did a Fortune two weeks ago. Uh, go check that out if you jump in. Want a, a longer discussion of it? It was quite fun. It's a good Forge. Go watch yeah, it. Yeah, and the TLDR obviously of that one is just great. Go watch it, please. Yeah, absolutely. Reward films like this. They deserve show, the show them we want the more of this. Well, I mean, hopefully it's clear that there's a reason why people are talking about it so much and referencing it everywhere. Yeah. And this is what I'm referring to when I say, like, who's talking about Avatar? And I'm saying it's yeah. like, no one's talking about Avatar in the way people are talking about Puss in Boots. People, people are, are like, did you see Avatar? Yeah. It was yeah. By the way, guys, just on the Oscars subject, Avatar yeah. The Way of Water is nominated for Best Picture. Um, obviously, Puss in Boots because it's like an animated best film. Like best P I T C H E R. Yes, the best picture, the top, the top, the big award, the the he one they do yes. right. I know he said yes. <laughs> Wait, Fringy, hey. best pit P I T C H E R. Oh, picture. Yeah. Yeah, like a pitcher of milk. I was gonna, I was going with a pitcher of water, but also that, yeah. <laughs> right, you could fill it. You could fill it with whatever you want. Sure. All right. Well, what I was saying was, it's up for the best picture, All not right. picture. All right. Don't, yep. don't, don't fuck with me like that. I don't like it. <laughs> Too I was, late. I wasn't. I wasn't. <laughs> he spelled it out pretty then. slowly and deliberately. I literally <laughs> spelled it out to you. I wasn't. I was. I wasn't. Sorry. I was too. It's uh, fine. It's just fine. Rags forgives you. Okay. The point oh, to get being. Back on, Get yeah. back on the subject. Avatar The Way of Water is nominated for Best Picture. Puss in Boots, being an animated film, was obviously exempt. Because yes, only three allowed. animated films have ever been nominated, ever. And even even then, the two of them that did get nominated, it's like, wow, those two? Really? Like, over a bunch of other ones? Because it's Beauty and the Beast, Up, and Toy Story 3. The latter two are not my favorite Pixar films. Wally was never nominated, nor Ratatouille or Incredibles or Monsters Inc. Fuck or... off. They yeah. all got they all got nominated for best animated film, but um not but but again and Puss in Boots, you know, no nominations in any other categories either, right? Like score or uh I g I, I don't know if you'd call it visual effects if it's if, if we're talking like 3D animation. I don't know if that's just yeah, like totally exactly exactly how that's mm -hmm. done. It's just they they get the they get the nominated one, 
for the animated uh but yeah it's the, the the point by the way is that i think that this film is one of the best films of the year <laughs> like i think i think it should have been nominated for best picture yeah yeah no i agree with that and uh it's Good. it's to me it's expected but unfortunate that avatar 2 is in best picture it just it's like an automatic gets in i guess yeah yeah James cameron um because the first avatar got nominated for best picture too it's like nah <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. we should probably say for the EFAP continuity, it's like, do you have any breakdowns of e uh, of, of Avatar? Well, there is a Metal's Forge on it, where all yeah. of us guest star, uh, technically, mm. anyway. And... <laughs> You're phoning in is probably one of my favorite <laughs> Forge things that happened yet. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we were not fans of that movie at all to the point where I was I was like bored by the idea of breaking it down. I was like, ugh. I act, yeah, I dislike Avatar too. I'm not even apathetic to it. Um, well, that's the thing. I dislike a lot of it. I am apathetic to a lot of it. A lot of it, I was just like falling asleep. Um, which you know. <laughs> Meanwhile, this movie, you like watch half of this film, and you're like, fuck me, we've gone through so much stuff. Yep. Can't wait to talk about it all sort of sort of situation. Um but yeah, it feels weird to have done like a uh there's, there's just so many movies that came out recently that I actually saw. It feels weird and it's like, well, maybe we can yeah. try and rush through cuz I'm basically trying to find a way of now segueing into the next one cuz uh, speaking of animated films yes. that Yes. That, well, it's kind of neat right in the last few months. Cuz if we have three main movie topics for this this episode, maybe more, who knows. Um it's kind of cool that you have, uh, like you know, two D, three D animation style, and then live action, and then stop motion, which that covers a large amount of all of film, right? <laughs> In terms of it options. Uh, yes, the next one is Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, of which I saw, what, like twelve hours ago or something? Yeah, it's like pretty I just recent. Watched it yesterday. Oh wait, I did. That's <laughs> <laughs> whatever that was. Um, well, yeah, what does everyone think of this one? This is a very interesting movie. It's, it's, it's an odd one. This one's definitely an odd movie. There's, uh, in terms of, like, kind of its pacing and a lot of the imagery and just its, just the way that it looks and feels and sounds, it's, it's an odd movie. And I don't mean that in a good or uh, bad way, necessarily. I'm just saying this is an unusual film. Well, I think... Uh, should just be said straight away. The uh, the stop motion is incredible. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's where I was gonna start. Well, I was gonna uh, say that right off actually, the bat. It's kind of funny because I when I was taking notes for uh, the Forge edit yesterday, go watch it. Is because uh, I I couldn't tell if this was actual stop motion or animated stop motion. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, it looks so good and detailed, to, and to, to the so point. much effort is into it. It looks like weird. You have to stop. It's like the first time you play yeah. a game at a hundred FPS. You're like, what the fuck's happening? Like, what, what, what? Yeah. Till 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 we did the forge, uh, <laughs> I was convinced this was animated, but just really well made. But uh, during your forge affair, I I learned that no, that's that's actual stop motion. And I was like, holy shit. That's really, really impressive. I'd seen the behind the scenes oh. clip, so I just figured it was stop motion. It's just that they've gotten incredibly fucking good at stop motion at this point. So uh, I guess it might be because I uh, recently rewatched Chicken Run. Yeah, one yeah, of the we did watch master, Chicken Run. One of the one of the stop motion giants, wonderful studio, made a lot of cool movies and short films. And Ardman has their own style, right? Because they're much more a clay... It's claymation, right? Like, that's what they do. Stop motion animated, obviously, but clay... Like, using clay figures. And, yes. like, they have a really cool style, and they got tons of these, like, detailed sets, backgrounds, props, and everything. And, like, you can see the love and, and care and attention to detail and all of those things. And this mm -hmm. film is very much the same. Obviously, it's a different style. But, like, the amount of detail and care that would have been put into designing all of the characters... Designing them, actually building them... All of the sets, the way that some of the things are animated, um, like it is, it is immensely detailed. Like this is one of the best looking stop motion animated films like I've ever seen. It's incredible. It's ever been made, probably. Um, it's yeah, it, like you say, you, you you forget that it's claymation. It just almost it it seems like it's it's well, own the characters thing. have life, right? The whole point of animation is bringing life through the illusion of movement, and and everything here feels alive. There's so much movement. It's so uh. And and I mean it, it's it's a lot of um because it's it's beyond just like the 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 anim I, I don't want to say beyond just the animation's really great um the sets are really cool there's a lot of great framing and cinematography 
um, a lot of interesting techniques that he used because obviously it uses some amount of visual effects. Because uh, like the behind the scenes that's up, up there now, this really cool long take of uh, of the monkey running through this area yeah, where it's got like really so cool. many moving parts all at once and it's yeah, just yeah. one uninterrupted shot. Super impressive. But like you watch the behind the scenes, they've got like lots of green screen little... Uh, you know, like, props and things to hold the characters in place and everything. There's but a green screen like in the CGI. background, but it's seamless. It's seamless, it's, though. It's like, yeah, it's mm. it's how CGI should be used to help tell a story instead of just be the CGI story. for its own sake, you know? Yeah. And so, and there's a lot of cool techniques because there's a part where they use fire, and, like, the fire, it kind of looks like they use... It's, it's, it's digital, clearly, but it, it looks like there are... Um... It, it, it's it's like they're using sandpaper and like cellar cellophane, like the colored cellophane, um, like to sort of make it look like it's a practical fire. Yeah, I think you've got it pulled up. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really cool technique. There's a lot of these really clever like uses of the technology to achieve things that would be like basically like like the water as well, because obviously the water. I've like, always in, found water and fire super interesting in claymation stuff because. Just yeah, to, how, like, how do they do it, you know? It's gonna be stylized so hard, and it's just kind of cool. It's hard enough to do water and, like, with, like, proper CGI. How do you do it what with this? What if, quote, one uninterrupted, un uninterrupted shot stop-motion CGI? So that would have taken, like, probably four or five months. I could believe it took longer yeah. than that. I remember it took a like, long time. I've always found it weird when it's, like, because people... I, I think I saw... I remember I saw a tweet that was talking about how the bad guys had, like, a uninterrupted... Like, the opening of that film has, like, a three-minute-long uninterrupted shot, and, like, some comment was like, yeah, but, like, why would that be impressive if it's, like, animation? Like, that's... Like, the whole thing that makes a one-shot impressive is the coordination in, in live action, like, in real time. It's like... The, so the cool thing about a long take in an animation is there's no way that one guy did the whole thing. No. They had to do, like, really, really coordinated passing it's... over of the work between, and obviously laying yeah. out the area, planning out, like this space that you're going to have characters move through all of the moving parts like it's 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 difficult in a different way and it's super yeah, impressive it's difficult in, exactly it's diff it's difficult in a different way um but both should be appreciated um, that's every shot in animation though i so, so like having having one shot last for like three or four minutes and and it's seeming totally seamless rather than if you know like an animator is working on one shot that's going to cut to the next shot it's just like a level of coordination that's required in terms of planning that out, especially considering it's not in a real tangible space. You need to plan that out in a digital space. And you can't be doing any like insane, crazy like changes in uh like between shots, because there are no changes in the shots. Like it's it's challenging. That's why that's why whenever an animated film does like a long, uninterrupted uh like shot, it's really, really cool. Cause the amount of work that would have had to go into that is just nuts. And in this case, you see it in the behind the scenes. It's like you, the amount of planning you would need to do to make sure that you get that right and that you need to be getting it right with each shot that you're taking. Because, you know, like when you do an animation, you got to plan this out. Like you got to plan everything out. <laughs> um, it's really impressive <clears throat> is the point that's being made. Like this whole film looks fantastic, like yeah. all the time. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I was trying to think of if, if we should just uh sort of say say that that is the the way it looks portion of our praise is just it's it's like a hundred percent yeah it's yes. it's really good what you're watching on screen doesn't do it justice <laughs> like no. getting a good you know it, it's just you to, you gotta see it it's weird like Volpe, in a good way that, like it's uh, i don't so i'm just gonna push you can say it's weird i just think it's awesome i'm not gonna put oh, it is but but it is like i think weird. it is weird i think that it's so of such good quality and so not what you typically get in terms of its style and how it's done that i think i do think it's weird in a good way i don't think you're gonna get something like this anywhere else um like this just seems to go above and beyond any other claymation thing that i've seen to where it almost feels like it's its own just kind of style um I mean, this is a film that if you put it next to, like, you know, Wallace and Gromit, Curse of the Were Rabbit, it's like, you can understand the differences in what can be achieved in the same medium with, uh, with stop-motion animation. Yeah, it's like, it's like CGI um, can be in a whole variety of styles, whether it's, you know, whether it's Puss in Boots or Arcane or anything like that, you know, um, and Claymation, as this, you know, as this movie, you know, this movie proves a lot of ways to do that, just Claymation, um, 
just oh, yeah, of course like these impressive. are these and and yeah the behind the scenes stuff really like illuminates the the kinds of things that you wouldn't think about like the fact that you need to create different sized versions of sebastian J. cricket and pinocchio like to make sure to get the scale right if you need close-ups with sebastian versus uh long shot or not like you know ones where he's much smaller and it's like those sorts of considerations of scaling and, and everything um that no, you're not going to notice right because it's so seamless like it's it's just it's it's uh you, you don't notice the techniques that are being used because they're so they're so well executed um it's it, like on a technical level it's incredible like what they've made here is phenomenal visually yeah and it's always just stop mo has just always had a uh i i think kind of an um, uphill battle for appreciation as well mm. it has it has because the highest grossing anim uh stop motion animated film is chicken run uh, and that made about 250 million, something like that, which uh, is a lot less than the most successful 3D animated and 2D animated films as well. Stop motion has always been more niche for whatever reason. I don't remember if I've ever seen Chicken Run. I don't Damn. remember. I might <laughs> no, have, it is, but it was, it's, it's from 2000. A... I might just don't remember it. <laughs> Maybe. It's definitely yeah. worth a uh, definitely worth Absolutely. a watch. Yeah. Well, Ardman, Ardman makes good. I, I, uh, I, I, I'm still undecided on whether my favorite is Chicken Run or Curse of the Wire Rabbit. Um, I just really like Wallace and Gromit a hell of a lot. Uh, so that might, I'm, I'm not sure. You said favorite uh, also, Ardman, right? Favorite Ardman, yes. Uh, I, I, and in terms of like favorite stop motion animated film, it probably would be like if it, it was going to be probably like Wallace and Gromit, or it would be between those two, probably. But I haven't seen Coraline yet, so I uh, I want to. We should rewatch that. I really would like to see it again because yeah. I, I have not very much enjoyed it. I haven't it. seen it yet, so I got to see it the um, first time. Well, yeah, that works too. <laughs> but I, I guess, right. uh, well, I mean, but uh, I guess now would be the part where it's like, well, so we've talked about obviously the technical aspects. What everybody think of the story? I thought it was really good. There's just a couple of things that I was thrown off by. Uh. And, and, you know, to be honest with you, there's just a couple of normal, like, things I would complain about in Eddie's story. I feel like the the biggest one probably is uh, the bomb that lands on them, and it blows Pinocchio out onto a stone with the, uh, I guess, other, or main antagonist of the movie is Volpe, waiting for him. Volpe. Yeah, he's just, he just kind of we, went there. I and then he sets up it. killing him there. It's it just it's it's very uh to me came across as like we gotta get this scene done now. Uh we can't quite fit it in, so I don't know, a bomb, and then he flings over to where he is. It's just like, okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um But I, I would still say there's plenty to appreciate in terms of cause and effect, especially for the characters. Uh and I was I, I'd have to say I feel like it was really pulled together by the end. I was I was quite moved. Yeah, yeah, the ending was. I love like, the ending. Yeah, I felt a little unsure on a number of parts along the way, but man, that ending was just like oof. I was that hit me really, really. Oh yeah, absolutely. The, the ending just had me. Uh, I was a mess. I was a. I was a wreck. <laughs> well, I mean, especially I was a wreck. considering we just talked about Puss in Boots, this this one has a lot to say about death as well. Death, death yes. and life and the meaning of life. Because uh, this Jiminy is another Cricket. film where like. Well, Sebat, yeah. <laughs> I really love Sebastian J. Cricket. Uh, Ewan McGregor, <laughs> he's great. The, awesome. char the character design is awesome. He's his voice is great. I really like gosh. him. Great. Um, I think but a lot I mean, of the designs terms... aesthetically are just very. Um... Yeah, I love the look of Pinocchio. I, I love the look. Of yeah, Pinocchio. the blue it's fairy. Of oh, Pinocchio. it was on the screen. Yeah, the, and in the terms blue of Pinocchio, fairy it's... and the death chimera. Oh, the Pinocchio and... uh, yeah, the... feels. Very deliberate. Oh, the the yeah, the the wood sprite and the uh this and the right, death yeah. chimera were cool. Yeah, it's two Just sides of the same. Really, point. really odd. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's like this this mixture of fantasy and also like a biblical representation of an angel with all the eyes. That's the uh, eyes and the wings. It's crazy. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's very almost like classic fairy tale in a way it kind of gives that vibe of like yeah oh, this people... feels like a fairy tale you know oh yeah like, people it, are gonna fucking die people are yeah there's some you know bad shit might happen as part of the it's, it's almost well, <clears throat> dark at times i was gonna say i think if, if anyone's familiar with guillermo del toro's work it's it's funny how reserved and restrained this is compared to a lot of his stuff like um 
having the kid die and then like the the uh again i just want to say david bradley man what a legend he keeps putting in so many fantastic performances like um i love seeing him show up in anything it was really funny he yeah. showed up in um uh will's end right he was like he was just yes I told you not to ask me that. <laughs> it's like that guy is fucking let. And then of course, hot fuzz with his uh, bullshit Let's way of talking. Man, yeah, but, um, I'm, I'm ready to go for the trilogy again. It's been like a, one and a half years. Like, I think it's, I did it. It's just a need that in my life sometimes. Um, the whole we got, trilogy. Like, it's just oh, it's just, of Walter Frey and we then, got Ron um, Perlman <clears throat> he knocking ended up out of the park here. I'm not done with David yeah. Bradley. Fuck you. <laughs> He's um, hey, Blanchett making he, those monkey noises. <laughs> I was gonna do that joke. I didn't know if they knew. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the uh, yeah, he plays uh, the first Doctor as well, Master. David Bradley. Um, He's he's just oh, he keeps coming that, out right? with all these things. I'm just like I'm fucking glad you're still going. I really uh, he puts so much passion into this role. I really uh, feel like the sort of ending scenes wouldn't be anywhere near as good if not for his voice acting. Yeah, he was he was he was uh, excellent because uh, Geppetto and and his story that was uh, that was really emotionally like yeah, and it was it was it was because of him. He was uh, he was fantastic <laughs> like in this role. But yeah, um, him constructing Pinocchio and like uh, the Sebastian getting like creeped out by it as well, and, and, and there's aspects mm. of like, um, what exactly are you doing here? Have you gone too far? Sort of like, and, and just I just think it's uh, as, especially with some of the character designs, Guillermo del Toro. I watched the Cabinet of Curiosities recently, which is like I think a passion project of his as well. He's a fucking weird dude, all right. He makes some weird <laughs> shit. Uh, all of it is usually amazing in terms of how it looks, though. Uh, any of you guys seen uh, Pan's Labyrinth? I have no, not. I, I want so, to no. though, but I've it's, never just I've never seen it. Again, a movie that I think people remember more of how everything looked in that necessarily not necessarily compared to the storyline, though I remember it being awesome as well. He, um, it's just cool that he's still getting work done, especially handing him something like Pinocchio, because it's it's the kind of thing where you're just like, yeah, I'd like I'd like to see a Guillermo del Toro uh, Pinocchio, sure. This is a passion project for him. He's wanted to work on it for like 15 years. Um, it shows. He's yeah. really, really inspired to make this. And I mean, we're talking about like character designs. The design for Pinocchio here is super duper unique. Oh yeah. It's like the most, the one that I've, uh, that I'm aware of that like most emphasizes the fact that he is like made of wood, that he was like carved out of a tree. Yeah. That he is yeah. not a real, uh, like he's not a real person, but like that's thematically really relevant. Yeah, because um, you you expect at some point, and even the the movie is kind of hinting at it, it's like, oh, I'm gonna fix you up tomorrow, right? So make you nice and clean, but that never happens. Like, well, and that's that's the point, right? Is it's like, if there's, so this this movie's about life again. Um, yes. And one of the things that it's about in terms of life is that sometimes things don't go according to plan. Sometimes you don't get exactly what you want. Sometimes things get cut off short, or things happen to you that just are terrible. Um, and it's like, well, how do you move forward with that? Like, how do you appreciate again what you have? Because in the case of, um, it's, it, there's a, there's a lot of symbolism that sort of emphasizes that the fact that he was constructing a wooden, of, of like uh, Jesus on the, on the cross, like in the church, but then it gets destroyed, um, when it gets bombed in the, the bombing that kills his son mm -hmm. and it remains unfinished for like the, the next however many years while, uh, Geppetto is absolutely miserable. Um, and then the fact that, like, Pinocchio, right, he puts one ear on, and it feels very deliberate that he has the one ear, and by the end of the film, that ear is lost. That ear, at some point, gets destroyed or lost, at yeah. the point that, uh, Geppetto essentially accepts that Pinocchio is Pinocchio, and not a replacement for his son, um, but his other son, right, who is gonna enrich and fulfill his life. Um, there's obviously the symbolism with the pine cone, the fact that the pine cone grows and then falls, like, representing, you know, life and death. That um, I think uh, Carlo grabs like a pine cone that's not quite perfect, and so yes. Geppetto is like, "Well, yeah, well, we're not going to use that one," as opposed to like, "Well, this this pine cone is good enough, right? This is um, this is this is suitable enough for me. Like, I'm happy with this. Um, it's enough. Th those sorts of things. That's like pretty persistent throughout the story. Um, and I just, in terms of like, I guess tying it back to where it started, I I love that like they have emphasized that Pinocchio was carved out of wood, that he that he's not real. Because by the end of the film, it's about embracing him for what he is, not changing him into somebody else or making him something he's not, which is, um, by the way, that's like a, that's a hyper consistent thing throughout the film with Pinocchio when he goes on all of these adventures and 
sort of uh, interact with other people. It's more so that like Pinocchio, through existing and being himself, teaches other people things about themselves. And a lot of the time it's about a character who's trying to be forced by somebody else into something they're not. So you got it with the monkey essentially being forced into a life that he doesn't enjoy, constantly tormented and ridiculed and treated poorly, um, only to eventually basically find a family with uh, Pinocchio, Geppetto, and uh, and Sebastian. That Sebastian is like, um, oh, or rather that um, the, the son, Candlewick, is basically being forced by his father to become like a soldier and it's not who he wants to be. It's against his nature. <clears throat> you see a lot of examples throughout the film of him sort of mirroring his father's behavior, trying to get his approval, but it's just, it gets to a point where it's like, no, I don't want this. This isn't what I want for my life. Um, there's like a lot of that throughout the film of like trying to force uh, something to be what it's not and and rather accepting a person for who they are. Um, and, and then even just the things of like, life doesn't go according to plan, but that's okay. You can you can find some good in it with like a real a relatively straightforward and not too uh, difficult and confronting one where Sebastian is like, I want to write my memoirs. And then the tree that he sets up to do it in gets cut down and he's immediately put upon this quest to essentially turn Pinocchio into a good boy to guide him into a good person so he can get a wish. And over the course of the story, he gradually becomes more and more involved and invested in um, in uh, the, the story of Pinocchio. Um, to the point that he eventually doesn't even write his memoirs. He writes a story about Pinocchio, and he's okay yes. and happy with it. There's a lot of this sort of stuff throughout the film, and I, I found it, like, really thematically compelling. Well, you know what? Sorry, that was that was a long... <laughs> <laughs> well, no need to interrupt it when it's going that good, you know? Yeah. Uh... I, I actually found it kind of almost, it's weird to say this, I found it almost cute that at the end, when uh, the story is still being described post-Sebastian's death, I was like, mm -hmm. wait, so who wrote that down? Or who's talking and what's, what's the context? For, and then it just cuts to, he's playing cards with the playing cards with <laughs> the, the rabbits. I was like, ah, oh, that's great. <laughs> like, yeah, that's um, cool. I quite liked the the death world. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. And with the, the lady rabbits. that was up there, I found uh, she was one of the characters that I was most interested in for her dialogue. Um, yeah, I was told uh, yeah, no, I, I I pulled up the cast because I was very curious about who was going to be doing what. And yeah, just to just to repeat what Rags mentioned, the, the monkey is apparently voiced by Kate Blanchett, which is <laughs> so funny, infinitely yeah. funny. I don't yeah, care. Like, I, I only looked at this. I only looked at the cast after I watched it. And that just reminded me of how bad I am at realizing what voices are, or recognizing voices rather. It's like, oh wow, it's like Ian McGregor and Kate Blanchett. Okay, you didn't okay. catch Ian McGregor? No, I'm just. Stupid oh, his like voice that. is downright like super specific to me. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, it's, that's what I mean. I'm like super bad if I just hear voices. I just won't notice. It's really dumb. I don't know. That's just a brain thing with me because I'm German. I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is like a stacked cast. It's it's quite incredible. It is, and I well, kind of Christoph Waltz is Count Volpe as well. He was really great. Well, so yeah. is it even worth saying Christoph Waltz is good in something at this point? In everything, like, he's good in everything. He's a <laughs> fucking <laughs> phenomenal actor. He, he just legendary. never pulls in a bad performance. Mm. Much like he Puss got, in like, Boots, he got really everything popular. is good here in terms of voice acting. The characters yeah. sound so distinctly different. The way that they speak is very animated and lively, almost whimsical. It fits mm. with the nature of the the way that the movie looks, and it's kind of it leans into that old school fairy tale kind of element. And the voices just they nail that element. Pinocchio's voice actor absolutely captures child wonder, and like mm -hmm. throughout that, it doesn't drop a beat in terms of just coming across that way. While in a world that's you know, there's not not the nicest things are happening in this world. Uh, no, we're, because we're, we're set we're set in World War Two, right? Like we start in one, and then time passes to two. Is that the? I think that was the idea in the movie. I'm a little confused. I I thought the movie took place in 1926, ten years after uh, the yeah, maybe Carlo maybe dies, that. It, it's but I'm definitely not sure. So Somewhere in that line, if not World War Two, it's the interwar period. Uh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. probably makes yeah. the most sense. Because we have the the tree that, that that grew like all the way, basically. Yeah, so I was like, right. uh, it was definitely like 10, 12 years. Is anyone sure. anyone in chat? Anyone <laughs> seen the the Disney Pinocchio? <laughs> because um, I did check reviews. The first one, yeah. <laughs> and this one, this one's <laughs> getting praise, you know, top to bottom, of course. While the Disney one is getting shouted a little bit. Bad. 
and I'm, I'm curious, it is, it, is it as bad as, like, Cruella and stuff, or is it oh. more normal bad? Well, consider, well, what's weird about Pinocchio is that it seemed to be, what, was it the one that got, like, super panned uh, I don't when think it came out? It didn't get a very positive reception. Which in, like, on the Disney curve is, like, a big that deal. Yeah. Worse than Cruella. Good. I don't believe you. I yeah. don't believe you, actually. No. <laughs> Cruella's quite awful. I don't know, man. How many times do we say it couldn't be worse than X? And then it just is. I don't it's know, man. Cruella, is. though. But Cruella. Yeah, but like, of hope, yeah, okay? Come on. Come on. So, but we're fitting. Are we, like, forgetting stuff? Like, the fact you say Cruella when we're talking about, like, remember Milan? <sighs> things like oh that. Oh, my God. That probably yeah. was worse than Cruella, actually. <laughs> I would say Milan is worse than Cruella. <laughs> Jesus, that happened. They made that movie. Remember the original? Yeah, oh my god. We yeah. watched them back to we back. We did. Go watch we that after it. this stream. Please. <laughs> it's, it's a really great Please. back to back. Whoa, Please think, watch uh, and give us I'm money for that, putting up with that. <laughs> like, Jesus uh, Christ. The Zemeckis Pin Pinocchio is that we are now entering the era. I mean, I guess it kind of started with Lady and the Tramp of like, not only are we doing these remakes, but now we're doing the ones where it's like, yeah, just throw it on Disney Plus. Because I'm pretty sure there's meant to be like a Peter Pan remake that's coming out this year that'll be on Disney mm -hmm. Plus too. And it's like, they probably get less money and probably like less focus. Um, I don't know whether that's what that yields though in terms of the writing though, really, because like again, yeah. Mulan and Cruella were both well, Mulan and Cruella were both supposed to be theatrical releases, and I think they had a partial theatrical release, and I mean they both suck, so you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, and were there like three Pinocchios last year for some reason? There were. There were. Yeah, there's a funny I think one. There was a third one too. Yeah. <laughs> I it's want to see the funny one at some point, but it'll have to be EFAT movies. The the one with that clip where it's like, what, is it just like really hideous voice acting? Like, Father, I want to go out into the world or something. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yeah, the, I, I'll, all that I know of that, you know, of its existence, is the Twitter clips. People saying, guys, guys, <laughs> you have to listen to this. It's the worst thing in the universe. And they were being honest. It, I love, because we've talked about this before, but voice acting can be difficult to nail down exactly with like the metrics for how good or versus bad, but it feels like everyone agrees on the best and worst. There's just not much uh, disagreement in terms of like, you hear that clip, and you're like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, back to the good one. Because uh, I'm curious to see the new Disney one at some point, but I'm in, I'm in no rush. Uh, huh. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you know me. I've got this morbid curiosity. Yeah, I mean, I it just, gives us an I, excuse I to need... watch the original. It does. Yeah. That's true. Really, that's true. Because yeah, we because can't I'm... just watch it. You know, I'm definitely not gonna watch it on my own. <laughs> it's not how it works. Sure. No, no it's always back. <laughs> There's rules. There's <laughs> law. It, I mean, it is a really good format oh, though to watch the new and the old back to back when it's fresh in your memory. You watch the good thing. And now that you have the well, good I, thing like, ready to go in your mind. I wasn't allowed to watch Austin Powers again until we were ready to record watching it. You know, that's how it works. Mm. Spoilers. Goodness. No, I already mentioned it to people. They won't see it for like two oh. years, so. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. They'll forget that you mentioned it here yep. in 2023. Yeah, just, just forget about it. Yeah, that's Don't right, worry, guys. You'll get a whole avalanche of EFAP movies someday. I, I might actually get to the point where I might. But it's not this calendar. You'll have to buy new calendars to mark it. No, the problem is calendars. we've got plenty more that we're set to record, so it, we might have to start culling them a little bit uh, in Ooh. terms of ones that I'll have to say goodbye to. Um, but don't panic because there are plenty don't that have already panic. been created. We're just organizing yeah. when to release them. Um, anyway, uh, what else shall we talk about? What other topics would you like to uh, to address with this film um i will say this i loved the songs yeah i really liked it I? I thought the songs were excellently done you know i think that the singers were really good in particular pinocchio's singer uh incredibly talented do you want know to remind me of for musically uh lion king no Ooh, let me think what well, lion king. you're saying <laughs> what this movie reminds you of music, uh, like what? Yeah, music... and I'm still trying to figure out why. So that gives you a clue as to it not um, necessarily being conventional or as an answer. Uh, Lord of the Rings. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Okay. Um, um Sweeney Todd. Uh, oh. oh okay. And I think it's just because of I how how casually they'll start entering into a song, and mm -hmm. 
it's. I say this as if this isn't convention. Songs have gone too long. Yeah, they, they 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 short and sweet a lot of them. So I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Um, we need to. Jesus. I see I, what you mean. That was a long time ago. When did that come out? Like 2010, 2008? I want to say seven. No. I'm not sure though. I've seen I'm it pretty... in the cinema, cinema randomly. I like that movie. I um, like it too. I'm pretty apathetic when it comes to musicals, but I really like Sweeney Todd. 2007, Tone. yeah. I like it. Yeah. Sorry, we're talking about Pinocchio. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, my bad. Uh, yeah. Uh, the yeah, the songs they they sort of peppered throughout. They I think they they leave well before they're unwelcome. You know, like uh, yeah, they're nice and short, and they're pretty pretty neat. Um. Yeah, they don't overstay their welcome. They're they're short. They're done really well. They're distinct from one another. The singing is done excellently. Makes me curious if it's, the uh, singing is done by the original actors, because you never know for sure. They can get like impressionists. I remember that's how it worked for a lot of Disney films: is that they would get uh, people who sound like them but can sing. You know, because yeah, because you can voice it, act like, doesn't mean you can sing. You know. Yeah, okay, Simba's man, voice actor had know. one. Milan's voice actress, she had one. Um, but they don't do that now with the remakes, and it seems like the results are really <laughs> mixed. <laughs> yeah. um, well, wasn't that the point with um, The Lion King? They hired a singer? They hired, they hired a, a singer, singer not an actor, yes. Yeah. And yet it sounds worse on both counts because of how they mixed <laughs> it and how they directed him. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, it's because... um. And it, I know that the one of them was because uh, Emma Watson as Belle. I don't know if like she's a singer, but like you can hear some of that auto tune. You same with Will Smith, like you can hear uh, you can hear some of that auto tune in a lot of his songs as well. It's like oh damn! It's like guys, it doesn't have to be like mechanically sterily perfect. Like you know uh, when you go back and you listen to especially like early The Who and the Beatles and stuff like that. There's a there's an imperfection to the singing that's really nice well, it's kind of like it's, when you uh, watch it's, it's like claymation right well i've like the, the the little touches of oh if somebody's hand probably brushed that out of the way but like that's charming you know yeah exactly of, yeah it's um i think what i would there's... say is that um when it comes to musicals something i've been thinking about more and more about the ones i like versus the ones that i don't like is the feeling that the songs aren't so divorced from uh from the story what's happening like, yeah. it feels like the emotion is really coming through rather than Rather than necessarily giving the absolute best performance of the song possible, it's like the best performance of the song in the context of the emotions the characters will be feeling at the time. Um, whereas, yes, yeah, I think like maybe you shouldn't character. always sing like you are like this this android that perfectly hits every single note, and like there's it's like a lot of instruments where like you can play the song perfectly note by note, but it could still sound sound lifeless and mechanical yeah. and just devoid example, of any uh, character. Why I'm messing the Lion King, right? I just can't wait to be king. The the roar, the difference between the way that the they, they do the roar in the original. It's like the one in the original is kind of rough and, and it sounds like a kid who's actually kind of trying to do a roar. Whereas like the mm. new one like is a like, lion oh, you, trying you don't to do hurt. a roar. Yeah, well well, but a human, you know, obviously saying roar. Whereas in the the new one it's like you didn't want to hurt your vocal cords too much, did you? Like you didn't want to you didn't want to sound too like awkward, did you? So like instead you have this really <laughs> flat delivery. Um but I, I I'd say it's direction fault more than anything. Director should be like, um, yeah, try it again, but just like you don't need to hit the note like totally perfect. You can just sort of do a you can just uh yell and it's okay. But I guess it would be it's um it's like uh I remember I, I showed Mola, I showed him back to back of like Beauty and the Beast, the song, you know, the song Bell, the one where it's her going through the town. And he's like, oh yeah, she's weird. And then you compare like the contrast between the original versus the new one. It's like, oh, jeez, <laughs> like you just lose so much, so much of was lost. Oh, there could be a deep study so on the production of all of these originals versus remakes. It's sad. I'm pretty sure it's there are. Sad. There were some videos. There's some videos talking about the difference musically as well. Um, because I think it was a video that I watched that made me aware of that uh, that comparison for Beauty and the Beast, where I think the guy was talking about how you can hear the the uh, the actress for Belle in the original. It's almost like you can hear her smiling as she's singing compared to in the remake, where it's I, I can't remember. It was definitely in a video that I saw. Maybe someone in chat will be familiar with it. Um, that kind of breaks down like these things that get lost in translation 
Yeah. And obviously YMS's Lion King is like very dives deep into the music and yeah, changes was, that were made. Go watch that video, it's super interesting. Sideways, that's good. the guy. Yeah. yeah, that was the video on um Beauty and the Beast and what, was mentioned, what went wrong. By the way, which I think it's just so neat, like Antonio presumably, like I said, I can't say for sure, but I'm pretty sure he did the singing, but also the Spanish translation is like, that's such a cool yeah. benefit to have. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Emma Watson was just god-awful. I haven't seen that film yet, uh, but... I, I, I haven't talk, either. Though. I showed you, and you could you you heard it, Mola. No, I know, but I mean, <laughs> I'm assuming they're saying god-awful as, as a whole, right? But I, I don't know how right, acting holds up. I don't I don't know what she is like as an actress. I'm just not Well, I watched the Harry Potter films, films, but I don't feel like that's between Godfrey and Levio Yeah, I don't I don't, I don't know any I don't know, know what I really really conclude from Potter having film. seen her in all of those. I need to see her in something else, I think. And that would be a Well, start. I mean they're, they're from a long time ago, right? So it'd be more relevant. Wasn't Little Women she was in that, right? And that I didn't film see people that. say it's good. Well, I haven't seen it either, so yeah, maybe that's Stop like it, the Ron. Stop it. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even her acting. Well, yeah, well, it'll be that'll be an easy, you know, classic and remake sort of thing to do. It'll be great. Um, yeah, J I've seen Jay Longbow's video on uh, Beauty and the Beast as well. We'll probably drag her kicking and screaming into an ethat recording <laughs> for that. You're we had it for the Mulan movie. one, and have Ooh. we been dragging it to all the Disney ones? I think we did, right? Uh, the Dalmatians and Cruella we had her as well. We did Dalmatians. Oh, she yeah. must hate but... us. We, we we dragged her in for the Austin <laughs> no, Powers no, fuck one, her. though. She makes us watch porn. <laughs> <laughs> People won't know exactly what you mean when you say <laughs> They will. One day they will. She'll release one the day, edits. One day this, the, mis the mystery will be vindicated. Yes. Does the Lion King arc, is it Lion King 1, then 2, Simba's Pride, and then the remake? <laughs> well, you forgot exactly. one and a half. Wait, uh, wait, what? Sorry, help me out. Lion King one and a half? I, what is that? Do you really not know? Or are you just screwing with me? I'm, I'm legitimately not fucking with you this time. <laughs> Do you not remember that, like, Lion King one and a half? Or is this a, oh, no, I haven't seen this. No? I haven't. Well. No, it, I wasn't aware yeah. of that. Okay, no, I, I didn't go. know about Lion King 1.5. Eric well, DVD but movie Timber. Really? Okay. I didn't even know that. Oh, as well. Wait, Tim, Tim, Timber. <laughs> Tim Mine and Pumba. Timber. <laughs> Timber. Well, there's also, um, isn't there a Lion King like cartoon show? I don't yeah, know anything about like, it other did, than that they it did like that a lot back then. They did that a lot. I'm pretty sure there was a Tarzan show. Uh, let me actually look it up. What's it Tarzan called? Uh, Lion it. King cartoon show. The Lion Guard American Animated Series. It's from... Oh, the first episode was in 2016. So... Final episode was 2019. So, yeah, it was... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's metal. I found your what? brother. Oh, oh no. I found your brother. You okay. didn't tell us <laughs> that you had a brother? <laughs> Um, it looks like you. It looks like you. <laughs> like you shaved. Is that I can <laughs> see it. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, that's, uh, that's uh, that kid from the middle, right? Um, you, you guys have watched that show, The Middle. I've seen Malcolm the in the middle, middle, but not the middle. No, not the middle. The middle. Uh, no. Oh, damn, I'm forgetting her name. Everybody loves Raymond, the uh, wife. What was? The, and it had the uh, it had the janitor from Scrubs. Um. <laughs> Don't know that show. Little Moodle. Sort of very like average family in uh in Indiana. Oh. Like that was kind of the the shtick. He strikes me as the kind of person who talks like this. What is that? <laughs> that accent <laughs> was something. Oh, I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. The important thing is you wanted to have an accent. Film. Um, it's not, an, it's not an accent to him. So, uh, something that I, I don't think I've talked to you about, uh, Fringy, but I'd be curious what your thoughts are on this, that uh, when he's first introduced, it's kind of amazing and creepy and strange. Like, obviously, it's a fucking wooden thing that's come alive. And when he enters the church and starts moving around, you get uh, uh, suitably people like, demon creature, it's, oh, God, what are we doing? Diablo! And then it feels like we sort of, when, when they visit him at, at night, everyone's just gotten over that, and that never comes up ever again. 
Yeah, it it does seem like it's it's been moved past. They just sort of accept that he has a. Uh, I would have thought it would be like better you. to commit from the beginning that a talking wooden creature is just something in this world that they just don't find surprising, instead of selling it as though it is and then just dropping it. I thought that was strange. Yeah, that probably like how Geppetto accepts the talking cricket. I was about to say that's another yeah. thing that they seem weird at at first, but then everyone comes to just be fine with, and it's like okay. I, look, I'd be, I'd, I'd quickly be fine with Sebastian J. Cricket as well if I met him. I'd just be like, "Hey, man, you, you're That's pretty true. cool." It seems really nice. Well, everyone keeps beating him up. Really I thought it was really guy. upsetting when Geppetto stood on him near the beginning. Yeah, I was, I was like, really hey. upset. Yeah, it's like he's yeah, in pain. He, and like, uh, oh. beating. He definitely takes a beating, but he, he a, takes it in stride. I love that he's got a mustache. He's got a little mustache. He does. <laughs> Oh, and as Great. someone he, uh, just said in chat, and this was the same for me, I thought that the idea was going to be that the only person that could hear Sebastian was going to be Pinocchio. Um, but then it gets explicit, I think, halfway onwards that uh, Geppetto was using information thing. provided yeah. by Sebastian. So, um, Yeah, just some stuff like that that I was, again, a little bit thrown from... Or thrown... Yeah, I guess. Um... But generally speaking, it's a very it's, it's a pretty straightforward story. I think um something that I, I mean, what do you think about this as an idea? They separate them out as Geppetto and Sebastian, and then Pinocchio and villains essentially. Um, maybe maybe Sebastian should have been in his in his heart the whole time, so he could stick with him throughout his Pinocchio's adventure, giving advice. I think it suits better with what uh his uh, sort of stated goal was, right? I think um, so too. I don't feel like um. Oddly enough, I don't, it doesn't, and I don't know how I, like, can uh, process this more objectively, but I feel like we didn't get enough really between Geppetto and Pinocchio, or Pinocchio and Cricket. I'm inclined to like agree. I would have liked to see more of their relationship in a happy state. And yeah. so when it's taken away, it, it, it means more the longer they're separated, because... It feels yeah, like Geppetto really was just coming to sort of value Pinocchio. To like him, yeah. And then he decides afterwards, and I can't... It, it's a little difficult, because Pinocchio is just like a, a little twerp, sort of. Like, like, it's the beginning of, like, he needs to start learning his lessons and some things like that, and Geppetto really bonds with him over some things. I find some commonality, and, and that process begins... And then Pinocchio and him are separated. I felt like it happened a little too soon. Um, and of course, with you know Pinocchio and Cricket spending more time together, being able to you know him being you know sort of sort of his guide in a sense, or you know trying to do his best for the you know fairy. Yeah, and you well, got kind of the excuse. Like he, didn't do a great, he didn't do a great job. Like, well, of, you could still have that as a payoff, really even needed. if you were with yeah. him, right? You could give yeah, advice that keeps backfiring, or you could try and get involved yeah, and make things worse. Maybe the cricket thinks he's doing a really bad job, and he keeps trying and trying and trying, but actually, Pinocchio is learning a, a decent amount from him. It just doesn't seem that way in a moment, which would would be a, a neat little part of the film to be like, yeah, you might not think you're doing. You know, really great at the moment, but you know, keep trying but and you know, for, it'll pay off as later. For the, uh, the 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 idea that Geppetto didn't get enough time with Pinocchio, the impression that I got pretty clearly was that he, his life was improving in ways that he didn't fully appreciate yet. And so, like, for them to sort of be happy and then get taken away kind of undercuts the notion that he just didn't value him enough, which was like kind of the problem was that he wasn't even though even though Pinocchio was enriching his life, he just didn't appreciate it yet. Um, and it was only once he was gone, right, that he started to realize that. It kind of ties into the fact that when he reunites with him later, it's only when Pinocchio was dead that he starts saying the things he should have said a long time ago. Like, that he loved him, that he was his son, um, that he appreciated him for who he was. It kind of feels like it ties into a lot of those themes about life, right, of... of um, you know, I, I think it was the final line, right? Like, stuff happens and then, and then like, it's, it's over. Or, ah, uh, damn... I, I'm annoyed that I got gone, that line. Essentially, yeah, yeah, um, that's right. Life happens, then, then it's gone. Um, I, I don't, I, I, think... I feel like Geppetto, like his life seems to be markedly worse because of Pinocchio. He's got the 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 church and all the people are angry um, at him. Well, but the thing uh, is, like, is that Stasi he, are breathing down his, his throat. Pinocchio breaks yeah. all his shit. So the 
the the counter would be that his life before that was like non-existent. He wasn't doing. I anything. guess, yeah. At least he would start Pinocchio, to become functional, sort of. The second um, that Pinocchio uh, comes back, he starts doing things again. Like he he's already his life is improving, and yeah, like stuff is happening that is difficult. But it's like, but it, it's it's at least things are happening. Like at least he's participating in life again. Um. And it's it's just that he needs to sort of appreciate that this is like a new opportunity that he has, and he's just not fully appreciating it. And about by the time that he's starting to get there is when you know Pinocchio leaves. I feel like that was pretty critical, right, in terms of emphasizing that sort of notion that he didn't appreciate what he had. If they were happy and then Pinocchio left, it's like, well, then he's not really learning anything, is he? He already well, learned no, I, it. I, now it's this, I um... completely reject that. That's insane. Yeah. Okay. I'll... <laughs> like, also, I if, think if we that, had a couple okay. of scenes with Pinocchio and Geppetto uh, finally reaching an equilibrium, and he's like, you know what, I'm actually kind of happy you're here, and then he leaves or is taken, that's it, it, you, I could easily argue that's going to have more of a punch. I think it would have had more of a punch for me because I don't, I, I think they were just it, they separated them a bit too early. You needed to show, I think, a bit more of Pinocchio starting to. Because I think Pinocchio kind of adjusts to his existence and his relationship with Geppetto. Geppetto sort of does the same thing, learning how to, you know, sort of raise Pinocchio as not necessarily exactly like Carlo, but... Well, you know, I mean, it's a... worth remembering, right, the reason Pinocchio leaves, he wasn't taken, he left. And the reason why he left was because he felt like he was a burden. Yeah, like we, we, was obviously you can a negative encounter. You can change little pieces however you want. Um, we can keep it so that he leaves to maybe even protect Geppetto's life for whatever reason may come up. If 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 you're gonna uh, alter everything, you um, can still change it all. I, I, I the thing is, that I, when I look at a change like that, it's like I feel like we're starting to deviate a little bit too much from like what they were going for, which is what I appreciated. We can it's still kind of like... maintain it. So, like I said, the scenes I'm looking for are ones that really give Geppetto a strong reason, almost like tangibly, to appreciate Pinocchio, as opposed to what this film does, which is give give, give reason that, that that's there. It's just it's, uh, it's just not as strong compared to a lot of the detriments that Pinocchio brought immediately. And um, I think as well, it does kind of time for me that it would have been smoother had I had more um, settling with this actual possessed piece of wood that's jumping yeah. around and is a human question mark. Like, that's terrifying. Um, and they run with that briefly, but then they drop it. Uh, well, sure, but I guess in terms of, like, the amount of time they have, it's worth noting that I think Pinocchio leaves around about the halfway mark. Like, they're hanging out for a while. Um, that's, that's, well, so what we're highlighting is that a lot of it is a negative experience for Geppetto. Yes, it um, seems to be a vastly negative experience. So and right as it's becoming about positive. The that, but the thing is, is that like there's things that are positive that he doesn't appreciate yet. Like the fact that he's getting back out into the world and participating in life again. Um, like I wouldn't describe that as it, it, it's go it goes un, unnoticed by him. And it's not like I guess what you would say is like an overtly positive thing, but like that is an influence that's already happening. Th just by virtue of the fact that like Pinocchio is now an element in his life that he has to deal with. He's, yeah, I he's think there should be more in the world again. Okay. Because yeah, it makes the impact... I can believe it much more than when Geppetto is compelled to, like, risk life and limb to get Pinocchio back. Do you feel like it wasn't sufficiently... He wasn't sufficiently compelled to go save him by then? Um, I was having a little bit of trouble with it, yeah. Because, like I said, Combo, what I think is a, a relationship that cost Geppetto a lot with the fact that this is not... This is, this is kind of terrifying. It's a supernatural... Uh, sort of event that we're kind of brushing away because we have a story to tell. That there's there's nothing, and like I said, if you'd committed to that from an earlier point, I'd probably be okay with it. But they give us the regular reaction, which is that everyone gets scared and is confused. Um, it's it's crazy um, to me that like characters later in the story, when they first see Pinocchio, have no issue at all. Uh, uh, like how much later are we talking? Because remember, there was a whole thing where like he kind of made a much better impression when he started performing in those shows. Well, my point is that nobody seems to be surprised by a, a puppet that is doing incredibly amazing things. And then if anyone meets him beyond the show, you can have it confirmed this is just a living piece of wood. Yeah. Right. 
everything from like the army to i mean literally benito mussolini the uh, army stuff is what threw me the most i think um as much as i appreciate the idea that he is an unkillable soldier this is crazy man you've got a wooden possessed piece of wood running around with a gun i don't even know what's it's so strange but like i get there's there's points being made there's lots of subtext here but it's uh it's a very uh, the sequence was almost throwing me out a bit it was strange. Um, the idea that we have, um, I forget Ron Perlman character's name, Podesta. <clears throat> yeah. Podesta. It's like, oh, like, you have yeah. this, like, like this, this child brained living piece of wood that eventually, if it's like busted up and killed, it will come back to life. It's the perfect soldier. I'm like, really? You think so? Well, and, and there's no mechanical testing, as much as this sounds really uh, autistic. I, I just feel like, what, how does it work? Can you take his head off and he'll come back? Can you burn him and he'll come back? He can explode, get hit by a car. I guess sort of like normal-ish boy things, like what would happen to a normal boy if he set off a landmine <laughs> or got hit by a car. Remember, he gets sent flying by that bomb, like way more. That would have been way more force than the car. But he's okay. <laughs> Someone yeah, well, it's, uh, so just question then, like, let's say all of his pieces fall into, like, the sea. When he comes back, what what is even happening exactly? Is it, like, all telekinetically, like, reforming? I, I don't know. Yeah, that, no that's idea. a question I asked as well. It's like, what, what happens if you just, well, burn him like Volpe is trying to? Like, what happens then if the timer runs out? You just have, like, sawdust flying around or, like, like... like I don't know, wood dust, and he's in there somehow? Like, yeah, how does that work? That's a good And, you know, it's thing. that mechanic is a big payoff in the film, right? The Right. Uh, and that's a, that's another thing I, I remember me and Rex were talking angst, about it. Yeah. It's, um, the film it's spends around. a while yeah. explaining, like, that mechanic that he can come back, and he's, like, kind of happy about it, but she's trying to sort of imply, or I think explicitly state, it ain't a good thing, man. Like, death is what makes life meaningful, and, you know, you will never truly Final die. Suffering. But yeah, well, yeah, she, she's like, actually, you will die, though, many, many, many times. Like, she says it like, oof, this is going to suck. And then we find out near the sort of the big payoff of the film. Oh, you can circumvent that if you just, you know, just re resurrect essentially quickly. just ask. Yeah. yeah. You essentially just um, ask and the, the, the situation's done and you're just normal. That could be said that each of those first two times he didn't really like each time he's learning more and more about how it works because it's sort of him having to couple it with his own understanding of what mortality is, which he has to learn for the first time himself. I find it's like that each time there's a her, more time. Her initial words are gonna ring much more hollow on a rewatch when you know that there's a loophole that is very easy. Yeah. At any right. point you just essentially ask to <clears throat> not play by those rules and it's done. Because uh, if you were going to have mechanics work this way, I would have thought maybe that the idea then should be that he's he's told, like, you know, you may have died, but you can go back, unlike anyone else. That's that's great. That's amazing. However, if ever you wanted to, you know, you have to wait however long. And if you ever wanted to go back fast, it would mean you could never come back again. Like, uh, setting it up in some way that seems more coherent than you're cursed, unless you do this really easy thing. Like, oh, okay. And uh, she almost um, sells it in the second portion of explaining those mechanics as a bad thing. Like, you'll be a real boy and you won't be able to come back again. It's like, I, didn't... It was more so, I think it was more so that, like, he's going to probably die, like, if he gets brought back because of the situation that he's in. Mm -hmm. But the, I, I think that muddles a little bit with the whole death brings meaning to life. If you can um, kind of choose the rules you play by, in a sense, or it's it's not really making it work so much as just canceling it it's it's it does it's strange it's um it's not clever i suppose that you can just like the the way to to get around this essentially undeath curse is to just say i don't want it anymore you know like i wish there was maybe a more oh well sure but like wouldn't the argument be that like somebody would feel compelled to get around that curse once they've developed a full understanding of like that the value of life is derived from its finite nature that like initially would be like yeah that's pretty cool kind of like what pinocchio says right he's like yeah it's pretty cool i'm not gonna die and that's neat and then like the more that he gets to experience the story he the more that he starts to sort of c c like grapple these concepts to where he would be in a position to make that kind of choice now like, that it's the kind of thing that he has to be able to learn himself, like, it can't be explained to him, he has to live it, and then that puts him in a position where he feels compelled to make the choice. 
Because you even see, right, he kind of struggles with the choice. Like, he uh, he hesitates a couple of times uh, before smashing the hourglass. Well, see, that's, and then it, like, I think, what they sh should have committed to. That the, the It was something of a power that he had and enjoyed, and he has to sacrifice that mm -hmm. in order to save the people he loves who will not live that much longer relative to how long he could live. Like, uh, um, that that sacrifice, quote unquote, is there, but it's weird that the, we're set up as though it's a curse to begin with that he comes back all the time. Yeah, almost like it um, isn't a sacrifice because oh, you want to get to that. Like that's the it was goal set up as to. a curse the second time. Each meeting reveals new things to him about it. Like the first time is just you'll come back. The second time is oh that's pretty cool. It's like um is it? And then the third time is no, I don't want to come back anymore. Like I want to I want to go back. Uh, yeah, and I like I each time it's different. I think throwing them all together is it's confused a little bit. I don't think it's um it's super solid, and it's one of the things that threw me like the. So th this is why, with the opening, um, I kind of agree that like, I I love the film uh, for a lot of reasons. The story, oh, yeah. I am I am fine with. I have lots of things that confuse me slash issues with it, but I also have things I love about it. Yeah, I would say that this story is, I guess it's the weakest part, but that's mostly a testament to how incredible everything else is. Well, what do you um, mean when you say the story is the weakest part? Like, which are you talking about the plot? I think so, yeah. Well, are you talking because, about like, the, the, the what lesson about character, though? Of character? Yeah. Um, I guess I'd have to really think about it, because a lot of this, I feel like I have to put this in the frame of they're trying to tell, like, a fairy tale story. And so there are elements of, like, what we said before in terms of, oh, this is, like, a living puppet. Uh, and, and we get weird reactions to that that seem to be a bit inconsistent. Um, but the characters themselves, like, I liked the characters a lot. I really, I, 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 I'd have to think about it more, um, to, to see, to think about, like, you know, Podesta and Candlewick and, you know, like, just kind of all the that is, happening. The big thing that nudges me in favor of this film is a lot of these just, like, little touches. There are a lot of these moments where you just get a little glimpse of, like, the way that a character reacts in a situation that tells you a lot. There are a few instances when, uh, during the earlier parts when uh, Geppetto and Pinocchio were, like, hanging out, where you'd see, like, a little bit of softness uh, in Geppetto's expression. Like, when he sort of is like, ah, oh, you know what, I actually like Pinocchio. And, and then, like, it gets back to being focused on whatever the task is at hand. There was a part that I remember that was pointed out in the forge where, like, when when uh, Pinocchio shows up in the church, Candlewick, um, Podesta's son, looks at Pinocchio, kind of like, um, sort of, sort of like, interested, like, intrigued about it, like, kind of a little bit in awe. Then he looks up at his dad and then mirrors his expression. It's like all th those sorts of little things, and there are a lot of those throughout the film where it's like it's just sort of reinforcing. It's these little touches that are reinforcing the uh, the core for a lot of these characters in terms of the uh, the arcs that they're going on, um, and the fact that like all of their arcs are so well bound together by the central theme. Well, one of one of a few themes, right? But one of the big ones being like uh, trying to change the nature of something uh, instead of uh, accepting accepting somebody for who they are. Like th there's a lot of that in the film, and I think that it ties together really in a really strong way. Yeah, like um, for people who don't do that, they meet like bad ends you know yeah well it's um, just every time it has negative consequences for the person to, to the point that the person rejects them right like the person that they're trying to change rejects them the monkey rejects volpe and fights back against him candlewick rejects his father and so it's like essentially geppetto gets to learn the lesson but he has the negative thing of like he realizes it too late well, and then yeah, it's, it's only by virtue of uh the film frames yeah. it as if if yeah. um Volpe didn't have his attitude towards the puppet and, 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 you know, his greediness and trying to turn him into something else, then he wouldn't have been essentially driven uh, to do all this stuff and eventually have his life destroyed and then perish mm -hmm. as he did. And with Podesta, it's literally like, well, if I accepted my son, I, that bomb wouldn't have landed on my face. So, um, well, uh... <laughs> it would probably be more so if I accepted my son, this, we wouldn't be here in this situation right now. Well, even yeah, sure, but even in that moment, it's like if I, if my son finally yeah, remember, it was opens because, up, to uh, me in this way. he got stuck right because Candlewick shot him when he was going to shoot Pinocchio. Then he got tangled up, and then that was the thing yeah, that's that made I'm, him trapped. That's what I'm so saying. I oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, if he would, if he if he would have not been aggressive to his son after 
his son said all those things to him and explained why he was behaving this way and how he was actually being brave by talking to, you know, his father this way after all this time, mm-hmm. then he wouldn't have gone through with, you know, all I, that. I guess that's what I'm saying, though, is we've got a lot of these really strong parallels that lead up to, and and they're all, like, different in their own way, and then they lead up to a payoff where it's like, uh, he, he accepts he accepts Pinocchio when it's too late, and then uh, through, like, by virtue of, like, you know, Pinocchio's actions and heroics and um, the what was sort of established with, like, Sebastian and the Wish, it, it essentially enables uh, Geppetto to get what, to, to, like, to be able to actually sort of live the thing that he, uh, that he finally realizes what he wanted, and it was through, like, a acceptance of who Pinocchio was, and then, of course, you've got all the symbolism that, like, supports that. Um, like the fact that the era is gone, he loses that, and now it's just like he is very much just firmly just being this um this wooden toy, rather than even remotely trying to emulate like a real person. But he is you know like a real person in the way that he uh, behaves. Um, and and then like the pine cones as well, right? Like the the pine cone being sort of imperfect, but that's that's kind of it's that's that's got its charm and its value in its own way. It's it's just these sorts of things that like I think really nubs the film. Uh, like th- that work in the film's favor for me. I-, I find that stuff to be quite impressive. Um, like I think that oh, that's yeah, generally absolutely. tricky, and it's something that you only get when you put a lot of planning into your story. Oh yeah, every part of this feels very deliberate. Mm. I get what you mean, though, in terms of like aspects that you think could be uh tweaked. It's just that I wonder how much those uh tweaks are just like flat out changes that like would have some influence on the thematic through lines. Um, I don't think I there's think any changes preferring. that would, that would, um, that would impact the, the thematics that wouldn't be able to be tweaked alongside of it. Um, like I think I, that you, that's, yeah, sure. Um, cause I, I wouldn't want to change, uh, yeah, like the from... way that the themes are, you know, conveyed. Uh, I think it's just like, well, I would, I wouldn't want to change what the themes are. Uh, because I think those are really strong. I just think that the way that the plot sort of makes those things happen and illustrates those could have been done better in a few parts. But sure. um, but I certainly wouldn't want to change anything that is like a substantial change to what it's trying to say. Um, yeah, from so. what I understand, you, you guys just would have liked to have some more time with Geppetto and Pinocchio. After I did actually miss life, Geppetto right? uh, at around the. I did too. I think yeah, the third act point... hit. I was like, man, it's been a while now. Yeah, because yeah, we yeah. were watching. He said, we "Whatever happened to?" Yeah. And I was like, Geppetto. <clears throat> it just feels like he's gone for a big swath of it. Um, in terms of just him not being around, because we're doing the whole circus or, or uh, the 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 carnival circus slash, and Podesta you know, thing. Yeah, like those Podesta thing. And like I said, uh, the uh, Christoph Waltz's character, that getting sort of its conclusion felt so like you had your scene and now we need to figure out where it can go. It didn't look like that. Like, I hate to sound too mean because I think this is a phenomenal film in a lot of ways, but that's a little bit embarrassing how they connect the end of Podesta's plotline with the end of uh, the the monkey and the circus man. Yeah, I agree. Name. That one's great. Yeah, that was really weak. I think we <clears throat> said it yesterday as well. It's like, oh, he's just here now, I guess. That's It's yeah, so weird that where he lands, that's where he is. It's just like, what? Yeah, the, there's plenty of opportunities to have Volpe out of just like the sheer hatred for this puppet following him, trying to track him down and punish him with the vengeance like he was beating uh, Kate Blanchett earlier on. Like, we need to have <laughs> him. Like, there, there's a reason to have these two meet. And yeah. Uh, that that didn't have to rely on like an incredible coincidental thing occurring. I mean, you could have just done the Volpe stuff before he just gets blatantly shot in the face. I guess just have that uh, before yeah. that maybe. Yeah, because it's essentially yeah. sort of put on pause until it gets wrapped up when it could have been yeah. like taken I, I, care of there. Yeah, I didn't expect him to actually come back. Uh, maybe after the monkey. We had this yeah. scene. I kind of expect him to be dead. Really, <laughs> like both of them. Uh, the monkey and Volpe, but then just appear there. So, I'm yeah, more than happy for them to get their own sort of ending, so to speak. It's just that, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. it could have been smoother. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. Suppose that's Pinocchio. Yeah, yeah uh, very, very good. Very glad highly, I saw it. Re- yeah. Absolutely, both of these. Watch mm-hmm. both of these. Um, 
I li- I preferred uh, uh, Puss in Boots myself, but each one of these has an incredible amount of value and artistry and just there's so much to enjoy about both of them that I would highly, highly, highly recommend. Everyone sees them both. Um, it's yeah. always good to get something that has its own style and its own feel. And each one of these, it just feels so distinct. Like it's trying to do its own thing. Um, I mean, you're never going to like Pinocchio. You'll never confuse it with any other movie. No. no. Like I, I would be shocked if it, if you would ever confuse it with anything else. It is so unique and it's, it's so one of a kind and, and it brings so much of value you know, to you as a viewing experience. Highly recommend you um, watch both of these movies, both Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, and uh, Guillermo del Toro's... Uh... Pinocchio, which is how it'll probably be Pinocchio. identified yeah. for the rest of the future as Guillermo del Toro's one. Uh, yeah, well, I, yeah think so. I think his name is in the title. Like, yeah, that's the whole title, Guillermo del Toro's. Uh, mm-hmm. Pinocchio. Uh, yeah, generally, I, 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 I don't I say this to be mean it. whatsoever, but I watched, like I said, Cabinet of Curiosity is one of his newest things. He introduces each of the anthology stories, and man, he is very big, and he's quite old, like, for a person of that size. I'm just like, you motherfucker, get your health in order, because I, I want to see more stuff from you, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, it'd be nice to just be alive, like this movie talks about. Yeah, being alive is pretty yeah. cool. I really like this movie. Def- definitely would recommend it. Yeah. Yeah, and oh, both sure. of... Yeah, it's weird that we get these two wonderfully stylized, wonderfully voice-acted, visually distinct movies that really kind of touch on similar... Uh, yeah, similar... More similar things. messages in yeah. ways. Uh, I, you know, concepts of, you know, mortality and the value of things and their preciousness and, you mm-hmm. know, good moral lessons mixed in. Um we uh, we yeah we, when it comes to the animated department we got we got spoiled with these two these are yeah. great we're yeah eating good. Um, we're eating it's good. funny someone just said it's... just watch Puss in Boots on the recommendation that loved it thank you Efab it's just like oh yeah that that's possible <laughs> that you could have oh, done that you that. fucking watched <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. that. <laughs> that makes sense uh, but yes yeah, like I said as was just said both these movies go watch them folks uh, absolutely yes. mm-hmm. watch them both. Please do. We good. need more movies like this. Reward yes, good art. Oh yeah, I'm very you happy know, to see both of these being celebrated. It's cool. God damn, Heck it's so good yeah. to get these two after watching Avatar 2. Because <laughs> <laughs> Avatar, Avatar 2, 2, 2 like, in my mind, way. it's an animated movie. In my mind, it just, I just, that's what I think of it as. It essentially is. Avatar uh, 2 is now the fourth highest grossing film of all time. Beat out Force damn. Awakens. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is kind of right. funny. Uh, who knows whether it will beat out Titanic, though. I think that's next up, uh, and then it would be Endgame, and then Avatar, Isn't it? so, yeah. So funny people have noticed is that uh, uh, Zoe Saldana is in four of the yeah. f- top five highest grossing movies of all oh, time. Yeah. And then yeah, the, the funny tidbit is that in one of them she's blue, and in one of them she's green. <laughs> that is kind of funny. Too, that is funny. That is actually. And then also, you've great. got that interview where she's I like, "I feel kind of restrained me. by being in big budget like films." It's like, yeah, I might mm. too if I were you. <laughs> I hope yeah, your because... agent knows. You know, <laughs> we could cut you a good deal. I'd have to imagine it's the kind of feeling where you might get that. I'm, I'm you know, maybe not, but like just a bit of the imposter syndrome of like, I'm, I'm in. I'm in that of the the that that, and it's like what the, it's like Endgame where she showed up for. Not very long. Um, well, doing... yeah, it would be the question of how much of this is actually attributable to me versus the IPs mm. that I'm a part well, of. And like, Natiri, oh. like, what do I think of her as a character? It's like, I can only think about her choice to oh, kill one of her own raised yeah. children. Terrible. Like, yeah. Awful <laughs> character. Fuck her. Um, but damn, uh, hey, it made the bucks, I guess. Oh, that sucks. It sucks that that movie is so shit. It's making oh, you know, so well, many billions of dollars. I guess in its own sense, it's probably better that than, like, Multiverse of Madness, you know? I guess. I guess so. um, I just want to appreciate this. I just stumbled across it. This legit, like, made me laugh when I saw it in the film. This clip. Fucking feels. Oh, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's so casually done. It's just like, well, that's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Check off C-mine. I guess you could say that Seagull landed on a mine. Oh, yeah. Of course, of oh, 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 we yeah. did it, everybody. We did it. You're not the first one to tell that joke, Rags. People were doing it in, in Metal's chat. Uh, oh, yesterday. really? I have, 
I, yeah, I haven't seen that, that one because uh, wait. So those well, I don't those know. people in his chat ripped off rags from the future. How the fuck? That is kind of weird. Damn. That they would do that. Yeah, it's kinda also just stealing... rude. Mm. Yeah. Go watch the movie. We did it yesterday. An excellent joke. If you want more info on that movie. Yeah. Yeah, because I haven't seen it yet. Because that was before I saw the movie. So mm -hmm. it was funny. I'm pretty sure it was like right out. Both with Puss in Boots and Pinocchio. I watched them like on the days that your forges were running, and I was like, oh. <laughs> nice. Coinky dinks. Me too. Coinky that is a bit of a coincidence. No. Uh, that'll push us over to a film I was curious to talk about. I don't think it'll be anywhere near as long as the two we just did. Well, no, because two of us haven't watched it. Oh well, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> well, we we've can, seen yeah, it, we Fringy. That's so <laughs> right. We, we can have talk to. About yeah, have a chat about it while I pee. Ew. Yeah, more culture on you too. The menu. Well, I suppose the first thing we should say is, would you recommend it to good old rags and metal, Fringy? I uh, not sure. I don't know. Um, and I don't even know if it would be because I'm not, I'm not sure. I uh, I'm a little bit. I think I'm. I'm not. I'm not decided on the menu. I haven't quite figured out what I think about it. Okay. Oh, I'm getting. I'm getting visuals ready in the form of a trailer. That should do it. Yeah. Oh sure. God. Um. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Ready. I'm. Also, I, I, I was going to say, you... I'll go uh, more strict than you. Uh, no, I wouldn't recommend it to Rags or Fring uh, Sorry, Metal, but not because I don't think it's good. Um, I just don't... I'd, I'd probably rather talk to them about the ideas that are present in the film, and then we'd watch something else. Uh, so. I think um, the, 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 the word I would use to describe it is it's interesting... But whether or not you, I, that means makes it good or bad, like I don't know yet. <laughs> well, yeah. So That's, if we uh... run with a, a basic explanation of the the premise, uh, and I I want to say it this way because this is how I was introduced to it. I did not. Uh, I think you talked to me about it, Fringy, but I, I only remembered a couple of details to the point where it opens with like Nicholas Holt and um, what's the name of the girl? Anya Taylor Joy. Anya Taylor Joy uh, preparing to go to a famous like restaurant to eat one of the greatest possible meals experiences of all time from a world renowned chef, the greatest chef of all time, basically. And it's just like okay, you know, as film premises go, it's like eh, sure, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I can watch people eating food. The funny thing about all of that is that uh, like with Banshees of Inner Sharon, I I think I'm more enticed by these premises that are almost. Um, like, like you wouldn't expect it to draw in an audience than the ones that obviously do. It's like, man's family is killed, and he's gonna cr trek across country to get revenge on everyone involved in doing the thing. And you're like, yeah, yeah, that, that, I, I can understand why everyone would be interested. And then it's like, story about two people going to a restaurant to eat food. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's like my <laughs> like, afternoon. <laughs> it's almost like a challenge uh, to the audience of like, yeah, would you give yeah. a shit to watch this? You're like, well, uh, maybe. Um, but of course, there's a lot more than that going on. Um, the chef is, uh, he's, he's up to something. Everyone is. And you get that sense pretty quickly. The tone of the film is, I was about to say the tone of the film is horror comedy. That doesn't necessarily explain what I'm getting at. It's that, um... Uh, right now you're talking about a tone of foreboding almost. Something seems a bit amiss. Yeah, which is present in all off. kinds of genres. Um, but there is also just people are just a little bit tilted as as in terms of how they behave. And I feel like... I was trying to explain this to Rags when I was talking about it before. It's really... I'm struggling with it. I need to see more horror comedies to help explain what I'm trying to say. But it's like it takes place in a world that is not ours. It's, um... Everything yeah, it's is slightly strange. World. Everybody's a little weird. Yes. Um. And so, basically, it progresses. They eat... Uh, the kind of shit that you see um, and and sort of be like, what what is this rich people food thing? Where it's foods we don't quite understand, but then you know the characters in universe all appreciate and understand it. And then as the film goes on, the portions and and meals start to get really fucking weird. And then uh, something happens that's that's quite scary. Everyone gets put on edge, and then you find out that this whole thing is the chef has run out of patience in a lot of ways in life. And he's going. He's doing all of this as one big, almost like an art project, um, to make a point with all of his people. And uh, I guess I should say, should we say spoilers? And then, because <laughs> I kind of well, want to talk about no, all of it, not not pieces of it. Um, so. so yeah, I don't know. If you wanted to see the menu, uh, don't listen to this part of this stream slash video. 
uh, the plan is to kill everyone, not just the the guests having the food, but also all of the chefs, all the cooks. Everyone's just gonna die. That's that's how this movie works. Oh, um, okay. So, the the, the what, what's happening in the film? Uh, should I say on the surface is that the chef explains basically he's come to hate his uh, his almost hobby turned profession being cooking. Used to once upon a time adore it, but over time it's yeah, been destroyed through all kinds yeah. of different things. And that this is his grand sort of revenge and final point about like I don't know something of a um, a big old realization and representation of what is wrong in the field of of cooking and critique of cooking and experiencing cooking. And um, me and Fring have talked a little bit about it, but it, there's a theory here that it could represent sort of ideas about. Uh, film and critics of that, but Ooh, also and, really just art. Theory or just like an apt, like that that is what it is about, that that's the actual, or have we already screwed up by trying to ask that question? I think, <laughs> uh, well, I think it's super applicable to film, but I imagine it has to be applicable to just art in general. And I, I, I thought this... it was art broadly, right? It's kind of like, um, it's, it's, it's the ways that people engage with it, that because yes. like the main thing that upsets uh, Ray finds is like how people engage with what he does. Um, yeah. To the point that Anya Taylor Joy's character is kind of like the, she kind of in the end sort of represents. Her name is Nutella. Hmm? No, did you say her, uh, her? No, no, I didn't say that. What did you say? Anya Taylor Joy. Anya. Okay, okay, carry on. Yeah. Um. <laughs> the, fucking hell! Now I've lost my train of thought. Thanks. <laughs> I just want Nutella now. <laughs> I could say if you want me to. So if you want to, if you want to take it over. Sure. Fine. So what I, the way I want to talk about this film is summarizing the, like I said, he kills everybody, but there's a reason he's brought everyone there. Anya Taylor Joy's character is the one person that shouldn't be he's there, the outsider, and yeah. she's only there through what is essentially a fuck up. Um, but well, there's more purpose to it than that. But I'm saying that for the sake of understanding this situation. Now, each of these people to the chef represent. They, they personify one significant issue with the consumption of art. Um, and that's the part of the film I kind of just enjoy thinking about. That's that's kind of where I'm going yeah. with this. So the person we're introduced to first is the foodie and the normal person. And she's fun in the movie because she is very normal. She sees the food and she's like, what the fuck is this? And then like when other people are just eating it, she's like, I don't even know what... Am I supposed to, like, what do I start with? What tools do I fucking use? And then, like, tasting some of it, and it's like, nah, that's just not at all food. I, you know, I, I miss normal people food. That sort of thing. But he, um, Nicholas Holt, by the way, who every single thing he shows up in, he just does a good performance. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, it's funny, the first thing I saw him in was Skins, which is a UK show. Uh, I don't know if anyone chat watched that, but it's just cool to see... Uh, a smaller level UK show where he popped up in there, and I see him now in fucking shit tons of AAA things. He's doing well. But yeah, he... <laughs> his whole thing is being like, I recognize the uh, you know, utensils, I recognize the tools you're using, I recognize the way that you've cooked it, I recognize all these different like ingredients. I know it, I'm taking photos of it, I'm pointing it out, I'm uh, asking questions that the questions are more so to show that I know what I'm talking about rather than getting answers. He already knows yeah. the answers. And he's fucking smug. He is, like, thoroughly smug. He's the kind of, I think, quintessential smug, foodie that you're aware of when it comes to these sorts of things. You you can totally imagine this person exists and does what they do. Um, his sort of ending in this film, as, as the film progresses, he gets uh, different payoffs that relate to that. All of his dialogue relates to that. It becomes quickly obvious that despite the fact that she's his plus one, she's the like girlfriend here, he doesn't give a shit about it whatsoever. And he actually mm -hmm. considers her embarrassing if she ever even like talks at all about this situation because she has nothing really good to say and he's just like, stop humiliating me. Like This is the best experience ever. Um, um, the interesting thing with his character is we find out that he's the only person there who knew everyone was going to die. That's what he was told. But that's how much he wanted to experience this. That's how much he values it. And he considered it a part of the experience. That, and Which is a good example, I think, of there's portions where I think they cross the line in this film that uh, the tone doesn't work for me. And that's, that's one of them. It's like he was told everyone was going to die. And he, okay, <laughs> it's part of a he point they're trying to make about him, but in the in the world for me that that doesn't fit really. 
Wait, so um, th this th the smug guy knew what was going to happen and still showed up? Uh, I don't know if he knew specifically what was going to happen. He just knew everyone was going to die. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, that's what I mean. I and mean, it was part. Yeah, and it was part of the point that the chef wanted to make was that even though he knew that he turns up because that's how much he believes this is like an important thing to do and stuff. Um, okay. his end comes then, in. Oh, if you want to yeah. take over for a bit. <laughs> well, because his end is like you know what? Like Ray finds is like here you go, buddy. Here's here's your chef's coat. Come into the kitchen, cook something. And he sort of fumbles his way through it, makes something, and then Ray finds it. It's like, man, that's that's pretty bad, actually. Mm. Um, it, it's kind of like for as much as he is obsessed with all of this, like he can't do it. He's like yeah, gathered um, all of this information and understands it, but like he can't do it. To not He's understate it, I quite it enjoy the scene. It's so yeah. everything is so fucking awkward the way they do everything. <laughs> yeah, They're like off you get uh, and. and by the way, Ray Fiennes is fucking fantastic in the movie. Not that it's a surprise, oh, he's well, fantastic he and everything. But he, he comes across as a terrifying chef uh, quite quite well. And in, specifically in that scene, he's like, what are you cooking? And he's like, uh... You're like, what, what, what am I supposed to... And like, anything he suggests, he immediately gets it for him, and he just says it so bluntly. And like, he's trying desperately to cook it, he's just fumbling all over the place, stuttering, shaking, sweating. Nothing is like quite right. But he still assembles a meal, and then... Uh, throughout the movie, they've been having this format of, preventi of presenting sorry, the meals, and it'll be like, this is, and it'll be given a name, and it'll show the ingredients, how it's prepared, and then a picture of it that looks really quite glorious sort of thing. When he creates his, it just says something like, this pile of shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> this, this, oh, yeah, no. just, like, undercooked lamb, like, you know, oh, yeah. like, under-seasoned. Um, yeah, he can't do it. And yeah, yeah, that's the point, is that he fails. As much as he talks a big game, he thinks he's better than everybody for everything he recognizes, the chef has just shown him, like, you suck, you shit, you can't mm. achieve anything close to this world that you desperately wish you were a part of. Um, and then he fucking kills himself, out of shame, basically, and guilt. He just hangs himself. Uh, which is like, so, maybe if we go through each of the characters, and then we can maybe talk about who they might represent as archetypes in terms of uh, yeah. looking at art... He's he's one of the ones that gets a lot of, I'd say, understanding. But if we move next, I guess, to a more obvious one, there is a famous critic there. She's well known for all of her work. She's her word will like uh, determine whether or not a restaurant can survive. Uh, she can destroy careers or make them. Um, because everything she says when she's reviewing things, it's very like flowery. And uh, to be fair, she's very good at explaining exactly what she's tasting and what experience she's having. Um, she has like a helper with her who just basically every time he speaks up to disagree with her, he'll immediately like concede to her when she says like, no, you're wrong. Uh, she's like a kind of character that nobody wants to disagree with. Everybody wants her appraisal and approval. And mm -hmm. um, I'd say like a, a sort of mid uh, payoff is the, the when they find out they're all going definitely going to die. She compliments one of the chefs on their work and she like discovers that that, that chef likes is actually struggling with the fact that this woman is, is appreciating her when, when she's just desperately trying to find a way to escape. I just thought it was interesting, like, um, the chefs even have some level of, like, yeah, this is fucking insane, and I really did just want appreciation for my work, but, uh, there's some, there's some fun interactions, I guess, what I'm getting at, but by the end of the film, she's, um, burned to death, a lot of them are burned to death, slash exploded. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other archetypes. I think this would be better if I could see a well, picture. Of there was uh, there was the guy who was like doing a food show, but seemed pretty like not passionate about it. Like he didn't really care that much. Um, you talking about John Leguizamo? Yeah. Oh like, well, so he's he... an actor. Oh right, right. And that's again why I wonder about the uh, how this is applicable and lots of things. But basically, he's a guy who uh, the chef lays out was. Uh, no less an artist compared to all of them who, as cooks, but that he saw him in one of his latest movies and he just could tell he had no passion left, didn't care at all. He was just there to pick mm. up the paycheck. Um, and I think he even says that as a defense of it. Uh, which, you know, again, we can make that the, become uh, clearer in a sec. There were those business guys, like the rich guys, who were just sort of like, it, it seemed like it was they were more so there just because it's like, this is the thing that you do. Yeah, this is the thing, than, like, um, any we own this, technically, because yeah. the person who pays us pays you, and, you mm -hmm. know, you, you, don't want, you don't want anything bad happen. Yeah, there's that one, and then there's um, a couple who have come here time and time again, but that they don't really have much to say at all, no. or remember. 
Um, his mum is there as well. <laughs> I remember that. Oh, that's no. yeah, that's right. And she spends and the entire her. film simply drinking wine. That's all she does. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that... Is that covering everybody? And then that leaves you with Anya Taylor-Joy's character, who is, like, the normal person, who, by the end of all of this absurdity, is just like, can I, like, have a cheeseburger, please? Just, like... And, and no, like, <laughs> bullshit either. Just give me, like, a cheeseburger. Oh, like, well, I think cheeseburger. there's more to that as a payoff um, that we could probably... Yeah, sure. So, yeah, That's the end point, I suppose, though, is, is yeah. Well, yeah, to kind of, so with, with those explanations, like, so what, what is going on? It's like, well, I think the film is saying that these are many, if not, I mean, it probably covers a shit ton, not all, but these are the many ways art dies. Um, yeah, in, yeah. And so, like, if we take uh, in the order that we were kind of explaining them, the first one, the foodie type guy, I think he, if we were to transpose this to the realities we're more familiar with, <laughs> He's like the video essayists we cover, who think they know fucking everything about film, and then when they, uh, like, they can reference every filmmaker's films, they can reference every form of technique. And they can talk about, what was it, verisimilitude and all that shit. They can, um, they can, yeah. yeah, talk about every single thing that goes into it and everything that that person did, but when it comes time to make their own thing, it kind of sucks. And it's almost, like, mystifying as to why they can just never quite get there. And it's because, yeah, they... There's no passion for the actual creation. It's a passion to be that thing. And he even says to him, like, you want my life. You, it's not that you want to, like, create. It's that you just want me. You want to be me. And uh, once he oh, tells like, him that after he... passionate love for the craft that will propel you to do the work necessary to become really good at, uh, at something. And he's, he's absolutely shattered by that realization and, like I said, fucking kills himself. It's pretty rough. Uh, but the, yeah, so that's an aspect of how it's it's not about the creation. It's about almost the prestige. Uh, you just want to, you want to have being that and be that. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, someone said EFAP. But, Don't worry, we're coming up. We're not that one. Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're one coming up. Yeah. Um, well, funnily enough, I think I said the, the critic was uh, the second one I tried to explain. So what is her problem? And it's like, well, he explains to her that part of his issue with her is that she can, at a whim, destroy and raise anything based on just the, the, her feelings of the day. And that kind of power is absolutely insane. As well as um, she'll like overpower anybody in terms of uh, like any experience she has is going to trump everyone else's. And so, and she can explain thoroughly and accurately and supportedly with everything. And so she's like just this powerhouse that can just slaughter her way through all these different artists and destroy their lives if she's not careful. Um, a lot of what she, the power she has can damage so much of what could be created as a result of, and she doesn't give a shit. She's just like, whatever, I'm just telling the truth. I'm, I'm speaking out for what I experienced. And I think that's the closest to us out of all of them that we um we can do extensive sort of breakdowns and explain things as best we can but that um it can it can have damage in different directions it can raise up a film or destroy it depending on uh, just how much we give it but I, simultaneously it's uh she's like hated for it and we are thoroughly hated by many people for <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah plenty we of do. people hate us I hate our guts um Oh, at the same time, like these are these are things that you know, I it's like the worst version of all of these types of, uh, I guess, archetypes. Uh, next well, because there's nothing wrong with somebody breaking down no. in, in the same way that it's nothing wrong with somebody who isn't a chef having an appreciation for the for for what people do, right? For what right. chefs do, it's kind of like all of these things taken to the furthest extent to where it begins to destroy, like. The uh the core, which is that people want it, you know, people want to eat to eat something that is nice and makes them feel good, and broadly right, people want to consume art that makes them feel something, not necessarily good, but gives them an experience that's valuable, mm -hmm. and like each of the ways that they approach it kind of strips away that core of just I want to be entertained. In the case of like you know what Anya Taylor Joy's character says, right, I just want to have like a meal that I like. Yes, yeah, because. Yeah, this is this is why I kind of have a lot to appreciate about the film because I kind of like yeah. thinking about all these things. Because next up is John Leguizamo's character, which is like a kind of a washed up actor, but he's still got a lot of fame, and you you can tell he's a bit insecure about that. Like he wants to make sure that fame is still there, but he'll openly say like, oh, "I hate it when people recognize me." <laughs> it sucks. But at the same time, he's like, "Oh, you know me? Yeah, I, you know, I was in blah blah blah." Um, but like, I think the aspect with him is that, you know, the chef sees a fellow artist, but one that just doesn't give a shit to create art anymore is only in it for the other right. sort of material benefits, which sucks. Because when you have people who are 
I think you can easily sort of um, allegorize. That's probably not a word. This into actors know. in well, any any artist that's performing for the sake of performing, not actually anything else, and they don't care, and there's no passion. So what they're creating results in like shit art, basically. Um, the the chef explains that he went to see his film and it was like the single worst experience of his entire life. He, it was like the worst day ever, and he fucking hated it. And Don was almost just like, "Damn, okay." <laughs> like, and it's it's <laughs> funny because a lot of the time we can say that like the either the director or the writer or even the actor like they just didn't give a shit and it made something so fucking unappealing to to consume as a, in the form of a film. But like I said, it applies to all art forms. I think or it does the opposite, like Jet Li. Um, it creates an incredible experience in Mulan. Yeah, that was hilarious. Uh, but I guess if we would, if we were so obsessed with the integrity of art, <laughs> that would be like Jelly. What the fuck are you doing, man? <laughs> of course, yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, you have that. Then uh, the lads that kind of pull the money card and that they're there because they kind of feel like they own the place almost, and that it's all that. It's like, that's, Absolutely seems, no appreciation for the craft. Yeah, it's just money. It's all money. Yeah, everything about it. Which it, that, that seems and straightforward. Like, so then and, and then you see examples, right? They're presented with something that they went there to go get, right? This weird sort of artsy food experience, and they're like, "No, fuck you! Like, give me what I want." Yeah, it's kind of like representative of almost like that entitled perspective on art of like you know give me exactly what I want rather than the thing that I knew that I was sort of coming here for. Although I should have known if I gave more of a shit, that kind of attitude of just like a lack of appreciation for art. And so, um, like I said, pretty straightforward, but similarly like money ruining yeah. art is, is obviously a, not, not hard to understand. It, it, the funny thing being, of no. course, that as is explained, it's money that got him all of the resources to this, be able yeah. to create this in the first place, but it is now something that just hangs over him, and it it's like a clamp on the art. Um, who was next out of our selection? Uh, the couple. You have the couple yeah. who have gone there many times, but have never taken in the experience. They, it's you like, if you imagine people watching movies, it's like they've seen it, they viewed it with their eyes, but they haven't really watched it or taken it in. It's yeah. just like a thing. That they... Which we come across well, like, you know, all the yeah. time. All the time. Like, like yeah. the people who, who watch a movie, but actually just have it on the side monitor and just do something else. I know. That's or probably a good way to believe everything the film to tells them. Like, like, yeah, I've, I've seen it. the movie. No, 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 no. I think, it, I think you're, taking it, you're taking it a bit in the wrong direction there, Rags. It's more so like... Yeah. You imagine people, because in this case, it's like they've gone there many times, but he couldn't tell you a single thing about, like, any of those experiences. They just sort of came and went. Like, he wasn't really... It, the, the art was just totally lost. They do like, it because it's a thing to do. You are to do that. That right. is a thing people yeah, do. kind of in the same way. Okay. Of, like, it's a thing to go watch movies, but, like, you couldn't say a single thing about them. Or it's a thing to go to the art gallery, but you couldn't tell me a single thing about what you saw. You're oh. just kind of, like, passing time. You're not really... You're not really making... Yeah. You, you're just not a... Pre and it's not really like it's not out of like a disrespect it's just sort of a narrow focus apathy. they're like very yeah kind of because they have apathy like their marriage is not good um i believe he cheated on his wife yeah. like they don't have a good relationship it's a very sort of insular sort of a uh, set of characters mainly the guy um and then with that it kind of leads to anya taylor joy who it just sort of cuts through the bullshit it's like i want food she's a normal like. person and none of this yeah. makes any sense to her she just wants to go home it's, yeah. it's crazy. Um, but again, to set up the sort of how it comes around to an ending, he sees her and throughout the film he keeps trying to talk to her because he's like, you're not, you're, you know, bigger. subtextually, you're not someone who fucking destroys art. You're just a normal person. So <laughs> why are you here? Like, what's, why would I kill you sort of thing? And um, he offers her to become like the chef side of things. Like she can die similarly as, as everyone was going to anyway. But she can die as one of the creators instead of one of the parasites, sort of thing. Um, mm. and, and she's not interested basically at all. So no, she, like, yeah, she obviously no, she doesn't want to fucking die. I, <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I know. Which I appreciate well, yeah, yeah. them maintaining, right? It, it doesn't. They don't make her crazy at any point in the movie. She's she's the most normal, which I think is deliberate. Um, but mm. he gives her a job at one point to sort of solidify her as a chef, and during it, um. I'm not going to include everything because obviously we're not doing a full breakdown, but uh, she does find an old image and it's basically his room, the chef's room, and she finds like basically evidence of where he started and how he came to get to where he is. And there's an image of him uh, flipping burgers at a, I guess, McDonald's or whatever. And he's like smiling. 
And I think the implication, of course, uh, is that he had a very humble beginnings, and even back right. in a fucking McDonald's, he was much more happy making food there than he is now. Uh, yep. And so That's she, right. realizing that, uh, asks, tells him, basically, that all the food he's served tonight, or rather the afternoon of tonight, yeah, and that it's not made with love, it's made with, like, scorn and, and empty, hollow, just, it's bullshit, none of it's real. She wants something real, and he's just like, what the fuck would you want, then? And she orders a hamburger. And they do this sequence of him making the hamburger, and it's just so it's like, like <laughs> it's, it's art. Like, it's know, an I'll, art. I'll make it. And then um, I think she takes a bite, and it's like, yeah, that's that's really good. Uh, can I get it to go? Like, can I get it? I'd take it away. And he's like, yeah, you know what? You can. Yeah, you can. And that's so the moment she, where he's like, fine, I'll spit at you. Yeah, you're allowed to leave. Well, and you why? Because she's appreciating the art. Yep. And appreciating the art in a really straightforward and simple way, which is like, that made me feel good, which is what I wanted. Yeah. Um, which is, not compared to everybody else's approach to it, like, oh, look at the way that he infused, like, the fucking, you know, like, the, the, the spices into this, like, weird dish or something, or, uh... The guys who just don't give a shit, like, about what's happening. Well, yeah, um, it's in the trailer, and it, and it gets brought up, but, like, Nicholas Holt's character, he keeps taking photos of the food just to show yeah. people he's having it, and it's just, like, for fuck's sake. Like, just it, eat the goddamn food. Yeah, just it, have the experience instead of just letting everyone know you're having the experience. That's... Mm -hmm. and, and, again, stuff like that, and... It's like, I do like this film a lot, but it's a, um, it's more so for the conversation piece than the film itself. It's like, yeah, that's because in terms of the thing itself, it's like the characters act in ways that can be a little strange. They're not very interested in saving their own lives. Um, of, of course, the fact that it needs like several of these characters to sort of behave in a way that's really weird and abnormal. Well, he, to they, they lampshade it. He's like, if all of you had decided to try and get out of here, you would have been successful. It's like, I guess that they're like, trying to say like, yeah, but they were yeah. too scared. And it's like, ah, I don't believe mm -hmm. it. When you've got like four or five relatively like in their prime men and your enemies are what? A bunch mm -hmm. of chefs? Like, yeah, there's going to be a big fight that breaks out. That's what's going to happen. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To be fair, it's a horror, horror comedy. Well, we know that, but the the point would be like that. First, that's irrelevant. That's a genre <laughs> definitely. Like, yeah, doesn't really matter. It's more so that I think Mauler and I agreed that we think the film would have benefited more from being a strict horror, yeah, rather than so. horror comedy. I don't think it. I don't think it balances the tone well all the time. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. And, um, you know, like, the whole reveal of Nicholas Holton knowing they were all gonna die and he still came here and he still brought her knowing that, and it's like, oh my god, and it's like, the point the film was trying to make is, like, that's how fucking obsessed he is with getting this foodie experience, and I'm just sitting there like, I think you nailed it without that. I don't think you needed yeah. that. That just makes it more absurd, and it's like, yeah, but it's a horror mm. comedy, and it's like, uh-huh. Mm. Uh... Yeah. But I, I agree, like, the thing that I find most interesting about the film is that meta aspect of, like, delving into, this is about art, isn't it, broadly, yeah. like, in general. And because this is a film and you're filmmakers, it's probably about film criticism in particular. Very um, likely to be, yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's like interesting to look at, especially, especially if you watch it and you see aspects of yourself in, uh, in, um, some of the, some of the people. Was well, so it part of, sort I've... of a... I've said yeah. um, before that part of why there's a lot of things I don't end up seeing is because I can't, like, machine gun watch films or play games or read books or whatever. I can't because I need to process when I watch a film a lot of the time. Mm. Um, yeah. I might decide I need to watch it more than once before I can properly understand exactly what happened, especially if I'm going to be breaking it down. But um, it's just, like, I can't watch loads in a row and I, it... it scrambles my brain almost and i just feel like i think about stuff like that and then i'm like oh that's kind of what that the the husband and wife character were they just they're just doing it because it's you do it but they they don't even remember it like that's really interesting mm -hmm. to think about because i just the characters and what they represent i feel like prop up uh prop up everywhere like in terms of just life and how uh industries and how we enjoy everything and or sometimes don't um and I just like the idea that, yes, the, the, the villain, so to speak, is an artist who is just so fucking tired with how the whole industry has fallen apart because it's just destroyed by all of these people who really have no place consuming the art in the first place. Yet here they are. Um, yeah, and I kind, of, I kind of think it's neat for, for, for all of that. Um, and I appreciate that... Really good, and cinematography and everything is really yeah, strong. Yeah, and... 
it's it's uh, it's an experience. The film it's it's very unique. It's kind of cool that it's made. I, I if anything, that's part of why I wanted to talk about it. I was like, I wouldn't mind more of this instead of, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll take some movies like this. They're interesting. They make me think. Yeah. Because um, that, like I said, I think the film is interesting. As for whether I'd recommend it to everybody, it's like I don't know. I think I'd recommend it to a specific set of movie watchers. Well, see, because like what we just went through in terms of talking about it, we don't have to see the film for that. It's, it's, no, uh, no. Which you know, it sounds kind of mean, but it's just like, well, this is the problem. I like your subtext more than I like your text. Yes, I, I, yeah, that's that's more or less the takeaway with the film. Um, the actual like story on its surface is like, mm, but what it means is super interesting. Yeah. Uh, because I'm trying to think of if there's if we better explain it, but. It's just the the characters throughout the story have many opportunities to do all kinds of things and sort of don't. A lot of their reactions are like, "What? That's that's what they thought of yeah. that? Okay, I guess." And then you feel like, "Oh, is it because that better suits what point you want to make?" And it's like, mm, "Fine, I guess." Yeah. yeah, I would say a lot of the time. Um, someone said it's a better glass onion than glass onion. I don't even know how I, this connects with I glass onion necessarily. To knives out, and I think it's just because it's an ensemble movie. I think that might legitimately be the only reason because they're not the same film. Well, if anyone was curious of our answer on that, I was like, yeah, the, this is of this is definitely better than Glass Onion. <laughs> it's not even close. <laughs> what? Um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise you at all, probably. But yeah, not, not as long a breakdown as the other two, but the menu. Um, if you're interested by what we've talked about, then I guess you go check it out. But like I said. I wouldn't recommend this for like metal and rags, for example, as opposed to there's so many other things I'd rather them see before this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A lot of the time, that's how I feel about a lot of recommendations that are really kind of tepid to wavering. I'm like, man, I feel like there's films that are just amazing. I could have watched instead. Mm. Um, I was amused as well by the, uh, the choice that they've made. Cause I have to imagine they probably found out what they needed to know about like high class you know, highbrow food. Because, like, uh, yeah. one of the courses is, like, dipping sauces, but no bread. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, at, at one of the courses is, like, uh, I think he describes it as, like, a miniature ecosystem of the island, and, like, the center of the plate is just a big rock. <laughs> and, you know, you're supposed to not eat that part, I guess. It's just stuff like that. I was having fun with it. I, I was paid just like, for the rock, I'm gonna eat the rock, you cannot stop me. And I think that's the almost surface level format that I think works is the whole like, you're, you're familiar with this audience, you know this stuff, right? You've seen crazy sort of highbrow foods. And then mm. the movie starts with that and then moves into like, here's our next food made by this chef. Chef walks up and he's like, called The Mess. And like this chef uh, constructed it, blah, 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 but he'll never be as good as he wants to be. And that'll haunt him forever. Isn't that true? And he's like, yes. That he's like, right then, off you go. And he just pulls out a gun and shoots <laughs> himself in the head. Oh, and, like, okay. and you know, yeah. half the characters are screaming, some of them are looking for exits, and then one of them is just like laughing because they're like, This is great, this is all a part of the, the show. And it's like, you know, it's a fun and movie to watch I unravel, that, uh, I guess. I'm pretty sure that um Nicholas Hoult was just still eating the food, like, yeah, man, you gotta try this like ta, -ta like the way yeah. that he infuses <laughs> or whatever. He just doesn't care at all. Um but yeah. Menu. I don't know. That's the else? menu. <laughs> You want to I, I, about no, it? We, we basically, that's like the main thing that I find interesting about the film is like how you can apply it to film criticism and art criticism in general. It's especially relevant considering what we do on EFAP. And I'd say so. And of the people that we encounter in our uh, adventures through the EFAP land. I would say, yeah, uh, for, even from what we've said, you guys could probably picture like how a lot of people we've covered apply to these different people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, the video I said, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that one's It's up. really hard not to see that. It's like, and, oh my god. Yeah, when I was watching the film and I was looking at the film, uh, the, 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 the critic who was, like, breaking things down in a way that was, like, very thorough, but maybe in a way that's a little bit, like, it's kind of hard to even talk to that person. It's like, yeah, look, all right, I get it, okay? I understand. <laughs> well, yeah, they, I'd say that the, <laughs> part of her problem that they make clear is that she's got a huge ego and that um, the guy with her, every single time he even presents an alternative opinion, she's, like, aggressively, like, no, you're wrong. She's like, yeah. And then he's just like, oh, okay, yep, that's fine. And then it's like, well, the, we, what's the point in even talking, right? Yeah, um, but, uh, you know, you still feel a sense of, like, 
these, these people, man, like they're, they're still people. Like <laughs> they're a little cartoonish, sure, but you know, it's uh, the whole thing is it's a rough situation. And by the way, the final way that like everyone dies is that they dress up as like s'mores and then they're Not all set on fire. Works. Yeah, and then, yep. <laughs> Meanwhile, Anna tell, Anya Taylor Joy's on the boat eating a burger because she gets to escape. Yeah, and, and but he, uh, the part I was I brought up was just, it's just funny. I'd almost want to show you that out of context. His speech about how much he fucking hates s'mores and he considers it like the most <laughs> yeah. degraded and worst form of food <laughs> art that ever existed. It's just kind of funny. <laughs> that was s'mores. Um, they didn't do anything wrong. Oh, yeah, and see, this is kind of an example of something that pulled me out as well, actually. Um, also, what do you think about John Leguizamo's assistant? So she, there's no reason at all to go after her, and I think the yeah, film's even aware of that. He, she's, she, like, makes a case for how she shouldn't be there, and then uh, the chef is like, where did you go to university? And she says, brown. And then he says, do you have any student loans? And she says, no. And then he goes, yeah, you're dead. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I, I guess the idea is that she's too privileged? I'm not sure. Uh, okay. But um, that that that's another moment of the comedy part of the horror comedy. That well, for me, I was just like, good okay, financial decisions. Yeah, that that happens. Maybe you can just, you know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Someone said she's lying. If there's an interpretation that makes more sense, I wasn't sure what the point of that was. I thought that the idea maybe was that it's. It's very rare for anyone to be able to pay off any of their student loans when they go through something like that, and the the fact that she can. Much, isn't Brown, Brown's pretty like that's Ivy League, right? So it's probably really expensive. Yeah, I think I think. Brown this... tuition. What is the tuition at Brown? Uh, apparently, in one year, is like fifty, sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> that's where they learn you good. Nash. We gonna so... learn you good here. Well, you you know what is topic number four is a brief chat about our experiences with the Dead Space remake. Just first impressions. Oh, and then next week, uh, you're going to get a deep dive from us. All right? Whoa. It's right. So. Um, uh, well, the first impression is it's really great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what should we say as a preamble? Like, there's, there's obviously been concerns about this. It's funny how Callisto Protocol having a botched launch made people even more worried for this when they're completely disconnected. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe um, a little little story time for people who might be wondering why I'm not streaming this like I said I would this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so I was tweet by the way. Huh? Hmm? No, carry on. Oh, okay. When you posted. Oh, this is, okay. I got you. Uh, yeah. So basically, it was like, all right, I got the the that space. And I'm ready to go. Play the OG. I'm I'm in for it. I'm looking forward to this. And uh, I was like, okay, let's boot this shit up. And the start is like, oh, those frames don't look so good. That's that's not good. And then I look at my at my task manager. It's like, hmm, my task manager is not really helpful. It says it's using nothing of my GPU, but I hear my GPU working very hard over there. So I got the HW monitor. It's like, yeah, I'm using all my power, Mr. Moodle. Please help me. By the way, there's no chance you have any resources to stream this. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's not good. Finally so, been forced into the modern arena. Is your computer so yeah, old? so I was thinking like, okay, what do I do? Do I refund it, get the PlayStation version, and then pay eighty bucks for it instead of? It's like, oh, what am I gonna do? And then I started thinking it's like, man, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm planning to cover a bunch of games this year. Uh, so yeah, basically, I bought a new GPU for six hundred bucks, uh, sixty eight hundred, uh, just to prevent okay. that from happening again. So that's that's gonna that's gonna come around on Monday. I'm gonna install it, and then I'll get some streaming going again. So this game already forced me to embrace modernity. <laughs> Good. And yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm doing my upgrade way earlier. Obviously, it's not a full upgrade. I'm only getting a GPU. But well, it had to happen at some point. And yeah, you'll uh, you'll be glad you did, as uh, we all feel when we upgrade our computers. It yeah. can be a pain in the ass at the time, but man, when you look back, you're like, oh man, I think this this new well, machine. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, the thing is, normally I <laughs> my thought process was, oh, I don't really want to pay the money now because normally when I build a new PC, I was like excited to pick all the parts and then build it and everything because I built my uh, built the PCs myself. Uh, but this time I was like, oh, fuck, now I need to actually spend that money. Oh, I don't really want to. The prices are so horrendous still. But, well, 
it's an investment in the channel. So there we go. I did it. Uh, <gasps> that's what people are asking. I, I got an AMD 6800, which is basically just below the 3080 for reference, I guess. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, so I, I had a 1080, so I'm, I'm up and running on the oh, 70 old a... GPU. It's a massive upgrade. Yeah, it's that's the... quite an upgrade. Yeah, but the 1080 has served me very well. Like this is the first game that actually brought me to my knees in terms of streaming. And <laughs> yeah, uh, cards can last a long time. Well, it's kind time of funny you say that because yeah, I got a 1080 Ti and I'm struggling. Um, yeah, but I think it might be more of a bottle, uh, a CPU thing actually. In my case, it might. Oh, okay. Some people were saying that it's a bit, uh, it you know, it, it's it can be taxing on CPUs, and I'm not sure if that's a, if that's a setting thing or something like that, or if the game is just you know we're, we're you get into that point, or if yeah. it's just it not that well that, optimized. Yeah. I'm not. I'm just not sure what the. It seems it is. well. It was just when I was when I wasn't streaming. It was running pretty well. It was when I was uh streaming that it was. Yeah, I, can, I, gotcha. I can. I can yeah, run it okay uh, offline. It it dips below sixty fps uh, in some places. But it's it's bearable offline, but obviously there's no the resources um, that's for the encoder to actually do a stream. So I was getting yeah. lag spikes whenever I had like an in-game cutscene moment, wherever he like attaches a thing or something, it would like freeze for a second and then come back. There's a little bit of stuttering I'm noticing in areas where I think it's loading new stuff. That's what I've noticed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's actually kind of weird because it still has these shader buffers some sometimes, even though it loads all the shaders in the beginning so i don't actually know what's going on with that that actually might need a patch to be and honest. this is more relevant than you may think humble viewers the launch of a game's performance is so fucking important yeah. look at callisto this, protocol this... <laughs> look at what happened to callisto yeah just runs through also just uh, i just saw some chat what my power supply is i have a 750 watts power supply i checked everything beforehand uh I'm, I'm fine i'm fine but thanks for reminding me people have been reminding me but I, I have an IT background. I'm, 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 uh, I, I know. He sends a photo of his <laughs> tower and it's just like a giant sword through it. And he's like, I don't know what it is. It's just something's like, wrong. <laughs> something's yeah. going right. But yeah, no, I appreciate it. But yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I got it. Also, I have a monk to ask things if I, to, for sanity checks. Oh, you're on a monk. <laughs> wow. A monk? Yeah. yeah I, I, I don't a, think a they monk. got involved in PCs, but there you go. They go like, oh, well. and then, um, yeah, so. oh, None of this to like overshadow, I suppose, the game itself. Uh, yeah. It's just sort of the tangent we kind of begun. Well, like I said, no, it, it plays right, right into just saying it. Put, it's it's its performance is really strong. I'm seeing a lot of people just say thumbs up in terms of it, it's playing well, uh, which yeah, is a good I'm sign, not having of course. Any technical issues myself. I imagine the console versions are pristine. I haven't heard about them. Yeah, I yeah. have no idea what's going on with the console versions. Uh... Well, positively I mean, or negatively. I, I was going to say, know. no word on the negative levels of performance is good. Like, the, the, I've, I've not really seen anyone complaining about it. Well, that's probably a good place to start. I've just seen loads of praise for this game. Yep. Shit tons. Yes. Yep, um, loving it. I've got about, I think I'm about seven hours in. I tried to play it a decent amount before today, so I would have uh, at least some, uh, some things to say about it. And um, for, guys, for those, I, I think we started uh with this but my experience with dead space is quite thorough the first and second dead space i played a lot a lot a lot i have all the achievements on the xbox 360 as i've Nerd. mentioned um i've played them over many many times they're games that i really enjoyed they're games that are very satisfying to be good at and to do better and better as you play I, I like the gameplay, I love the setting, I love all the weapons and how you fight the enemies and their variety. There's a lot to like about Dead Space. And, you know, even the third, you know, it's not bad. Um, but, uh, boy, before this came out, this remake, oh, I'm, you know me, especially nowadays, I'm super worried. You know, <laughs> how are they going to botch it? How are they going to ruin it? How's it going to suck? But after seven hours, I am very pleased with this game. Nice. It looks... It looks gorgeous. Oh, um, yes. I'm playing on 1440p, Ooh, ultra everything. Nice. Um, I mean, I, it, and it looks just so damn good. Not uh, represented by what you see on screen. This is a chewed up bitrate <laughs> thing. Don't, don't even oh, yeah, think it, for a second that this it, represents it, the game. Yeah. Trust no. it. Please I've been do playing trust on me, man. Oh, it looks good gorgeous. Yeah, I've also been playing on 1080 and goddamn, that is a that's a good looking game. That was a really good looking game. It has incredible lighting. 
the yeah, lighting, the, li the lighting makes so a huge good. difference. Great. It really does. The the entire vibe that you get from this game when the lighting is as it is, it, it you know, I realistic lighting is its own phrase. But it's very, very immersive lighting. Um, the dark when it's dark, it is dark. Uh, when it's, it's pitch black, dark, it is yeah. pitch black. Mm -hmm. uh, when you, you shine lights, you flashlight to yeah, see. When, when when lights are shining, they cast shadows. Um, yeah. When things are glowing, you know they have those ambient colors around them. Uh, there's it, it does so much for the atmosphere and uh, I've kind of I've kind of thought about this as I was playing the remake. I'm thinking. I personally am not as scared by the remake as I was the original. And I wondered, well, is that because of the remake and how it's made? Or is it because a number of years have passed between the original and now? <laughs> and I'm just older and braver? I don't know. I have no oh, I was, clue. I was going to say, this, my familiarity with Dead Space and IP has made it so that I've like crushed its ability to scare me beyond jump scares now, I think. Yeah. Well, um, what I was... To me. What I was going for was the idea that I think that because we were talking about, you know, the graphics and the lighting, I think the lighting being as it is adds a lot to the tension and it contributes so much to this atmosphere of uh, terror that the original game just I don't think it has much, especially now, because it's just I adore Dead Space one. I adore the original, but it's looking a bit long in the tooth in some areas. It doesn't look bad. But it definitely, it's, it's well, a night and day difference. Yeah, not to be mean, but it. there are some levels where the way they lit is kind of like, what the fuck? It's just flat. Yeah, it's really mm. flat. And and the Ishimura is a bunch of gray hallways and boxes. But in this version, the ship itself just feels so... It, it feels so different, and yet it feels the same, uh, which is yeah. a lot of what I feel it's about the It's going to be remake. an interconnected area, though, that you actually can walk between places. Like, it's not just the tram station. There's zero gravity sections, like little hallways and passages that connect yeah. you to different places. <clears throat> Contributes it's, to the sense that this is a whole ship. There like, are well, familiar spots. Something, something, there are new spots. It is Something that like I... I thought about because of the 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 tram stage because we actually get to walk through basically everything and i guess it's gonna stay that way you can just walk if you want to instead of using the tram station it to some extent sometimes you need to use the tram to get to different places yeah no what, what i'm trying to say is doesn't that make it feel the ship a bit smaller actually no i no. don't think so for um, me it, I think... it's just the thing i've, I've just thought huh. about because you you you, you because you know. can't imagine that in a way you can and in a way you can't. Um, if you go from mining to the bridge, which is the mm -hmm. longest stretch the tram can travel, it physically takes it longer for it to go the distance. I know. Yeah. I know it's actually just a loading screen, but it, it creates the idea that you're actually traveling a long way on a tram. Whereas if you went from mm -hmm. uh, one area to an adjacent area, it'd be a lot shorter. I don't know. To me, I guess I haven't really thought about it. I don't think the ship feels smaller because there are some sequences where you go outside in the way that yeah, it looks yeah. that sort of play up the scale of the ship. I think a decent amount. The zero gravity one when you use zero gravity to get down to uh, get down to engineering. Yes. Uh, or to get down to fix the thrusters with a ship. It's mm -hmm. like you have to fly through. <laughs> so cool. I've just gone back to the hangar booting yeah. up your thrusters and flying across the Ishimura to get there. I, I guess the reason why I came, I just thought about it is because you just kind of imagine how long you go with the tram station because it's like a yeah, loading yeah. screen. I think and, so. And this one is just like, yeah, you go there. And even if you use the tram, you, you just stand there. You can even move around in the tram. It doesn't take very long. That was just yes. kind of my, my thinking there that I just had. But yeah. I'm... I mean, the game looks great, and it's not just a matter of the lighting. The lighting is a huge part of what makes this game look modern and a huge element of its improvements over the original. But it's a lot of the props. It's that rooms are full of stuff, little boxes, binders, mm. bins, mops, ladders, buckets. And it can They're all just pick them up with things. Things. Yeah. You can all pick yeah. them up with Kinesis as well. Yeah, it's so. just full of stuff. It feels like stuff. a ship that a thousand people worked on. It feels like oh, a yeah. ship. And and you can and if it was like a place that really not to again I'm not I, not to denigrate the issue more in the original I think they did a pretty good job it's just like with the new technology there's a lot of things that they could do that just would have been like not practical before mm. yeah um, there's really more a lot there's of just life. more stuff laying around yeah. there's more um, side missions man like there's yeah, these side yeah, missions yeah. now too, side which missions is cool. to do heaps um, of text logs 
there, there's a detail I saw today, and I, I I didn't check it in the original, so this might be there as well. There's an audio lock that plays where someone is ripping out his teeth in like a bathroom. Yeah. And if you go in the bathroom, you see the pliers, the big ones, and teeth in the sink that he hit his. You head see a lot well. of the stories that are playing uh, out. Like it's it's uh, in each section, like in each yeah. chapter, you often are following. I'm up to chapter four at this point. Um, like you know these sort of ongoing stories with individual uh mm -hmm. people on the ship that you kind of get yeah, more and yeah. more information on as you go. Yeah, um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, there is environmental storytelling. It's pretty great. The my gripes with the game are pretty minor. Uh, to the point where I won't even mm. really get into them now at all. We can talk about them later. Uh, overall, it feels, like I said, new and familiar at the same time. This is yeah. undoubtedly a Dead Space game. There's no mistaking yeah. it as a remake of Dead Space 1. But because of the way it looks, because of the changes and adjustments that they've made to the combat, because of um, just like it feels like a modern game to play, you're never mistaking it for the original. It no. feels like how a remake, I don't want to say should be done, but I'm extremely happy with the direction they've chosen. It, it, I think, Fringy, you had mentioned that this game feels like what the original would have been if they'd made it today. Now. Yeah, if the original team had made it now. The impression I get is that the team that made this, even, you know, only a quarter of the way through the game, have a lot, a lot of love for the game. They have, and the yes. And the made were very considered in terms of making changes. Hell, yeah. This was um, made by people who love Dead Space. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, of course, like even this early on, Isaac talking is obviously like an improvement. He let, he he actually, yeah. going through, he'll be like, there's a problem we need to fix it. Like, because he'll identify them because he's- The conversations the run smoother. They just do. Yeah, they run smoother yeah, but, because yeah. instead of being talks, told what to do, he, he talks when can he's getting talked Well, I say, I say the conversations run smoother. There's conversations. Is there are I'm conversations yeah. between yeah. him yeah. and the crew. Yeah. And, that, and, and Isaac and doesn't even talk that much. The crew. So. No, not a whole lot. No. Um, and of this course, during talk during our gameplay, he doesn't around. Yeah. No, it's just silent. It's 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 only like the conversations are already present, and him actually chiming in, and like when Kendra and uh, Hammond are fighting us, like knock it off. Like we got to fix this problem. We got to solve it. Well, like I and said, then of course, you know the Nicole stuff, right? That's going to be developed more and more as it goes. I don't remember which stream yeah. it was on, but just the I saw the the, the I quote tweeted the Twitter account <laughs> talking about it. But basically, they they were like, "Dead Space remake is going to be a victim of the same modern sensibilities that a uh, a lot of gaming has, where they just have characters that never shut the fuck up, and it's going to ruin the atmosphere." The evidence okay. for this was a conversation that is in the the original that, that was shown in like one of the trailers, except the difference being, of course, that Isaac was responding. And, like, the difference being, oh, there's a blockade, you may need to build a thing out of a shock pad or whatever from uh, Hammond, while this yeah, time it's it's Isaac that says, like, oh, I'll I'll need to build this to break through here, which is just like, yeah. what is wrong He's with an this? And He's the engineer, he would know these sorts yeah, of and, things. Yeah, and, and the crazy part, of course, is like, oh, yeah, they'll never stop talking. They, they were treating this as though we were going to have some fucking comic relief character just with us the whole time, being like, oh, <laughs> this is an awkward situation. Um, yeah. When yeah. it's like, Are you well, going to no. kill the ball, Isaac? <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> no, actually, they are monsters. Fire away. Fire away. You're oh, morally in the them. clear, burn Isaac. Them all. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed with the discussion right now. I'm seeing a lot of sentiment get around of like, oh, I miss silent protagonists. And all I can think is, were you upset when Jack started talking in Jack 2? Did you consider it worse when he could talk to Daxter mm. and like provide insights and perspectives on the situation? Dead Space 2. Nobody complained with Dead Space. Yeah, so no, obviously. that was the question uh, the account Nobody got asked. People were like, yeah. "Did you hate Dead Space 2? Though, and uh, their response was, "Well, no, because he doesn't. Sh he does shut up in Dead Space 2." As if there's not incredibly long stretches of time in the Dead Space original and remake where he doesn't say fucking anything. Well, it's yeah. just gameplay. He's just exactly. It, 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 it was one of the most talking. bizarre, like trying to bank on. I really. It's like it's like coming back to the menu. It's like get your own fucking opinions. Care about this. <laughs> So that you can well, actually come up with things to say instead of just, just saying uh, what everyone else says about other things. Well, the problem is it's just the forespoken stuff, right? It's like, ah, the dialogue's cringe. You know what? That's Joss Whedon's fault. And also, it's better when characters <laughs> didn't talk. It's like, Joss man, Whedon ruined like... Dead Space. Yeah. <laughs> Joss Whedon, it's just really Joss Whedon it's is like... just over there. What is forespoken? What? What's happening? <laughs> the reality is that the actual complaint is you don't like the dialogue when it sucks. If it's good... Yeah interesting and funny then you like it and you even tolerate it and enjoy it in gameplay it's only when it's bad that you don't like it obviously 
Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to make these weird connections from someone who's way way over there, disconnected from this whole conversation. Well, not, it's just, <laughs> why are we lo- why are we forgetting about all of the like silent protagonists definitely have a place. Like, there's definitely a world where they can be good in a story. But yeah. like, so, people talking, like people actually, talk. sort of people do that. It. Doesn't and them, having perspective. Yeah. In real doesn't life, Jack people... not talk in the Bioshock campaign, even though he has a voice? He doesn't talk at all. No, he, he doesn't silent. speak. Because he, he's, 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 he's talking around. right at the beginning, right? Where he says he has like yeah, common taste. Well, for really example, know. like Modern Warfare like, 2, West. Modern Warfare Soap doesn't talk, and then in Modern Warfare 2, he talks until you play as him, then he doesn't talk anymore. That's what I'm saying. Like, if they remade Bioshock and they had it so that Jack responds to like Tenenbaum and others, I'd just be like, that's fine. That's so fucking fine. I'm all for it. Yeah. Yeah. He's a human being that has perspectives and things to say and opinions. And it's it's the same with characters talking in gameplay, because it's I know it's something that uh Gaming Brick pointed out in his uh, Ratchet and Clank review. In the original game, the characters will talk to each other in cutscenes, but when there's gameplay, there's no talking. It's just gameplay. Whereas in the new one, the remake, they just talk all the time, and it never ends. And it's like, yeah, but the main thing is it's not funny. Like, that's that's the big problem. It's not that they won't stop talking, it's that well, I think what they're saying is very interesting. You brought it up before, but like, you know, why do people like Mamiya? It's like, well, he says interesting yeah. and funny things. Exactly. Meanwhile, yeah. people don't like Forspoken. It's like, well, it's because the characters probably aren't saying anything that's very interesting or funny. Yeah, it's pretty simple. So, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's the, like... um, it's, it, we felt this way for the protagonists of Amnesia Rebirth. Oh. Uh, uh, I hate her. Uh, I, I haven't I played Amnesia. Name. Wow. Oh, yeah. Ethan Winters, right? He only had <laughs> stupid things to say. Oh, Ethan Winters dark. Dark. fucking yeah. awful shit to her character. <laughs> That's become a Meanwhile, staple again, meme. Yeah. It's dark. It's just, ugh. Oh. Everybody likes Aaron Mamir when he's, he's like, this reminds me of this, <laughs> this <laughs> tale that I heard in my youth. It's like, oh, yes, Mamir. So much so that I'll just stop the boat and listen Absolutely, to him talking. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know? dude, there are, there are fucking YouTube shorts of just everything that is said in that game that'll go viral. Like, <laughs> yeah. like oh, yeah. hey, brother, perhaps next time a stealthy approach? He's just like, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fun it's just, shit. Um, I want us to have better conversations. And in the case of, like, uh, in the case of Dead Space, it's like, well, Isaac having something to say in this situation, unless the dialogue was absolutely terrible, which so far it hasn't been. I've, I've actually been pretty happy with it so far. All right. Like, it only stands to provide us more on who he is, how he feels about these situations, and what he needs to do to solve these problems. And especially if we want to actually, like, develop the whole thing with Nicole. Having him talk and say things about her... Like, when he thinks that he's found her, or, you know, when he finds things relating to her, or when people ask him about her. It's just like, that's just gonna further develop their relationship. Which, by the way, the side missions having, like, a whole bunch of, uh, information on, on Nicole and everything that she was getting up to as the ship was falling apart, it's like, ah, oh, that's good. Just well, I assume you'd refer to that as a strict material. upgrade. Yeah, because it's just like, we get, we get more insight into, like, what happened with her on the Ishimura. Leading up to that, you know, that final recording that he received. Um, <clears throat> so, so I was going to bring up, I guess, this a little bit more meta, and maybe we will or will not talk about it next week. But, um, what do you think the consequences of this game being well loved and well received are going to be exactly? Dead Space Four. Fingers crossed, Dead we Space get a 4. good Dead Space yeah. Four. Yeah, you, you guys next, definitely think, going with that timeline because be... a lot of people speculate like no, Dead Space Two not. remake. So, yeah, that's what, what I, I was so, about to say, actually, yeah. Here's I the thing. I, Space I, think that, I think that what this game will have is what Metroid Samus Returns had, where it's like, you did a really good job remaking 2, now go make a new game. Um, I think it will be the same thing here, that this has been well-received. It <clears> seems <throat> like there's a lot of hype, so hopefully it sells well. Mm. Um, and then I imagine that they'll just be like, and, we don't need oh, to remake wait, someone, we'll so, And I forward. feel someone like said, 2 is modern enough well, to yeah, where... But, I, I, to, yeah. So I just wanted to on record, right? Because like some people say, like two doesn't need a remake. It's like, okay, so I think one is fucking excellent. Yeah, it one's really good. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Um, um, it, it would. I think it's more so a matter of what is. Is this like a proof that they can make a Dead Space game? I think. And well, is the consequence of that throw your hat in with like Dead Space Two, or no, you know what? Now you get an opportunity to make something totally new. Do you think maybe that they consider Dead Space Two remake to be a more reliable thing to produce and sell versus a Dead Space I think Four? That, maybe. I think the Dead Space Four would be something that would be, be considered more reliable. Actually, I'm not I, sure. I think, 
I would jump well, on the Dead Space Four. No, no. Oh, I think I would too. It's just the. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna compare it against uh, the the uh, Mercury Steam and with uh, Metroid. It's like what seems like a better idea doing like a remake of Metroid Fusion, which I think was what was speculated by a lot of people, or making a new Metroid. It's like, I don't know, man, new is like, people like new, to, mm -hmm. of like something that they, you know, like already. I think well, maybe that's I'm, definitely... Um, a way to prove your point would be, what sells better, the Resident Evil remakes or the Resident Evil current iteration? I think Resident Evil, I'm not sure, eight actually. Sold more, I, uh, didn't I think 8 sold better than the remakes. Because if that, that, that'd be a way to prove maybe that they should commit to a Dead Space 4. Well, um, so I guess the relevant part are... would be if you wanted to if you want to do Dead Space 4, the challenge is how do we wind back the stakes from what we had in three? It's kind of tricky. Whereas it might be easier if you remake two and then you just remake three but make it totally different, right? Like you try to keep it more in, in line with what Dead Space One and kind of to a lesser extent two we're trying to be. Because I'm wondering I... I I'd love to listen to what they have to say now as developers slash whoever's gonna be uh making these decisions, I guess. But the um, remaking 2 and f even tweaking the plot lines so that they could then make a Dead Space 3 that isn't totally different. Dead Space yeah, 3. Just yeah, just almost turn it into a reboot series instead of treating it like a remake. It's like, you know what? Actually, this will be a reboot. Yeah, uh, I could see that being an idea, that's of course. Possibility too. It's, yeah. yeah, I can see them going a number of directions. I think it's more likely they'd make a 4 instead of 2. Um, I also think it's not unreasonable that they would make a dead space game that just isn't about isaac clark um because the universe owes itself very well to telling all kinds of different stories and being in all mm. sorts of different places um so i'm not know, sure they have that, a lot of options do you think though that they think of isaac clark as like a necessary component to sell the game as i well? think they think they that. might yeah i think yeah. that's not unreasonable at all uh, like, like which is why say, i like... think a dead space 4 is the most likely thing and it's kind of what i hope they do i hope that we get like the series like wrapped up proper you know hmm. i want to see what they would do like if they take it from here on some of the choices that they made in terms of changes like um something that we'll probably talk about a bit more like just the simple idea of Here's a control panel. There are three options, but you only... There are three possibilities, but you only have two... Uh, well, I think you should frame it a bit more frame. clearly. I think a lot of people oh, might not know what you're talking about. You're, you're like moving through an area, and then you reach a control panel that this redirects the power. Space remake. <laughs> yeah, in the remake. It wasn't in the original. And it like redirects power. And so it might be like, there is a critical thing that I need power for in order to complete my objective. But in order to do that... I need to either choose to remove power to the lighting system or the air support system. That's the one that I encountered. And that's like, that's just like a great idea of presenting the player with a choice of what is the handicap, like what what is the problem that you want to deal with here? Do you want to deal with not being able to see or do you want to deal with not being able to breathe? And players will make different choices based on what personally scares them. But also those choices will change depending on the resources that they have at their disposal. Like, maybe if you have lots of ammo, you'd rather make one choice than the other. Or maybe if you feel confident, like, that you know the lay of the land well enough. Like, it's just, that's just a cool new thing that they tried. Is, yeah. That I think is really neat. And it would be interesting to see what other sorts of decisions they would make if they, if instead of on the Ishimura, we went back to a space station like the Sprawl, you know? Or, uh, or like a, a colony, maybe. Like, what yeah, kind of choices they would make. Yeah, the ability to sort of semi-tailor your, like, you have to, that, it's such a small thing. But it's awesome, uh, but man, the, to uh, give people that choice. Yeah, just like, oh, you need this door open. You got to pull the power from the lights, or you got to pull the power from oxygen. So yep. when you're going to this door, do you want to do it in the dark and have all the time you need? Or you could see, but you're on a timer now. That's right. That's Both really of those cool are... Idea. It's an interesting thing that I really, really appreciate, and I like. And it kind of made me that. double take the first time that I did it, because I was like, oh, wait, they're giving me a choice. Like, I can choose yeah. which way I want to tackle this little part of the map. Like, oh, like, I really thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and also, I guess, uh, oh, sorry, go for it. Well, no, wait, you go first. My thing's a little bit different. Well, I was going to talk about the speed of the game now. Oh. So what the fuck? My phone just made a noise. Leave me alone. Um, uh, uh, well, I was going to say pitch for Dead Space 4. What if, after the events of the first three games, you know, eventually Kendra's sister... Found mm. out about all of it. Kills Isaac with a golf club, and then we play as her for the rest of the no. game. Oh, nice. 
I was thinking it could be kind of revolutionary, and it could be about how we can come to like her, even though she 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 um she clubbed our guy to death. You know, what about that? Is it a plasma golf club? And then Isaac's surrogate daughter has a chance to kill her, but doesn't. Oh, I think I. I'm sorry. Bola. I think I made this joke in my stream. I accidentally called it the plasma putter. So I think <laughs> plasma I putter. Like, oh, yeah. plasma, plasma putter. putter. That's great. I like that. Putter to beat him to death. It's, <laughs> it's just a golf club, but like the handle is a laser for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what I was going to say in terms of the speed, re replaying Dead Space One, it's like this is a pretty, it's pretty slow, right? Like um, mm. Isaac moves pretty slow, but the Necromorphs also move pretty slow. Yes. It's like a level of uh, a level of almost restricted control. And in all the gameplay that you see for like the remake, it's like, man, Isaac is like way faster and snappier to control. And yeah. I think at first I was worried that it would make it easier, but the necromorphs are way faster. Oh, they're so, like, on I'm your actually ass. Kind of they are I'm finding on your ass. Constantly. It took me, I have to bad. like unlearn Dead Space Classic <laughs> to play this yeah. properly. I was I was getting hit so much because I was like, oh, they're over there. They can't get me yet. And then it'd be like, way and I'd be like, oh, fuck. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They got yeah. me. Also, I think they, yeah. they take a couple of more hits than in the original. Well, one. so not only do I think they take more hits, I think they get you get more ammo in this than I in have the original. So much ammo currently, and I'm on hard. Uh, I think I have like over a hundred. Dude, I was accidentally on medium for the first hour, and I was like, <laughs> I, I was heard about bleeding that. I ammo. That, yeah. I was just, and someone was like, "I think you're on medium." And I was like, "Ah, oh, gross! Get me out of here! I need to go on hard." <laughs> Jesus! Did you, did, you, did you end up restarting now, or? Well, I I said to the stream like I don't want to have to replay the first hour all over again when I'm not gonna be streaming yeah, for that I... long anyway. Yeah, I heard that. I don't know if you maybe did it offline. If it uh, if it prevents me from getting achievements or whatever, I plan to try and do it on Impossible off stream anyway. So, yeah, I'll I think, I think the achievements are mostly just uh, finish it on every difficulty. The chapter, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on hard. I still I still feel like I have a, a shit ton of ammo. At least playing only with the plasma cutter right now. Uh, I'm quite curious how uh, they balance everything in terms of rewards, if you can switch up difficulty. I've always understood switching down is mostly makes sense, but, you know, mm. I wonder if, like, if I ran it on medium for the whole game except the last chapter and then moved it to hard, does that really count as me beating that last level on hard, really? Mm, yeah, All the resources yeah. I'd have, but I don't know. There's a lot of questions like that I'd, I'd have for this game, because I'm not yeah. as familiar with it as I am with the original. Something I love, part of why I love to replay Dead Space 1 is I love how it's balanced. This goes for Resident Evil 4 as well, by the way. There's a lot of games this applies to. I just love playing it, because I feel like my efforts to conserve ammo and become like hyper-powerful as a result, it, 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 it feel, I never feel like um, I'm exploiting the game. I feel like I'm working for my power. Uh, yeah, if you, if you go in the first couple of chapters, it's like I'm just gonna sell all my ammo and all my health packs because I can I can just kind of get through without them. But for this, I get like already the fully upgraded plasma cutter or like fully upgraded damage or whatever you go for first, mm -hmm. and then you kill them in like three shots because you you made that sacrifice in the beginning. It's like yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I think there's a lot of ways you can play Dead Space, uh, in general. Well, yeah, I mean, we, you and I have felt that we get a full, fun experience with just the plasma cutter, but we we do need to go experiment with the other weapons because they change everything about a lot of how you'll approach lots of different scenarios. Yeah. I mean, I think they changed a lot of the weapons uh, <clears throat> in this one. Uh, all the other weapons, I think there's like a lot of Some new of the weapons things. Are, they definitely are different. Like the pulse rifles, yeah. <laughs> alt fire is mm -hmm. um, has a point now. Uh, uh, there is. What, wasn't um, in the OG see. you kind of just do like a a, a circle you, and shoot. You or like something? Sh you you pointed it in the air and like the barrel spun around and hurt all the enemies around you. But it was so it was it was always a meme. So they changed <laughs> it to where it's a it's a proximity grenade that it oh, puts on the ground and uh, you can retrieve good. it. And uh, you, you can get your ammo back if it doesn't go off. So Wait, how does that work? Does that cost you bullets, or does it cost? It costs it costs twenty five ammunition to shoot a proximity mine, and if you look at it and press spacebar, then it'll just turn it into a pile of twenty five rounds you could pick back up. Cool. So okay. refundable. That's nice. Um, See, this is something I wouldn't even have known until my second playthrough because I'm avoiding. Yeah, same. It. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna experiment. The flamethrower shoots a like a little a line of fire on the ground. Uh, as it's alt fire, the contact beam does instead of a continuous damage beam, it has like a charged up shot that shoots all at once. Plasma cutter, of course, rotates the cutting angle. Um, I think the ripper it shoots the blade yeah. forwards. Yeah, and it just shoots it out like a projectile, mm -hmm. which is bitching in certain circumstances. 
I yeah, remember no, liking I the Ripper uh, in terms of the. But to be honest with you, they just it's just a well made game, and they all have their uses. Yeah, I'm finding myself really sort of because I, I know I'll play this through multiple times uh, for years to come, so I'm not feeling too pressured to mm -hmm. um, you know try everything or stick with out. something. Yeah, so I'm I'm carrying around four guns. I'm using them all a decent amount and kind of enjoying how they all work. None of them feel like they are worth discarding. So that's that's pretty good. That's kind of when you know balance feels about right, when you don't feel like they're obvious choices and that some oh, weapons okay. are just not worth having. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't even picked up any of the weapons I saw. I was like, I want the achievement for an only plasma cutter. I don't know how they count it. <laughs> just leave them on the ground. Yeah, I mentioned that when I picked it up. I was like, I'm not going to use it, I guess. I'll just put I it in my I picked it up storage. and I was like, I don't trust your game. I'm going to reload <laughs> and just go went past it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to experiment with those in the second playthrough. Um, it, there's loads of changes, uh, as we've been mentioning them. And I was just reminded of yeah. one now from this footage, but... This place I remember very well from the original, and you go through it, and on your way back, the the way is blocked. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, "Wait, what do I?" And then, and then I just slowly <laughs> look up, and I'm like, "Oh, yeah. do I do I do that?" And then I stood up, and I was like, "Oh, that's so cool!" And I'm gonna fly yeah. over the area and come back down. It's like, you like the, the they don't G have to do stuff like that, but they did, and that's really cool. Zero, G <laughs> Zero gravity <laughs> sections are way, 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 way better now. I just said Jiro Z, and no one picked it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I really like the flying around. It's like you have a little Iron Man suit and just get to fly around with it. <laughs> well, of course, that's that's the upgrade from DS1 to DS2 that I really liked anyway, right? And then mm. yeah. DS3, you get to go around in like actual space. Um, you know, sort of freeform visiting ship to ship or like rescue vessels, whatever. Um Dead Space is just a fucking cool IP, yeah. and it's kind of neat that this may very well resurrect it. Uh, yeah. Yes, fingers crossed. I really Please. hope that it does. I said before, I'll say again. Great. There's no yeah. reason this shouldn't get a TV show adaptation slash movie adaptation, and if you give it to the right people, oh, you know be they're doing great. the Tomb Raider one, right? That's the recent announcement. Netflix. Well, that's another or, one that oh, no, could Amazon work, Prime but it depends who's yeah. writing and directing. Of course, HBD Wall of yeah. Bridge, I think, is writing it. Well, never mind. Well, doesn't she have, like, a show that is super, like, acclaimed? Or, I don't know. I, I don't know anything about her. <laughs> I know that she's in the new Indiana hey, Jones. Well, I'll put it this way. We'll give it a chance, as we will give all of the ones that are coming a chance. Um, sure. Sure. But, chat, you know how it goes. <laughs> We're never lucky enough to have them all be good. No. Well, hopefully God of War is good. Well, that's the thing, right? If you could guarantee Bioshock, Gears of War, God of War, Tomb Raider, or let's for the sake of the argument say Dead Space, all of them get a TV show, which would you, if you could spend, let's say, two tokens to save two of them and three of them have to go, what are you choosing? So Dead Space, God of War, Gears of War, that. Tomb Raider, and Bioshock. And oh, I guess it was safe home, damn. Like, okay, yeah, now... Because I get rid of Gears of War and Tomb Actually, Raider. Actually, fuck it. I sh what I should um, say is put them in order of saving to least saving. Uh, uh I think I probably... <laughs> I assume that I'm all of sure. our top twos here are Dead Space and Bioshock. So funnily well, enough, I, I think... I'm not sure. I think my number one might be Bioshock. Uh... My love for that game is is incredible. If it got a no. really good TV show adaptation, I could imagine falling in fucking love with that so hard. Problem is, of course, it's like, wait, not God of War? And I'm like, oh. Well, you already kind of have, like, that's the thing. Like, God of War, in its current state, it's so cinematic and everything. Yeah, but and I... It's, I, you know, it's, I it's like, you know, the old God of War, that? right? Essentially, you could redo the old God of War with more uh, depth. Oh, yeah, well, if, if we get to customize everything, then yes. Um, mm -hmm. And, of course, I just want to, worth saying, I don't want to see a bad TV show for fucking any of these IPs. It's going to be oh, of course, lame. Sorry. Because, yeah. you know, it, let's say Halo was in the best state ever with all of its games. That doesn't make the TV show any less painful, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, no, it doesn't. So, yeah. <sighs> this question's annoying me, actually, because I'm not sure how I can answer this. <laughs> I think I'm going to put... I think I'm going to put Dead Space as my most wanted. What would be... Um, what, what is the reason, do you think? What's your brain telling you? 
I think the setting and how all of the characters sort of handle the type of things that happen in terms of the symptoms of the marker, um, the EarthGov conspiracy stuff, the unitology characters, and how all of them could sort of interact with a plot and how they deal with it. And plus just the the introduction of, you know, a, a, a believably presented future for humanity. And I, I just think it all just gels in a way that I really want to see. And I would think I'd I'd put it as my number one. Um and plus it'd be nice to have like a legitimately pretty like spooky show as well. Mm. Um but I think Bioshock's my number two and it's a pretty close number two. Um so it, it's 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 tough to say. I might if you ask me tomorrow I might change my mind but i mean they're really sort of neck and neck but i think i give dead space uh, my but, top slot out of curiosity is everyone's lowest slot here gonna be tomb raider yes yeah. so <laughs> it's it for me uh, just actually no i, I might like... put tomb raider above gears of war i don't give a shit about gears of war story well here's the thing i just played gears of war mutually and i think the universe is really fucking cool and um, I, I think that the tomb raider nice of it I, I think I get what you mean, but like about Tom Tomb Raider, I think. Yeah, but I, just imagine, like, if you had a Tomb Raider show where, like, each season was the whole adventure of like doing the going on the little archaeology, you know, like don't the, know, going not, on that adventure. And for some reason, because I almost disagree with myself for having this thought, but I'm having it. <laughs> it's a. Uh, I feel like I've seen that already. Meanwhile, a Gears of War TV show sounds like it'd be really cool and interesting. Pretty unique, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, well, I mean, yeah, Tomb Raider fills in a slot that is more archetypical than all of these other things. Um, and maybe it's because there's also been multiple attempts at Tomb Raider external media, and it's just like... At least three yeah, movies. Three movies. Um, it's like, man. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Do, yeah, do, I guess I just don't really care having, nearly as much. The thought of having, like, a serious version of those... Of God of War... Uh, God of War. Gears of War 1, 2, and 3. That's, like, more more focused and being a bit more serious. That sounds really fucking cool to me. Well, that's kind of like baked like into the premise, right? The, show, right? Like... Whichever one you put at number one is going to be a show you'll probably fucking adore and everyone thinks is amazing. And yeah. which, which IP do you want to get that sort of thing? Yeah, at that well, point, it's just is... personal preference, I, I would say, right? Or encouragement can... to make a, more a games. Space show could be IP. so cool. I, I can't think of anything that would be a show that's like Dead Space. Um... That's kind of that's kind of my thing. It's kind of the same reason why I'd be really interested in like, even though Metroid, the story as told and presented in those games, doesn't seem conducive to like television or film at all. Like, I feel like you could you could make something in that tone and it would be super unique. Like, if you even just had a movie that was like Samus on her own for a long time, yeah, yeah. just exploring places, that it could be really uh, unconventional. And I feel like Dead Space, the same thing, right? Like, I don't know if the first season of Dead Space would just be Isaac on the Ishimura the whole time, but maybe it is, and maybe that's cool. Maybe, mm. like, you have it that he encounters people in his uh, travels, you know, and tries to help them, and it oh. all keeps going wrong. Someone said Pandorum, look it up. Uh, as someone who's seen Pandorum, I would never tell Fringy and Rags to watch that as a sort of an adaptation, at least in I part, only know of, of that movie. Oh, doing Dead Space. Uh, Pandorum's interesting. But what it ain't a, it ain't what you're looking for. What is Pandorum? <laughs> like, what is that? It's like a dead space. Age it's a movie. What's... It's a sci-fi where they wake up on a ship that's overcome by mysterious, horrible things, uh, oh, okay. including monsters and catast catastrophes. It's big old twists in the story. But uh, I remember it being a cool movie. Not sure I'd call it a good movie. Okay. Um, right. I need to see it again for that. But because I completely agree with you that uh, a, I say I say this word as if it means something specific, but a perfectly adapted Dead Space game into a TV show would be something to remarkable, I think. But I honestly would say I don't see it being any less or more remarkable than a Bioshock uh, one as well. A Especially Bioshock if we did... So cool. Imagine, like, season one of Bioshock is functioning Rapture as well. Yeah, and then it ends Ooh. with, like, the beginning of the end where everything's... Well, you, oh, yeah, God. It's Imagine slow... the fan service. Like, the, the final thing that happens in the final episode is some reference to... Uh, the plane, or you know, just, uh, there's yeah. so many things you can make people go nuts with. Man, oh yeah, all the these ideas right now. It's like, you know what? I want to plane. Want to see them all? <laughs> that sounds pretty cool, actually. And the one well, thing, <laughs> and maybe this is a bit unfair, but the one thing about it that pushes me more to Bioshock is that I I consider the roster of characters to be so much more interesting, even though I like a lot of the ones in Dead Space. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's fair. I mean, Andrew yeah, Ryan, obviously, like you know. I'd love to Both see Steinman and Cohen and just, just, oh god, I already, my brain is starting to be like, do a fun casting thing, who would you get? I'm just like, no brain. 
<laughs> we're gonna get disappointed with the Bioshock it's show. It's, we're gonna get disappointed. I know it. Uh. So yeah, uh, Rip you know, Tomb Raider. One thing, one thing that annoys me in Dead Space that I, it's just a tiny thing. It doesn't use the smallest health item automatically anymore. I think it uses the one that is closest to the top left That's, of the inventory. That, when you said that, and because uh, you you mentioned it to me, I was like, oh shit, that actually makes sense because I remember my health going up when I tried to use yeah. it straight up uh, more than I expected it to, and I was like, wait, what? Oh, like, shit. Uh, because yeah. um, um, at the very fucking least, that should be settable, right? Automatically use the most or just the smallest. You know, some something. Yeah. It was nice. Like, oh, I know I have like three small ones. So I can just go bloop, bloop, bloop. And then now I have uh, just over half health. I don't need to use my big one. But use like my large one, the only one I had, just automatically. I was like, why did you do that? I wanted to keep that for later. <laughs> Damn. Um, I saw someone mention as well, uh, it's frustrating that they have like warning gore ahead or, or explicit scene coming up or something like that. Um, but you Wait, can turn those off. And I think option. James said that was off by default. So it's, you know, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, fine with me if it's like that. that. <laughs> I mean, you know, because like, yeah, I, I mean, there's going to be people who want to be able to look away before they see something horrifying. This isn't a game I would suggest they play if they're that kind of person, but hey. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, maybe you want to play something else. Um, uh, I didn't even know there was a thing they have in the game. I was. I remember being told about, it, and I, about it. I checked yeah, the options yeah. before going in to make sure it wasn't on because I do not fucking want warnings for when I'm going to see gory things. Please. No, I want to experience it. I can't imagine that being anything but frustrating. It's like warning: you are mm -hmm. about to see Hammond get torn in half, and you're like, stop! No spoilers! What the hell? Bumblers. <laughs> Um, but yeah, of course, there's so much we haven't talked about, and you know what? There's so yeah. much we haven't experienced, because a lot of us are going to try and get this game completed before next Saturday. Yes. I'm afraid Metal will not be able to join us, but we'll try and grab some gamers, yeah. TM, to discuss... But don't you, don't you worry, I'll cover it on the Forge. Forge. Forge, Forge. Are you going to try and do it on Impossibrew difficulty, Metal? Uh, I probably won't be able to do it before the forge i'll probably give it a go at some point might be fun for a stream actually is it you get uh, one save i i haven't checked it out yet i only I know what you thoughts. said during your stream that might be like the thing where you have only two or three saves or something oh, you mean time of death, like for the uh for i can't I, I can't remember the rules exactly i'd have to read them up again yeah i mean i don't know the the, the whole Limited saves, I don't know, it's very unappealing to me. I don't know, it just sounds very annoying. Well, it's not my favorite kind of uh, uh, cranking difficulty, not at all. Yeah. <sighs> hey, Mark the Cyborg. Mark, check your Discord. I messaged you like ages ago. Check your Discord, <laughs> idiot. Also, we'll be grabbing you for the EFAB <laughs> as well, Mark. <laughs> Pending invite. <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, I already I, know I you've been playing to, it, so I'll just drag you. I tried in. to invite you for the Forge like two weeks ago, and you never messaged me back, you bastard. I'm sorry, that was mean. But Wait, has X Ray Girl played uh, <laughs> the game as well? Because, I mean, if she wants to, she could jump on with you if you want. Yeah. I also tried to invite me to my birthday, Mark. You can Ooh, invite for that as well, but it's like, oh, I'm not going to check my Discord. Okay, enough shitting on Mark, sorry. <laughs> Same difficulty is hard, just a save. And so that's a save you can spend at any one moment, I guess. It's not reassuring, is it? Uh, wait, was no, that I... one one save? I think that's what I read up, and that's what's... Uh, yes, chance, you, so. there's no auto-saves, and you get to have one save uh, in the game. So, I mean, so that means, like, like the halfway point or wherever you want, you can have your save to go back to, then you have to complete the game. Yeah. What do you think about so, that, Rags? I think it's interesting. Um, I like with many games. I do my first playthrough on the normal difficulty, and then I go more. I'll be playing this through on hard after normal and trying to sort of compare them, see how they uh, match up. Because um, I'll be playing this game a lot. I already know that. As for how I feel about it, I'm not sure. I haven't died yet. Um, the I think the game is. I'm still kind of learning it, so it's a, it's somewhat difficult to say, but I don't think that it will be that difficult. I'm trying to think of... The thing you have to worry about in games like that, because I have done... I beat Dead Space 1, the original, on Impossible Mode. I did beat Dead Space 2 on its hardcore mode. 
and the things you, you watch out for are those instant death mechanics where you're like, oh, you got you weren't in cover, so the asteroid just killed you. You know, it, you weren't really afraid of fighting enemies so much because generally at that point you're good enough at the game to where you're yeah, really good you at fighting enemies. It's those instant death sort of things that you really have to watch out for. And I don't think there's been any yet. Um, well, which... James, James saying it's you can save multiple times, but it's only one slot. I'm a little bit confused. Isn't that normal that you'd as have? As far as I, as far as I know, the impossible mode in Dead Space the remake is it is at hard difficulty level, but there are no auto saves, and you can only have one save, which means that you have to essentially play the game without dying, or if you die, you revert to wherever that save was. Uh, so basically, you have to complete the game without dying, but you get to choose one checkpoint that you'll revert to if you die. So oh, no. I didn't mean yeah. isn't that normal difficulty? I mean, isn't it normal to have one? That's not directed yeah, at no, you, by mean... the way, Rags. Because uh, I'm I'm getting very confused with what James is saying. Basically, <laughs> like, I'm not. I'm not sure. He's like, it's not only one save; it's just one slot. I don't understand. Because. You know, like, when you say it's only one slot, what will be achieved by preventing you from being able to move to a different slot anyway, you know, in terms of difficulty? Yeah, I think they just misunderstood it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of... I'm not, really, I'm, I'm not really thinking about where the save would be at the moment right now. No, I'm, of course. Especially because I'm not certain how long the game is, and I don't know if I'm going to hit a section where I really need to... Like, again, is there going to be a segment where... I need to um, be aware of is a, a potential hazard zone for the game ending or a very, very particular sequence of fighting necromorphs, something like that. I'm, I'm not sure yet. Depending on how many of those I run into, it might change my opinion, but right now I don't think it'll be that difficult. Because um, he's, I... he's saying he's saved multiple times and maintained the impossible difficulty, so if it is multiple times, I'll, I'll happily engage with that. Impossible mode specifically says it's on hard difficulty. Um, the only thing that makes it harder than hard is that if you die, you either go back to the beginning of the game or, to your, or your checkpoint if you've used it. Okay, well, that sounds like the kind of difficulty which I'm is not like, too enticed by. But uh, which is likewise. which is kind of like uh, like what hardcore was in Dead Space Two, where it actually doesn't play any different than a normal game if you're if you don't die right it's the fear of if you die then you go all the well, way so back. funnily enough what you just laid out as to is part of what i find so frustrating about the mode there are insta kill things that can happen that sometimes mm. don't even feel remotely fair and so it's just like i don't want to put that much time in just to go oh yeah thanks that's the thing and because right now i don't think there are any um yeah i might be mistaken and i just haven't had them happen to me um but uh, right now, I don't feel like there's any like I wouldn't again it, if I if, if assuming I was halfway through the game right now, I'm not even certain I would use that checkpoint yet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel very confident in my ability to do it. And I think that the game gives you a lot of options in terms of, you know, the weapons and how they work. And of course, your kinesis module and, you know, stasis and stuff and the way that the upgrade paths function. But I need to learn the game more. I need to see which weapons I would go for, which ones I would not use. I want to see what the, you know, kind of the upgrade paths are worth getting. I need to see what the best, um, the weapon upgrades would be, you know, worthy of purchasing. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, but I'll know more when I finish the game, obviously, come uh, Saturday. Yeah. Um, anything else you'd want to mention about the game first impressions wise? Um, without, not without getting into too much detail. There's some things yeah. I could mention, but I'll probably save it for next week. Uh, generally though, my thoughts are very positive. I'm really enjoying it. It is, um, an excellent remake so far. Very happy. Very happy. Yeah, same. I'm, I'm having a pretty good time and look forward to stream it as well because it's, uh, it's actually weird playing a new game that I'm about to cover and not streaming it. 
it's been a while since that happened. Actually, it feels kind of weird just sitting here on my own, not talking well, to anyone. It's funny because <laughs> I find games so much more difficult to cover that there is so much stuff to go over, so many yeah. levels of production, so many things to appreciate, and so many things that change across difficulties as well as we've just kind of gone over. Films are much more straightforward, <laughs> even though there's a yeah. shit total. Like, Pinocchio is a good example. There's so much to appreciate about that, well beyond just storytelling. But that is a lot of the time what we focus on. But hey, you know, there'll be interesting things to talk about in terms of the story of Dead Space. And from what I have been told by people who are fans, uh, they've made tweaks to the story um, that improve continuity, uh, from what I have heard. Don't want to make too many harsh claims on that. We'll have to wait until next week when they're more familiar. That's what everyone says. Yeah. Um, I think it's funny as well. One of the newer Super Chats says, Y'all haven't seen Coraline or Pan's Labyrinth. What are you doing? I am fixing them, okay? Give me time. Gradually Wait, what are you fixing? installing Coraline and Pan's Labyrinth into They'll these wonderful hard drives that are humans. Um, but yeah, okay. Well, like I said, we'll, we'll talk more about Dead Space next week. But for now, that'll probably happily sum it up. Um, I was going to say we could talk about Bullet Train, but I'm... Um, that was only going to be a, like a suggestion because the problem is I'm not sure how exactly I, I want to go about uh, talking about it. And then I was thinking to myself like maybe Fringy and Rag should see it and then we could talk about it or uh, we'll sort of just throw it out as it was it was going to be but not so much. Um, but you got a forge on it, right, Mel? If they want to hear. I, I, d I did uh, do a forge on it, yeah. Uh, was that a, a solo uh, or a guest? I think that w I was on my own on that one. Uh, you know what? Let me check. It's been a couple of months. Um, but yeah well uh, what I, um, was... I was told about it from Drinker and it's something I completely echo is uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson's in it and I was like eh because I find him to be eh in almost everything I see probably my favorite performance from him ever and I think he's my favorite character in the film mm -hmm. that'd be it uh... was me alone only me it was five months ago well, it was a long time ago <clears throat> Bullet Train is stupid yeah, yeah. it yeah. is a very silly movie but i really really enjoyed it i had a lot of fun uh, with it i think it's it's, it's a very fun movie uh, uh yeah it's insane and it knows it's insane it does a lot of crazy yeah shit. That, that's what uh that, what works in its benefit it makes it pretty clear it's like you're gonna be here for some insane things uh there's no real life physics that's gonna uh interfere one is filled with, the, with the thing hyper do. contrivances like oh, uh massively yeah Ones that they, they know in universe are so fucking insane, but, you know, they're doing it because they're like, wouldn't it be funny, though, if this happened? And you're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. I think this is one of the forges where in hindsight it's like, this actually doesn't, wasn't that interesting to cover because it's just like, yeah, you're going to watch it, you're going to have fun, but there's not a lot to gain from it in terms of conversation, I think. Um, would you recommend it? I would recommend it. Yeah, I think it's a really fun movie. It's definitely it's one of those movies if you if you have like friends over or something and you just have some beers, some 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 brewskis, and just want to put something on. That's that's something you want to go for. Yeah, I would guarantee you'll get at least one laugh out of the film, right? At yeah, it's, it's really fun. It's a uh, pretty pretty fun stuff. Um, at least one laugh. That's way more than Velma. Yeah, I know, right. A billion times yeah, more. It, as someone just said, said the, the the film is aware of its own absurdity, especially in the end, the way it just ends is like, oh yeah, you now you should all be dead, but you you, you aren't. <laughs> and also, shit tons of famous people. Yeah, or of course Brad Pitt, of course. Uh, let me see, I'm bad with actors, so I need to check. Uh, uh, do, 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 do. IMDb, help me, because my brain is bad. Uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Sandra Bullock, 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 Sandra Bullock, Bullock. I never said her name out loud. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, you got Bad Bunny as like the some some Mexican cartel guy. It was kind of funny. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. What does he scream five dollars a month or something like in there? In that movie? Oh, you don't know the reference? No, I'm. Mm -mm. 
you don't know the yeah you do right five dollars a month you know you know oh, that wait. reference right? oh no i'm not no wait bad bunny no i know i know i know i'm, I'm memeing i forgot that <laughs> also called something with bunny okay yeah okay we're, we're on the same same boat yeah, yeah that's right now we're on the same page dollars. yeah of course no i i mean that i still meme that to shit on my streams <laughs> it's funny man <laughs> yeah it is pretty funny <laughs> um uh yeah bull train super fun uh go watch it it's 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 pretty straightforward it's nice action uh the way that it's absurd it's fun it's i, I really like it i'm probably gonna rewatch it a bunch of times in my in my years of life oh it's, uh, it's it's fun stuff fun stuff well but there's nothing there's nothing that there's not nothing crazy to really talk about except maybe the crazy action scenes that happens like at some point the uh the one Australian guy jumps onto the moving train and punches in the glass, which is crazy. Oh, Australian guy. Wasn't he an Australian guy? The 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 uh, the lanky one. Who gets I, I, left I think behind? they were both English. Oh, fine, whatever. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, five buttons, leave me alone. Uh, so what, what I was going to say is that um. The thing about this was we had a selection of things that were going to take us up to around four hours, and it looks like we've already reached it. I actually expected us to take about a half hour on each topic. <laughs> um, that was yeah, that didn't never works out that way. Even though we were pretty fast today, you know, that was pretty. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Thing, you know? Yeah, big fast. Um, and uh, we are actually, uh, as you would have noticed with the, I think, eight and a half hour to nine hour catch up thing we released, uh, we are actually getting there. And today's ones will be caught up with as well as there's only, I think, two more EFAPs worth of us catching up to do. So we'll finally actually be caught up soon enough. It's just a matter of, it's difficult sometimes to get me free and rags all available at the same time for a selection of hours. That's why they get stitched up as well, mm -hmm. so that we can... Like lemon, but yes, we are gonna. It is a short man, I suppose. Four hours, oh, you know. Four hours. Shameful. Come on. Four hours. <laughs> um, but hey, I I think this was fun. I imagine people uh, may request something like this in future. It's like, hey, cover multiple mm. movies per stream. It's it's better, and you can form of recommendations. And I think mm. I see a lot of people being like, it's so nice that you praise two movies extensively. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> we broke a lot of records today in terms of things that we don't typically do, but. Next week, hopefully, we're mostly going to be praising a video game. So that'll be different, too. And, of course, you bastards are getting a weekly mini in the form of The Last of Us TV show. Which is funny, right? Because it's barely been mentioned on, like, the mainline episodes. Because I think that's pretty much what's going to happen. We're probably going to keep all talk related to it in those minis. It's going to be its own series i guess that's confirmation too some of you are wondering if we we're going to do the whole thing for that it's like yes we're not carrying on with velma as much as all of you wanted no, us to we're not carrying on with velma. i i will watch jay longbone suffer through it maybe <laughs> but like i i don't want to see any more velma it's uh it's a difficult show to watch um, it it looked pretty painful. I watched the premiere. I was like, Jesus Christ! It's I'm... bad. It's it's. You really know how happy and... it was. Not really the first time. I was like, man, I'm so glad I wasn't around when you guys just gathered around randomly. <laughs> so I didn't. Well, yeah. Um, uh, As said, he needed me to see it for real BBC, and then I was just like, well, you're here. Let's watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh. Damn it. <laughs> um, quite a few people wanting to continue Velma. I know. I yeah. know. <laughs> like, People are telling me when I stream, it's like, you're going to do I don't it, care. Or it's like, I don't care, no. damn it. You can't make me, god damn it. <laughs> you can't make oh, me. Oh, legit would have to pay you, I think, at this point, which uh, is fair. Uh, it's a difficult <laughs> thing. I don't know if I'd it's even a show... do it. Oh. Yeah, like, there, we, you guys saw the edited version. There were large swaths where we just oh, sort silence. of were, yeah, we were just quiet, because <laughs> I think... I think it was either brain damage or something. Oh, oh yeah, and, and <laughs> I chopped out a decent portion of just the exact same criticisms over and over again because it was it's just the same problem constantly. Yeah, like men suck, white people suck. Isn't this one meta thing really shit that I, mean, I pointed out? I mean, gross stuff. Look, grossness. Isn't that gross? Like, yeah, okay. it's, it's very um, very predictable. There's not a lot of variety in what's happening. Not funny in any way. Oh, and as has been mentioned, Disparu like, and Lil Platoon, they're both tackling it. Good luck to them. I hope they survive. They come out okay. <laughs> yeah. 
I've seen them on my timeline. I was like, do I want to watch? I don't want to know anything about it. But then I clicked on it and just had it on the side. It's like, man, this show's bad. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know. Oh, gross. No one should have to watch it. Anyway. <laughs> just um, nasty. Well, well uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times this stream, but yes, Metal, you're still doing them forges. I believe oh. your channel is in the description. I don't know how it manages oh. to run away from oh. it all the time. Oh my but, god, um, it actually survived this Someone time. paid just someone. Seeing it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. you'll be running a Dead Space one next? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that's going to be on, I think, Thursday? It's February this February the 2nd? Yeah, it's Thursday. Uh, I'm going to do the Forge then, because on that weekend I have a friend over, because it's uh, the weekend of my birthday. So wow. I'm going to be, be just chilling out with him. Uh, of course, there's going to be a birthday stream. Uh, my friend was still going to be here, but he's just going to join for the Gartic phone shenanigans. So that's going to be a good time. That's February the fifth on a Sunday. Uh, mm. So yeah, if you, if you if you are if you're craving another Gartic phone stream, that's coming up, and all of us here are going to be there, unless someone is <sighs> going to say no at the last second, which would be well, very sad. Like I've told you, I will be yeah in all of it that doesn't cross over with catch up duties. Exactly. So you, you, you have your Drankelheimers and then you can just join after. That's that's yes. perfectly fine. Uh, and yeah, the, 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 there's a forge for you to see for Puss in Boots, Pinocchio. That's the last two weeks. I did Pinocchio yesterday with Fringy and Meme. That was good stuff. Uh, I did Bullet Train on my own ages ago. So if you want to see that, go go watch that. And yeah, I, I basically have the the... The forges for the next couple of weeks and months, they're already planned out. Like it's on my whiteboard. I'm going I'm going hard, boys, okay? So I guess. you better go do a little subscribleton. Or I'll beat you up. I'll find every single one of you and beat you up, and then I'll steal your phone and subscribe myself. Probably some kind of breach of something that you just said that, you know. <laughs> uh not if you tell anyone. <laughs> but you too no, come I'm, to you and be like, uh, Oh, it's just just a prank, bro. This was just a prango. No, I'm I'm uh I'm gonna gonna be putting a lot of work in this year, like even more than last year. I'm uh I'm committing. Um I wanna wanna do things. I'm having a lot of fun and people seem to have fun as well. So yeah, I'm I'm happy people enjoy the stuff and I'm gonna gonna provide more and it's gonna be great. So yeah. Go check it out. Sweet. Uh Fringy Rags, was there anything you guys wanted to make the people aware of? No, not really. Yeah, likewise, I don't really have anything, just working. Um, well, I mean, it's about the same for me. Work continues. You'll see me on Real BBC, Open Bar, and Ooh. Open Bar Catch-Ups. I'm not sure if Drinker's going to be recording them all offline now. I'm not sure if he's decided that, because we're doing more, and you know, he's trying to find a way of not ending up with the kind of backlog that we end up with. Hence why we're not doing them online as much as well, because uh, we actually managed to finally get to the point of completing them. Um, but yeah, those are all on the way, as well as just more surprises here and there. And of course, you can expect The Last of Us minis to probably come out every Wednesday. Gives me enough time to actually edit them. Um, and yeah, what we have to come, of course, is, like I said, Dead Space, but also um, the Ant-Man breakdown will happen when that comes out. The uh, Oh, yeah. The Mandalorian Season 3 is going to be March 1st, I think, so you can expect minis for that as well. Um... There's going to be more uh, sort of like pro probably more releases in general that we'll, we'll, we'll cover here and there, but there's still a backlog of different videos we want to check out as well. So all the stuff you yeah. might expect. I've heard the well, foodie a... character referred to as the Mauler slash CinemaSins guy. I don't even know how to respond. I think it's really weird to connect <laughs> what we do to the foodie guy because, like I said, he talks about like all kinds of it, the equivalent would be talking about filmmaking techniques all the time, and uh, like the 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 work of the artist and recognizing how they did this that and the other. It's like, does that sound like cinema sins to you? It doesn't really sound like us. As much as we do yeah. talk about, um, I guess filmmaking techniques. Like I said, I think we suit the the critic lady m much more. While I we think have the an foodie understanding of what it is we're criticizing and talking about. We don't just we don't just sit here and describe things. We you know, we really go into it. We go far deeper than most do. Like I said, I think I think he encapsulates the video essayist on YouTube. It's almost perfect. They talk forever and ever about how much they know about the thing, but they'll never ever be able to do it themselves because they want to be the thing, but they can't be the thing. Meanwhile, I'm more than comfortable, and we've said this again and again. I quite love being a critic. 
I enjoy breaking things down. I am comfortable where I'm at. Uh, I yeah. wouldn't mind making my own shit at some point in some way in the form of storytelling. But right now, I'm really, I get a lot out of deconstructing stories. I enjoy it. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, same. I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised I'm saying this if I consider what's been going on. Just like a couple of years ago, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's just happening. I mean, I wasn't even that much on EFAB in the beginning. <laughs> then it just kind of happened. And now mm. I'm enjoying it greatly. It's good stuff. And it's all Mahler's fault. Good, good job. Yay. If you were given Ryan Johnson's position, you could never have made TLJ. I fucking hope not. <laughs> I fucking <laughs> hope not. <laughs> anyway. Oh, yeah, something, I, something I, I meant to say. If, if you're craving for, for video game coverage more, I'm, I'm planning to cover a whole bunch of uh, video games uh, this year. Atomic Heart, Resident Evil, uh, Wulong... All the things, because I, I like video games, and uh, kind of want to talk about them more on the forges as well. Uh, so yeah, if you if you crave that, those ones, those are common as well. Got to mention that, but yeah. I mean, I can't see why we wouldn't cover those two as well, since Atomic Heart is like the Bioshock spiritual successor, and then Resident Evil. I mean, yeah, I, I can't wait to play Soviet Bioshock. You say so. that like in a bad way. Why would you do that? No, I'm not saying that in a bad way. No. Good. You're really not. Hopefully, it's not shit. Oh, yeah, that's the boilerplate one for everything, right? But uh, anyway, we're going to jump Yay. out now. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Like I said, uh, we're trickling in them Super Chat catch-ups. We're actually getting close. I'll, I'll make sure every one of them gets out properly labeled. We'll tackle these ones as well. Um, but thank you very much for the kind donations, the company, and, well, enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, night, week, year, and... Uh, decade and and millennium, right? I don't think any of them in chat are going further than a millennium. They're probably gonna, probably not. No, we're gonna fizzle out by then. But hey, for as long as you're around, have fun. Toodle pip. Cheerio. Zero Goodbye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you later.